everybody, this is Grimmy, and this is an audiobook of my ongoing series, My Father's Warmth, which is a My Hero Academia Todoroki AU. Don't expect any good voice acting from this, I'm not a voice actor, so when you're listening to this audiobook, think of more like your mum telling you a bedtime story. Um, yeah, I will not, I will not be attempting to replicate people's voices, don't expect that from me, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> so, but yeah, just... Bare minimum, b below, below, below average expectations from me, please. My Father's Warmth is a happy Todoroki AU uh, fan fiction where, it, where it's a retelling of the Todoroki family story if Enji Todoroki was never traumatized and got the guidance and support he needed growing up. Chapter 11, Kindle. Haro was leaving via the schoolyard of his workplace where he heard the whisperings of 10-year-olds sneaking up behind him, turned to face them and smiled. He knew all the kids in the school well, since he taught PE and other sport activities to all year groups. Hey kids, what's up? He asked sweetly. The group of three boys and a girl looked at each other before the girl stepped forward, a hopeful look in her eyes. Mr. Todoroki, are you related to Endeavour? The question took Hara by surprise. He'd never been confronted with this before, though he guessed that might have something to do with Endeavour's approval rating having risen considerably in the last few months. This was only his third year as a pro hero. The public may have gotten used to his attitude, but there was still a lot that they didn't know about him. He's my son, Hara said simply with a nod, not the type to make a big deal about it. At this, one of the boys loudly whispered, I told you so, and the teacher had to wonder if there had been ongoing rumours in the school he wasn't aware of. Could he come to school? One of the boys asked eagerly, getting a jab from his friend. Obviously not, he's too busy, the friend scorned as if the other was asking for far too much. Hara thought about it, and a smile tugged at his cheeks. Actually, a school talk could do Endeavour some good, make him practice talking to kids. Hmm, I can certainly ask him, but no promises, he replied with a wink as he lifted his index finger to his lips, the children's eyes lighting up in a sparkly adoration as he said this. Once he got home, though, he could tell Engie was in no state to talk about hero work. He had a permanent redness to his cheeks and a faraway stare of someone smitten all over again. I take it the date went well, Haro said teasingly as Engie jolted, face getting redder. It was fine, he replied tensely, a pout forming. Eventually, Haro was able to bring up the idea of Endeavour doing some sort of hero talk at his elementary school. Initially, Engie was hesitant at the idea for the sole reason that he didn't know if he could talk to kids properly. But after his PR team strongly suggested he go for it, especially since the rumours of Endeavour having a girlfriend were still floating about and this could be a good distraction, Endeavour relented. A couple weeks before the summer holidays, in July, the elementary school all too excitedly accepted Endeavour into their gym for a whole school talk. The school had organised it to be an interview-style setting, with common questions all the students had, as well as some more professional, career oriented ones, all of which would be filmed and then published online for others to see. Despite being seated at the table, Endeavour towered over the sea of children who all stared at him with wide-eyed admiration, some more wary than others, as Endeavour still had a strict and stern face that didn't fit the image of a hero. His answers were blunt and to the point, not thinking it necessary to sugarcoat his answers about the reality of his career, which made Harrow worry a little that the kids were getting frightened. But they seemed to be alright. If anything, the more Endeavour talked, the more intrigued and curious they were. Having an adult speak to them as equals rather than little babies seemed to appeal to them. What's something the children should think about when considering this career path? The headmaster asked the final question. That was a tough one. There was a lot of different ways to answer it. In the distance, Engie caught sight of his father, who was at the back of the gym. His whole reason for becoming a pro hero in the first place. Why do you want to be a pro hero in the first place? He replied, confusing them all a little. Depending on your answer, that will form your path. Are you after fame and glory, or is there something, somebody, you want to protect? Unnoticeable under his mask of flames, his eyes glanced at his father before generally looking at the children. If all you're after is power, or selfish wants, you will only limit yourself. Being a pro hero, it's beyond you, it's a service to others. My friend All Might taught me that. The last part was said with a softness that contrasted the rest of his dialogue. At the mention of the symbol of peace, excited chatter broke out across the sports hall, requiring the headmaster and teachers to shush the students before continuing. Thank you, Endeavour, for your insightful reply. 
Now, that's all the questions we have, but if some of the students have anything else they'd like to ask, raise your hand. Remember to stay relevant to the topic. At this, majority of the students raise their hands up in excitement, Endeavor taking them a second to exhale softly and close his eyes. Endeavor, is it true you are a student here? A boy asked, eyes bright. The headmaster was about to argue that it wasn't appropriate to ask such a question, but Endeavor answered before the child could be shut down. Yes, this was my elementary school, he replied, and noticed quite a few of the students looking back to where Hara was, the latter suddenly embarrassed at having so many eyes on him. And that is indeed my father. He trained me, so those in his class are in good hands. He couldn't help a smile from tugging at the corner of his mouth upon seeing his father's cheeks deepen in colour, a little payback for the amount of times Hara had teased him about Ray. Is it true you have a girlfriend? Some unseen girl yelled from the crowd. It was Endeavour's turn to go several shades of red, though it was mostly hidden by his flames. All right, that's enough, the headmaster quickly puts an end to the chaos. After some more professional questions, Endeavour indulged the students, signing some things and taking some photos. He hadn't done anything of the sort since his visit to Iwate, but he felt he could manage a lot better than he used to. Dealing with children felt a little awkward though, as he didn't know how to go about interacting with them, especially of how short they all were, and he wasn't sure what to say or do other than stand like the mountain of muscle he was. He just focused on answering whatever question they might have. By the time he and Harrow were ready to head home, he was exhausted. This sort of thing is still more exhausting to you than stopping villains the whole day, huh? Harrow commented with a chuckle at seeing his worn-out son. I'm getting used to it. Somewhat. The taller man sighed softly, readjusting his shirt that had shifted slightly, the blue of his suit peeking from underneath the fabric. One day, I'm going to convince you to take a break and stop wearing your suit all the time. It was Harrow's turn to sigh. The only time he knew for a fact that Engie didn't wear his hero suit under his civilian clothes was when he had plans of Ray. I never know when I might be yet called into action, it's more practical this way. The two started walking home as Engie's chauffeur Kuramada was taking the week off. Engie could drive, but walking with his father was nicer, a reminder of how things used to be. Something you want to protect. Harry repeated the words Endeavour had said during the talk thoughtfully, before looking up at his son. I'm sorry you felt the need to protect me. Engie stopped suddenly and gave his father a hard look. Don't ever apologise, he said sharply, before catching himself and softening his demeanour best he could. It wasn't your fault. That incident. It made me realise how much needed to be changed. I didn't want what happened to me, to us, to happen to another family too. All the same, having my teenage son feel like it was his burden to bear. An apology lingered on his tongue, but Hara kept it to himself. I just... I just don't want you to forget that you were a child. It wasn't, still isn't, your fault. Memories of seeing his father be crushed by rubble, his body freezing, the helplessness he felt, the inability to do anything, the weakness. It all came flooding back, and Angie had to close his eyes before the emotions of not enough became too strong a sickly feeling settling in his throat and chest. He didn't want to have a repeat of the previous years, not when he was doing so well currently. Engie, Engie, look at me, please, Harris said a little frantically, seeing the familiar, dissatisfied scowl on his son's face. Identical blue eyes met, Harrow's gentler ones easing the distress in Engie's chest. You are a child. You still are my child. Please, never forget that. It was important for Harrow that his son knew that no matter how old he got, how strong he became, how intimidating he looked, that he'd always be the nine-pound baby that fit into his arms and slept soundly against his chest. Engie would always be Harrow's baby boy. I won't, Engie reassured softly, making Harrow smile. August 8th was Engie's birthday, and while normally he'd spend it with Harrow and Toshinori, the two had been quite pushy about him spending it with Ray. Behind his back, Hara had suggested to Ray that she and Engie go spend some time at the beach, seeing how it was the peak of summer and the ocean would be gorgeous at this time. When Engie asked her if she'd be willing to spend his 21st birthday with him, Ray had eagerly suggested they spend a week at Jodogahama, a scenic beach in Iwate that Ray was very excited to share with Engie. With many thumbs up from his father and best friend, and a feeling of lingering nervousness, Engie made the travel there, meeting Ray at the hotel she had suggested. He'd been very careful about booking individual rooms for each of them. While the rumours of Endeavour's potential girlfriend had become a background buzz for many, he didn't feel like having some sort of scandal. Japan was still very traditional in many ways, and him sharing a room with a woman he wasn't married to would most likely give his approval rating a slump. Plus, he didn't want to put Ray in a compromising situation. 
so two individual rooms it was. Ray understood and appreciated it. While the heat of August was a bit intense for Ray, she reassured NG she knew how to look after herself. If the heat ever became too much, she could simply frost herself a bit to cool down, something she had done all her life when the weather became too warm. As with much of the scenery of Iwata, Jodokohama was beautiful. Ray went about excitedly explaining the volcanic rock formations and how the wind and rain formed the rocky islands into these extraordinary shapes over the course of millions of years. The contrast of colours between the vivid blue sea, green pines and the white shine of the rocks and beach made for an amazing view that NG was learning to fully appreciate via Ray and her knowledge. You always seem to know so much about the nature here, he commented as the two sat on the beach, just out of reach of the gentle waves lapping at the pebbles. Ray gave him an enthused smile. I love learning how the world is formed, she said, looking fondly at the sea in front of her. We get so lost in our day-to-day -day lives that we miss the beauty around us. I once read an English phrase that said, stop and take time to smell the roses. It's a lovely phrase and I live by it. NG was vaguely aware of that phrase and made a grunt of understanding. Is it safe to assume geography was your strongest subject? It was, Ray laughed, tucking her hair behind her ear so she could look up at NG better. Most of my books at home are nature and geography topics. What about you? From what Harrow told me, you were always top of your classes. Mm. Although I enjoyed physical education the most, be it sports or training at UA, he replied, but at the back of his mind he knew the real reason he enjoyed it is because they made him stronger, more powerful. A blooming obsession in his teenage years that still lingered. Thinking back, Engie didn't really have any strong opinions when it came to academic subjects. He was just good at understanding concepts and memorising them. I'm not surprised. I never did PE since I was homeschooled with a private tutor. Math was my absolute worst subject, Ray replied, remembering the many frustration-filled days. That seems to be a common struggle. I never understood why. Everything was fine until they introduced letters and triangles into it all. It's just the next step of rules you learn and apply. Yes, well, not everybody is a try-hard like you. Try-hard implies having to work hard. Maths isn't hard. The two bickered about the cursed subject of abstract calculations, but never once did it feel hostile or in bad faith. If anything, this harmless back and forth was pleasant to the both of them, seeing how neither had any experiences of real close friendships growing up. Angie being socially awkward and Ray being homeschooled without her parents making efforts to set up playdates. Angie had Toshinori, but they didn't bicker about mundane topics like this. After Ray jokingly concluded that Angie was simply an academic show-off, getting an eye roll from the redhead, the two walked alongside the beach, enjoying the view, the sun and the warmth of mid-afternoon. The slight breeze made the heat more bearable for Ray, as well as ice cream. I'm looking forward to that sightseeing boat cruise tomorrow, she commented between bites of her raspberry ice cream that she had in a cup. They had both agreed that they should spend Engie's actual birthday itself at sea, and Jodokohama offered many boat tours to look at the sights better. I've never done that before. Me neither. Angie said after a lick of his own vanilla ice cream. He didn't often eat sweet things, but he was indulging Ray, happily. He had gone on boats generally before, but that was for missions at sea with sailor pro-heroes, not for the sake of fun. Angie didn't do much, if anything, for the sake of fun. Neither did Ray, usually everything she did was for the sake of fitting into the role her family wanted. She was learning of Angie to do things just because they could. While Angie was equally looking forward to tomorrow, there was a slight nervousness as well. The next day came around faster than Angie could prepare for, and the couple found themselves on a rather large boat with only a small number of fellow sightseers on board. Ray was delighted by the views and being at sea like this, marvelling at the sparkling deep blues of the water, pointing out rock formations that she found fascinating, all decorated by rich green pines and delicate waves. Seeing her this happy with that shine in her eyes, Angie couldn't believe that was the same woman who had stared at him with a dead-eyed look merely five months ago. He couldn't believe how much his life had changed in that time, for the better. As the boat cruise was coming to an end, Ray and Engie found themselves alone at the back of the boat where there was a small balcony-like build that overlooked the ocean as they returned to shore. Ray took in a deep breath of the salty air and exhaled, fulfilled and satisfied. Engie, besides her, shifted uncomfortably as he fiddled with something in his pocket, unsure of how to proceed. Did you enjoy today? Engie asked, tense. Ray nodded. It was wonderful. Thank you. Her voice was light and free like a cloud. 
Angie inhaled, and accumulating all the courage of endeavour he could muster, he turned fully towards Ray. I have a gift. For you. He said, stiff as a board. For me? Ray giggled, currently unaware of her boyfriend's state, too entranced by the ocean. You're the one supposed to be receiving gifts on your birthday, not me. Finally, she looked at him, only to be met with a small black velvet box. It looked tiny in Angie's hand. For a moment, Ray's brain stuttered as she tried to process what she was looking at. A beat passed. Her eyes flitted to Angie, who had his head turned away from her, but she could see his cheekbones aflame and his ears burning a bright red. She had to bite the inside of her cheek to not blurt out her answer, wanting to give Angie the time to ask. Would... He started, but stopped, before taking another deep breath and stubbornly looking at Ray with an intense look of concentration that was completely subdued due to the pink in his face. With a trained steadiness, he lifted the lid of the small box, revealing a ring. It was a simple, warm gold band, with a small anemone flower on top, made from white moonstone, where an even smaller blue, shimmering sapphire resided in the middle of. Simple and full of meaning. Would you give me the honour of marrying me? The words were awkwardly said, tense and unsure as each syllable was carefully uttered. And they were genuine. Yes, Ray said instantly, before her face turned a deep shade of pink. Yes, of course, yes. Her voice was more whispery as emotions caught in her throat. With all his hero-level courage used up, Angie's entire face turned red to an almost glowing extent as he carefully took the ring out of the box, placing the black item back in his pocket and took Ray's hand in his free one. Hands touching, Ray could feel a slight tremor in the man's hand and she all but giggled at the knowledge she was as anxious as she was at the current happenings. As he all too carefully put the ring on her finger, he whispered out a soft, thank you. Admiring the delicate flower on the ring, Ray's sweet smile widened, and she looked at the number two, a blushing, embarrassed, happy mess, at the threat of falling apart in front of her, much like when she they had first met. Happy birthday, NG, she said sweetly, properly taking his hand into hers, unwilling to let go of it. It was the best birthday gift NG could ever ask for. Hara and Toshinori were besides themselves when they saw the photo of the ring on Ray's hand, flooding both of their phones with congratulation texts. Of course, this also meant telling Ray's parents. Chapter 12. In Flame. Enji thought that Ray would take off the ring when it was time for them to split ways and go home after their week at the beach, but no. She refused to hide the fact she was engaged. The ring was immediately noticed by her parents, which sent her father into a frenzy. His daughter, doing things behind his back, that's not how he educated her. Still, Ray answered none of his questions, only saying, wait till September. The only reason her father didn't blow a fuse was because of her mother calming him down, reminding him of Ray being a sensible girl. Other than the ring, they still had no idea about Enji. Despite her parents keeping an eye on the happenings of the rich and successful people in Japan, they didn't even consider us to stoop so low as to look at gossip magazines. It was beneath them. Hence, where they were none the wiser about Endeavor's rumoured girlfriend. September was when Ray and Enji had decided to properly include her parents into the know with a union engagement ceremony to honour the Ahrimura's traditional mindset. Haro had immediately shut down the idea of Enji going down the route of responding to the arranged marriage notice the Himura had put out some time ago, despite both Ray and Enji telling him it was fine to do things the way Ray's father wanted. Ray isn't a puppy to be adopted from the pound. You're not filling in a freaking form to meet your fiancé's parents. Hara had snapped at NG harshly, who had a Ray on loudspeaker. Both of Ray's parents were quite bitter at not being involved in the process of Ray's relationship with this unknown man. Mostly her father was bitter. Ray's mother was more relaxed about it, for she trusted Ray to make the correct choice, but she still felt a little dejected about the truth being hidden from them. They settled once Ray told them about the traditional engagement ceremony her mysterious fiancé was planning. In the first week of September, it was with wide eyes and mouth agape that the Himura parents stared up at the towering Todoroki men, both dressed in formal suits and squared-shouldered. Hara was holding back from glaring daggers at the old couple. Mr. Himura, Mrs. Himura, Enji said with a slight bow, it's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. Endeavour, Mr. Doroki, the pleasure is all mine. Ray's father replied a little too eagerly after a second, bowing low in greeting. Excuse our reaction, we didn't know what to expect of today. Ray did inform us who we were meeting, he said with a momentary side eye to his daughter, who wasn't looking at him. She was too busy smiling at Enji in his smart suit, who smiled back. 
Really? My son kept me in the know the entire time. What a surprise. Haro said with a sickly sweet tone and over top smile. Enji was the one who had to hold back from glaring at his father now, not appreciating the pettiness of the older man who had a clear dislike for Enji's future parents-in-law. The Himura had chosen a room for the agreed-on ceremony, where Haro and Enji set up the rice paper wrapped gifts, as tradition asked. As with everything, Enji had done his thorough research and had gone over the top with it all. Thankfully, this wasn't going to be as formal as it could be and was simply a question of letting the Himuras in, making a toast and exchanging the gifts. Which is exactly what happened without a hitch. Ray had gotten dressed up in a vibrant blue kimono with white flower patterns, and Enji couldn't help but appreciate her beauty. She was beautiful anyway, but he'd never seen her dressed like this. Enji got along just fine with the Himura. Mainly because Ray's father wouldn't stop kissing up to Endeavor, but also because Ray's mother was much like Ray, if just more shut in on herself. Very much like how Ray had been at their first meeting. As Ray's father went on and on about how it makes sense for a pro hero like Endeavor to want a Himura as his wife, and of the former Himura glory, Enji politely listened, but was smiling fondly at Ray, who smiled back, also waiting for her father to be done with the formalities. Haro, on the other hand, was looking a lot more like Endeavor than Enji was at the moment. Stern eyes, no smile. It made his future daughter-in-law's father shrivel under the hard glare he was receiving. Once the Yuino formalities were done, they made quick work of talking about the wedding. Ray's parents were set on the traditional customs with a Shinto wedding ceremony. Haro was more than a little ruffled at the Himura taking charge of his son and daughter-in-law's wedding. Ray, Enji, what do you want to do? He asked sharply, gaining an exasperating expression from his towering son. If you want something more modern or more westernized, you can do that too. The white wedding dresses can be so beautiful. He smiled to Ray, ignoring the annoyed look her father was giving him. Ray smiled back sweetly. I'm content with the traditional ceremonies, she said softly. It was true. Traditional or modern, it didn't matter to her. She wanted to marry Angie. Likewise. Angie was of the same opinion. As long as we're all in agreement. Harrow nodded before shooting his stern glare back at Ray's father, who avoided his look. I thought Harrow was going to bite father's head off. Ray said with a giggle as she and Enji walked around her family's garden. Enji sighed heavily, loosening his fire pattern tie. I'm sorry. Don't be. I appreciate him standing up for us like that. I hope I'll get a little of that Todoroki stubbornness once we're married. Ray waved her fiancé's apology away, smiling up at the tall man. Learn how to stand up for myself. Enji reached out for her hand, and Ray happily held his, leaning against his arm as she looked at the fully bloomed autumn bell flowers. Those are the same flowers you were looking at when we first met, Enji commented, recognising the unique blue that matches fiancé's kimono. Ray hummed. I can see why you like them. Over the months of spending time with Ray, he had learned to enjoy the little details of the world around him. The way the sun peeked through the trees, lighting up the green leaves. The way waves glittered and radiated colours. The way the sky changed colours from morning to dusk, painting the clouds various shades of yellow, pink and orange. Ray had shown him so many more colours than he could imagine. His fiancée smiled and nuzzled closer to him, which made them let go of each other's hands so Enji could wrap an arm around her. The air was getting chillier, but neither felt it. Enji because he's a walking furnace, and Ray because she liked the cold. She loved Enji's warmth more. Back in the house, Harrow was just about ready to throw Ray's father into the garden pond. What do you mean we can't invite our family friend? Harrow all but hissed in the white-haired man's face. Shinto weddings are for close family members and the matchmakers only, the latter retorted, but quickly regretted saying anything. Ray's mother was trying not to laugh, but having her stubborn, traditional husband shrivel under the heated glare of Harrow was a sight to behold. I'm the only family my son has, and I consider this friend like another son and a brother to Enji, Harrow said sharply, a very Enji-like frown forming. Even if his red-headed boy would never admit it verbally, Toshinari had easily become an honorary Todoroki in their eyes, and was as much family as Haro and Enji were. Even so, for a hero like Endeavor, Enji! Haro interrupted curtly, not caring for his tone anymore. Your daughter is marrying Enji Todoroki, and she will be Rei Todoroki. My son's pro hero status has nothing to do with this. Haro could see the money symbols in the Himura's eyes, and while he could very easily empathise with their financial struggles, been there, done that, he couldn't stand them simply considering Ray something to slap a price tag on and ship off to the highest bidder. And he couldn't stand them not seeing his son as his own person, only seeing the glitz and glamour of being the number two pro hero, something not even Enji indulged in. This was reminding him far too much of the times when Enji was still a teenager and was treated like a grown adult due to his height and build. It hit a very sensitive nerve. 
Ray's mother gently refilled both of the men's cups with tea. I believe an exception can be made for this friend of yours. She saw her husband about to argue. Dear, look at them. She directed softly, looking out into the garden. There, Angie and Ray could be seen talking with their backs turned to their parents, Angie having an arm around her shoulders as their daughter had a hand placed on his lower back. Ray might have hidden him from us, but she made an excellent choice. Angie is a dedicated man, and I trust he will look after her. And they're respecting the Himura traditions. Therefore, she looked back at her husband, I believe we can make an exception for the family who will be taking our daughter in. Her husband looked unconvinced, strict about tradition. Angie's the one paying for everything. Harrow's words were the final smack needed for Ray's father to relent. While Harrow still had a strong dislike for Ray's father, he saw her mother in a kind of light. As the day came to an end, they said their goodbyes. I'm sorry for being harsh to your father, if that upset you in any way, Harrow said softly to Ray. He wasn't about to apologise to the Himura man. Ray gave a slight chuckle. Not at all. It was admittedly funny seeing him this way. Her expression softened. He's not a bad man. He's doing what he thinks is best for the family. You're too kind, Ray. You know that? Harrow smiled at her. Her empathetic, forgiving and understanding nature would never fail to amaze him. He wanted to help Angie build an environment where she could be fully herself without ever feeling the need to hide again. I look forward to seeing you soon for the preparations. Me too. The wedding date was agreed on for the 8th of October. To soothe Ray's father, he and his wife had been in charge of all the preparations, be it location, outfits, the matchmakers, food, whatever needed to be prepared. Angie footed the bill. Harrow took care of keeping Ray's parents in check, and Toshinori made sure Harrow didn't commit a crime. While Ray's father was still huffy at a non-family member attending the wedding, everybody else, even his own wife and daughter, shut him down politely. Harrow, not so politely, much to Toshinori's embarrassment. The ceremony went smoothly. The air was chilly, but the sky was a bright blue, adorned by the autumn colours Iwata had to offer. Soft browns, yellows and oranges. It was a perfect day, the type Ray loved the most. Despite Harrow's previous comments of Ray's parents not being invited to the wedding, both parental sides behaved, and the ceremony went smoothly. Prayers, nuptial cups of sake, offerings and exchanging of wedding rings. Two simple silver bands. Ray still wore her engagement ring, refusing to take it off, and it sat next to the silver wedding band. Angie's ring had to be specially made to withstand the heat of his flame, so that he could wear it even as Endeavour. He had to specially order it from the top engineer in his agency, who had given him many smug looks and eyebrow wiggles when the number two hero filled in the form for his not-support item. This news had quickly spread around the agency, an open secret among the psychics that confirmed the rumours of Endeavour's girlfriend. After the ceremony was a celebratory meal, where Ray changed outfits from the white ceremonial kimono to a rich blue kimono, with vibrant shimmering red and orange details adorning it like fiery sparks, representative of end of a suit. That had been her only input when it came to the wedding plans, wanting to honour her new husband's profession. Completely unnecessary, but upon seeing his new wife dressed in those colours, it meant a lot to Angie that she cared at all. Toshinori had given him a firm pat on the shoulder, a silent congratulation at landing a woman like Ray. There was no typical wedding reception by choice, as both Ray and Enji had no friends beyond Toshinori, and also because they would rather keep it private and personal. Toshinori had offered to bring the usual cash gift, but Enji straight up refused. It's not like he needed it. The meal consisted mainly of the matchmakers and Ray's father talking. As Ray had said, he wasn't a bad man, just a weak man clinging to the past glories of his family and grasping at straws to regain what little dignity he could. Enji and Toshinori didn't mind him. Harrow disliked him, and Ray seemed to be neutral towards him. Ray, Harrow, and Toshinori talked among themselves about the moving she'd need to do to come live at the Todoriki household. Harrow had offered to move out, but both NG and Ray had quickly snuffed out the idea. The estate was large enough for at least a family of ten. There was no need for Harrow to leave. This left Ray's mother and NG on their end of the table, neither very talkative. Todoroki, may I ask about your mother? Ray's mother spoke softly. So softly, NG almost missed it. There's not much to say. I never met her, he replied, forcing his voice to be soft as well. She left soon after I was born. Angie knew this was a taboo subject. Mental health was still a touchy topic in this country, and the notion of a new mother abandoning her husband and newborn baby was seen as borderline sacrilegious by the older population. Ray's mother seemed to take this in, her expression free of judgment, if maybe a little apologetic, much like Ray. Your father is a strong man. 
There was a ghost of a smile in on her face as her greyish eyes looked at the redhead. He offered a small smile back in agreement. Ray will be moving far away from us, so it's unlikely we'll be seeing much of her anymore, though I doubt that she'll complain. That hurt Angie a little. The entire ceremony, Ray had barely spared a glance to her parents. They were more like strangers to her than family with how they acted around each other, and Angie wondered if Ray had any desire to salvage her relationship with them. While he had no attachments to the concept of his own mother, something about being strangers of the people who had been there your entire life saddened him. He hoped his own future children would never consider him a stranger. Ray will want to visit Iwata, I'm sure, he said, a little awkwardly. He couldn't speak for what Ray wanted to do with her parents, but he knew she'd miss her home prefecture's natural beauty. She'd be around. Ray's mother smiled a little at that. I hope so. The following couple days were busy with helping Ray move to Musutafu and into the Todoroki household. She didn't have many belongings, mostly books and clothes, so it only required one trip for Kurumada to drive her and her belongings. Ray reassured Enji time after time that she could do this on her own with his loyal chauffeur and that he should return to work. He'd see plenty of her soon. Endeavor's heat-proof silver wedding ring was instantly noticed by his psychics. He considered firing all of his agency when he realised his staff had been making bets on if Endeavour had a girlfriend or not. He was so indignant of this, he didn't even have time to be offended that three quarters of his agency had betted he was still single. Many congratulations were said, as well as demands to meet the wife. The public noticed this too as soon as he was out working again, which made Endeavour do everything in his power to not get cornered by reporters or fans. He wanted to wait until everything cooled down before he ever did interviews again. If he ever did them again. He was fine losing his approval ratings if it meant saving face and not blushing like a madman in front of the cameras. Even the villains had comments to say on the wedding ring. Ever since the thieves Endeavour had slightly singed were imprisoned, the rumours of Endeavour's girlfriend spread like wildfire among the underground world. Surprisingly, the villains knowing was less of a problem, as them noticing the ring was a good distraction that gave Endeavour the time to knock them out. Unlike the press, who he couldn't smack. Thankfully, All Might had come to the rescue once again, knowing his number two would be flocked by the reporters and two nosy fans. As a distraction, he teamed up with Endeavour and Musutafu, so that eyes were on him and not the Todoroki household while Ray moved in. Having the number one and two heroes teaming up became even bigger talk. Such big talk that some fringe parts of the fanbase even theorised Endeavour had married All Might. Endeavour nearly kicked All Might once he heard the rumour. This gave Ray a chance to settle into the Todoroki home, Hara helping her get comfortable and move things around so that Ray and Enji were in the largest bedroom in the house, Hara's being on the other side of the building. On the day she finalised the move, Enji took a couple days off, something that didn't go unnoticed by her psychics who waved their boss off with a greet the wife for us boss. Enji had huffed and puffed all the way out of the building. Both Enji and I work during the day. I'm worrying about you getting lonely, Hara said during the dinner that he had helped Ray prepare. I'll be busy with housework. The garden is huge, I could do gardening too. Ray replied, looking at Enji. The place was enormous, and empty, with little to no decorations beyond the bare necessities. Could definitely do with a homey touch, but she didn't want to make any changes without Enji's opinion. This is your home now too, do as you see fit, Enji said after he noticed her questioning look. Anything you want or need, I'll provide. This was his dry way of saying Ray could do whatever she wanted without needing his permission. He'd be there to make it possible for her. A bright smile is what he received from his wife. Going to bed was a new ordeal that neither Ray nor Angie knew how to handle. Hara had shot his son an amused look when the redhead had realised he'd now be sharing a futon with Ray in the same room, as if they hadn't already agreed on it weeks ago. Angie used the excuse of doing the dishes so that Ray could get ready for bed without him bothering her. Still, he was hesitant as he walked up the stairs, not sure how to handle the upcoming challenge of sleeping in the same room as his new wife. He knocked on the bedroom door and only entered when he heard Ray's, Come in. This is your bedroom too, you don't need to knock, she said with a slight giggle as the tall man meekly walked in, rubbing the back of his neck. Ray was in a standard pyjama set, nothing to gawk at, but it was still different to what Enji was used to. As with everything when it came to Ray. He made a grunt, walking to his closet to get his own sleepwear. He heard the rustling of bedding. Turning back, he saw Ray laying on her stomach under the covers, chin propped up on her hand. She looked so casual and relaxed, and she felt relieved she could be this way around him. I know we talked about this, but if sleeping in the same futon is too much, Ray started. It's not, Angie reassured. It's just... new. 
His ears reddened a little. So did Ray's. True. Angie got ready for bed, hesitant as he opened the bathroom door. It was just sleeping. This should not be such a big deal. But it was. Angie hadn't shared such a personal space with anyone since he was a toddler. The idea of being asleep and vulnerable beside somebody else was daunting. Still, being the stubborn man he was, he powered through the annoying emotions. Ray was where he left her, though she was now on her back, looking up at the ceiling thoughtfully. Trying to not overthink every action, Angie got under the covers beside her. Now they were both on their backs and staring at the ceiling. And tense. This was wildly uncomfortable, and Angie was considering just sleeping in another room. Ray let out a soft exhale and laughed lightly, turning onto her side to look at Angie. It was so awkward. Her saying it out loud with that airy, amused tone that made Angie exhale and he smiled a little. We are, he agreed, finally relaxing a little as Ray managed to lighten the mood. Letting his head fall to the side to look at her, he appreciated how the soft, warm light of their floor lights made Ray's complexion glow, the rest surrounded by the dark of the night. I don't have a reference point for any of this. Me neither, his wife admitted. Angie was brought up by a single father, and Ray's parents were basically strangers to her. Neither had been in a relationship before either. We'll figure it out together. Right. The futon was comfortable, a large two-person one that gave both Ray and Angie plenty of space. It was common for couples to sleep in two separate futons, but for some reason, Ray hadn't liked the idea of that. She wanted to be close to Angie, which while it made him a little flustered initially, now that they laid beside each other, he understood why she preferred it this way. It was cosy. Feeling a little bolder, Ray snuggled up to Angie, resting her head on his chest. His brain not able to come up with a proper way to process this, Angie let instinct dictate how he should hold Ray. With her head on his chest, he stretched out his arm beneath her so she could sleep more comfortably. His other arm rested over his stomach, while Ray's laid on his chest. Like this, she could feel the rise and fall of every breath Angie took, hearing a distant heartbeat that lulled her to sleep. A lot had happened, and after two days of moving out and in, and Ray's exhaustion crashed onto her, falling quickly asleep after the lights were turned off. Angie took a little longer to drift off, still trying to come to terms with his current position. All of this was unreal to him, and having Ray sleep on his chest, looking as if nothing in the world could ever harm her with his arm wrapped around her back, Angie became all too aware of just how lucky he was. With a soft kiss along her hairline, Angie let himself sleep, not noticing the small smile that tugged at his wife's lips. Chapter 13. Ignite. It was a couple of weeks after Ray moved in that Angie brought her to his hero agency to meet her staff. In that time, Ray, Harrow and Angie shifted their lives around to fit the changes of being a new family. Angie changed his hours so that he continued to do most of the heavy lifting throughout the week at the agency, but took the weekends off as to spend time with his wife. He could be called in at any time in case his help was needed. He got up the earliest in the mornings and left just as Ray herself was awakening, enough time for her to kiss him goodbye. Harrow and Ray would have breakfast together before he also went out for work. With updates and messages throughout the day between the married couple, Angie returned home for dinner in the evening. Meanwhile, Ray made herself busy with making her house a home and exploring the local area. Finding the closest park, the shops she liked as well as things she wanted to see and do, be it visiting things or trying out new foods. Just making herself comfortable in the new area for now, accompanied by the mysterious chauffeur Kuramada, who said very little but kept a watchful eye over his boss's wife. Some might consider her lonely, but she had no friends before getting married to Engie, and she actually quite liked being at home now. She could properly stretch out her wings and be comfortable in her own space, finding new ways to enjoy her home life, be it redecorating, trying new dishes, gardening, or reading on the patio. There was so much freedom and Ray took every inch of it she had, much to Harrow and Angie's delight. The public still had no idea that she was the one married to Endeavour, the mystery of the number two's wedding ring still being unanswered, even with that fringe fan base still holding firm that All Might and Endeavour were an item. Angie died a little on the inside every time he was reminded. Angie wanted to make sure they weren't rushed and didn't want to force Ray into the spotlight of the pro-hero world. He knew how stressful and dangerous that could be. As far as he was aware, he wanted to keep his family and work separate. But both his sidekicks and Ray had asked him more than once to have his wife visit the agency. He relented. This could also be a good time to talk about All Might. The flaming sidekick stared wide-eyed and with bright smiles at Ray as she entered the lobby with Harrow and Endeavour. The latter in his pro-hero outfit, although his flames weren't active yet. 
Rey was a beauty to behold, with her pale skin, warm grey-brown eyes, and soft white hair. She smiled sweetly to all the pro heroes, bowing in polite greeting. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'm Rey he- I'm Rey Todoroki, she corrected herself, looking up at Enji with a bright grin. Her husband gave her a fond look, but quickly snapped a glare at his staff, all of which were holding back to charmed grins and laughter at seeing their huge boss be even a little soft around his wife. The pleasure is all ours! We're the flaming sidekicks! They introduced themselves, Ray not knowing how to take their heroic stances, but simply smiled in response. Endeavor, All Might is in your office! Good. He'd gotten his message. All Might? Ray asked, a little surprised. You didn't tell me we were meeting All Might. It wasn't a reproach. It was short notice, sorry, Enji replied, rubbing his nape. He'd only messaged Toshinori last night to see if he had time. Ray gave him a slightly exasperated sigh and smiled before he led her away from his sidekicks. Haro stayed behind, planning on chatting with his son's colleagues. Mr. Haro, long time no see, one of the sidekicks said casually, grinning at the older man. Long time no see indeed. I see you have quite a few more sidekicks than last time, Haro greeted with a cheerful tone, glad to be able to see his son's workplace. In the last three years of his son being a pro hero and climbing the ranks at the speed he did, Haro hadn't gotten to meet his sidekicks much. Pardon me, I don't think we've met, a younger hero said, cocking her head in curiosity. I'm Haro Todoroki, Endeavor's father, he introduced himself, gaining a gasp and widening eyes at his answer. Oh, I had no idea, I'm so sorry. Don't be. I know I don't look much like an Endeavor senior, the burgundy-haired man laughed before placing his hands on his hips. Is there anything I can help out with? I don't want to slow your work down. I know you're busy. That was very Endeavor-like. Getting down to business and seeing what needed to be done. Actually, we're looking at potential sidekicks from the new heroes graduating this year. Could you look through the files and see if any are a fit? The older sidekick asked, motioning to his desk where a pile of files could be seen. Since Haro was an actual teacher and knew his son's work ethic well, Haro was trusted to find potential in the new heroes. Sure thing, Haro nodded, ready to get to work. In Endeavor's office, Ray made a small gasp at All Might standing in front of the window, looking out onto the cityscape. He was huge, and she was married to Enji. That was saying something. We're here. Angie said to gain his blonde friend's attention, who jolted slightly before turning to look at the new couple with a slightly nervous smile. You want to start or shall I? At Deji's encouragement to get on with it, All Might cleared his throat. Start? Race asked, before gawking at the giant blonde as he walked towards her. Mr. Sudoroki, a pleasure to meet you. I'm All Might, he exclaimed in his bombastic hero voice, and extending a hand to the much smaller white-haired woman, who accepted the handshake. Her hand dwarfed in the symbol of pieces. I'm aware, and she had to stifle a snort at her reply. It was the same one she gave him when he first introduced himself. All might, he pushed with a roll of the eyes at his friend for putting on his act. Said friend shot him a slightly distressed look, for once the one nervous in a situation. And she sighed. Ray, All Might has a secret. We were always going to tell you, but only after we got married. That must be one heck of a secret. Theories bounced around in Ray's head. She was sure it had something to do with Toshinori. They were definitely brothers, or at the very least related. She looked from her husband to the blonde number one hero. Except it wasn't All Might. It was Toshinori. Ray's mouth went agape. He was still holding her hand in a handshake, and while it was still huge, it wasn't nearly as gigantically muscular. Surprise, Toshinori said with a nervous chuckle. I was so sure you and All Might were brothers, she blurted out, making the blonde blink at her in surprise before he smiled in a very All Might way. Is this your quirk? Indeed, it's a power-up one, her husband's best friend confirmed, letting go of her hand. I'm sorry we didn't tell you earlier. I hope you can understand. If my real identity was known to the public, it... Ray raised a hand to stop his rambling. I understand. You don't need to justify yourself, she said sweetly, and all the stress left Toshinori's shoulders. Thank you for trusting me with this. I promise I'll keep your secret. Toshinori knew he could trust her full-heartedly. He couldn't tell them about the deep truth of his quirk. That would be too dangerous, and he didn't want to place the weight of Awful One's threat on society on the couple's shoulders. It was for him and him alone to bear. Speaking of the public, are you going to tell them about your marriage? Toshinori asked to Enji, which made Ray look up at him too. I don't know, the redhead admitted. Honestly, they all already know. I don't need to confirm or deny anything. Even a villain congratulated me on my marriage when I handed her over to the police. Ray snorted at that, her contagious laugh making it Toshinori snicker too. Hara told me some people think you and All Might are the ones who got married. 
she said between laughs, making Angie's face go red as he glared at his fellow hero, flames flickering along his shoulders. Hey, don't get mad at me, Toshinori laughed, raising his hands up defensively. It's not like I started it. Point is, only when and if you wanted to be public, Ray. He huffed, slightly before mellowing down, trying to see Ray's reaction. She hummed at the statement before shrugging. We don't need to make a big deal about it yet, if ever. Let them speculate, I just don't want you to be paranoid. She replied as she walked away from the two men to look out of the window, seeing the amazing view over the city. I want to try out that cafe, there. They sell mochi, I know you like us in mochi, and I want to try it. She pointed at some brightly coloured cafe a little distance away, visible due to its pink and white design. We can do that, Angie agreed as he joined her by the window. There's also an ice cream parlour I know is popular in the area. I can take you there too if you want. Toshinori watched the newlywed couple make plans as if he didn't exist. The topic of his real identity had been so easily accepted, it eased his heart somehow. Between Enji, Haru and Rei, he had some real friends. Something he had denied himself for so long in fear of putting them in danger. Maybe that was wrong of him. And maybe, if he could accept friends, he could take on a sidekick. Just one. Endeavor found his father at one of his sidekick's desk, chatting away as he went through files and files of just about to graduate heroes. Oh, Engie! The burgundy-haired man waved his hand to his son as if the redhead wasn't already walking over to him. I've been going through some student files, and I think these two could be a good fit as new sidekicks, he said with a bright smile, handing over said files to his tall son. Behind him, he saw All Might and Ray chatting away. Seems the meeting went well. Thanks, Dad, Endeavor said with a nod as he quickly flipped through the files. Endeavour, we have reports of a villain stealing from citizens in broad daylight. They're scaling the walls to escape and are moving too fast for us to catch. One of the psychics called out from somewhere in the room. I'm on it. Ray jumped at Engie using his Endeavour voice, not having heard it in person before. All Might placed a hand on her shoulder. She wasn't scared, just surprised. I could go, All Might offered, wondering if Engie would rather spend the day with his wife. Instead, he got a squinted glare from the number two. I'm not letting you take the credit. He hissed at the number one while sticking his lower lip out in a pout. Ray, if you want to explore the agency, feel free. I'll be back in a couple hours. His voice became softer, not a tone that anybody in the building had ever heard, outside of Hara and Toshinori. All eyes were on them as Endeavor left the building and shot up into the sky thanks to his flames. I've never seen him in action before in person, Ray said, feeling the heat of Engie's flames even from inside of the building. I can assure you he's very impressive. All Might bombastically exclaimed, getting enthused murmurs of agreement from the other heroes as they returned to work. If you have some heroics to do, All Might, I can show Ray around the agency. I know it pretty well, Harrow offered, smiling up at the tall blonde as he stood from his seat at the sidekick's desk. All Might looked thoughtful for a moment before giving the older man a thumbs up. It's true, I should get going. Evil won't take a break just because I'm having a day off, he said, before giving a small bow to Ray. Mrs. Todoroki, amazing to meet you. Until next time. And he was gone. Ray blinked, looking at Harrow, who gave her a knowing snort. Knowing that All Might was Toshinori really made for a contrasting image. After that, Harrow showed Ray around the agency, introducing her to as many of the dozen of psychics as he could, before taking her to the engineering room, the training room, even the business offices where the PR team was. Harrow was a rare but familiar face, and while not everybody realised that he was Endeavor's father, his blue and blue eyes were a telltale sign that he was connected to the number two hero. Everywhere she went, Ray gaped at how organised and energetic it all was. Someone was always on the move, always doing something, fulfilling an order, a mission, organising an event, going through files, or calling out various villains or situations that needed to be dealt with. She wasn't even the one doing any of it, and she felt exhausted. And she does this every day? She asked in disbelief. Believe me, before you, he didn't even take days off. Harrow laughed. He was so relieved that having Ray in Engie's life made him actually live it instead of just bulldozing through goals and milestones like a steam-powered train. I knew Endeavour worked hard, but I didn't realise how much went into it all, Ray said as she took a sip of her water. Hara had taken her to the canteen in the building, various staff members and heroes on break littered around the room. I'm his dad, and I don't even know how he manages. He doesn't get any of this from me, Hara said as he stretched over the back of his chair, something in his back popping delightfully. He doesn't even get it from his mother, really. Engie's mother. Engie never met her, never had a mother figure in his life, Ray thought. I wonder, do you think a lack of a mother will impact Engie's relationship with our children? She asked carefully, looking at Harrow. The latter blinked at the question, not expecting it. 
It's hard to say. Angie claims he never missed not having a mum, but I think it has affected him whether he realises it or not. I'm just not sure how, he said thoughtfully, running a hand through his hair, lowering his eyes. I certainly feel guilty about it. It's not your fault, Rhea reassured. Maybe, maybe not. Harrow trailed off, a deep sadness entering his expression, but it was gone after he blinked. Either way, you won't know until you have them. Should I be expecting the grandfather title soon? He lightened the mood of his teasing, making Ray blush slightly. I haven't brought it up to him yet, she admitted, taking another sip of water. I think sometime in the next year I want to plan for it. You don't have to rush it. You're still young, it can take your time. Hara said softly. He knew that Hara had become a father at 18 when he was fresh out of high school and didn't want Ray to suffer the mental burden of being a very young parent. As long as Enji and I are on the same page, I don't think we're rushing it. I certainly don't feel rushed. In fact, she felt in control. Everything in her and Enji's relationship had been her choice. He had just offered her the possibilities to make them. Hara too. Both the Doroki men had taken her into account at every stage of her relationship, something she never thought she'd be able to have. She was all too aware that if Enji hadn't come along, she would have eventually been sent away to marry some distant relative if nobody else was willing to pay the Himura price for her. Having the choice, the chance, to choose her own family at her own pace, it was a luxury she never would have expected in this lifetime. That's what matters to me, Hara nodded, trusting Ray. Did you two decide on a honeymoon location yet? No, but we're thinking May, since it'll be after the Christmas and the New Year period, so Enji won't be as busy. Ray and Haru continued chatting until Endeavor returned, and then they all went home, where Toshinori was already awaiting them. November fluttered by, icy December settled in, and suddenly it was the end of the year. And Ray's birthday. The 31st December, now Haru, Enji, and Toshinori celebrated the woman like she had never been before, treating her to all her favourite treats and various gifts that ranged from a new soft silver coloured scarf from Haru to an ice cream making machine from Toshinori. Ray didn't know how to handle being spoiled like this, a flustered mess of thank you and grateful hugs. And then Engie's gift was opened. A pair of white lace-up ice skating boots. She looked at Engie with curiosity. The local park set up an ice skating rink. I suggested we go earlier, but... He had been terribly busy, as villains were the most active during the holiday seasons. He had barely been able to spend half of Christmas Day with his father and Ray, getting called in left and right for various missions that had to be taken care of immediately, especially since Endeavor had gone for the extra mile to make sure as many of his psychics could probably enjoy the holidays with their own families. All Might had been in much of the same boat, bouncing around Japan as aid was asked for from all directions. I've never gone ice skating, Ray almost squealed, delighted at the idea. Ice and snow were her element, literally, but she never got to fully indulge in the nature of her quirk. With that, Haru and Toshinori waved off the young couple, Ray almost bounding into Kuramada's car. Enji didn't have a pair of skates himself, but he knew he could rent them at the ice rink. He'd done his research as per usual. Since it was mid-afternoon on New Year's Eve, the place was fairly full. Enji struggled to put his rented skates on, while Ray delighted in her new, perfectly fitting ones that matched her. Unsteady on their feet, the couple made their way to the ice rink. Ray was a natural. Unafraid and in her environment, overjoyed at the icy air and sounds of skates grating on ice, easily finding a centre of balance and skating along with a bright smile on her face. NG, not so much. He held onto the side of the rink tightly, skates threatening to give out under his stature as he fought with his own gravity to not face pint into the ice. With so many people around, he'd never live it down. NG, come on! Ray said, hand outstretched, wanting to skate beside him. Hmm. <laughs> Her husband grunted, eyebrows knotted in concentration. Angie noticed his stiff, insecure pose, looking like the penguin skating aids the kids were using. She couldn't hold back her laughter. I haven't done this before, he tried to defend himself. Neither have I, Ray grinned teasingly, reaching out both her hands to Angie, encouraging him to take them as support. He gave her an unconvinced look. If I fall, I'll drag you down with me. That's fine, you'll cushion my fall. At that, Enji let out an exasperated chuckle and held both her hands, the couple facing each other. Find your balance. You want to push off the ice with the sides of the blades, like this, Ray instructed, showing the motion she had so easily picked up the second she stepped on the ice. Enji copied the movement, a concentrating look still on his face. Even in fun activities, he was trying to be his best and succeed, his seriousness charming to Ray. Gently, she led him forward. 
Angie still holding onto the side of the rink with one hand while holding Ray's in the other. After a few minutes, he grew more confident and let go of the side, being very careful as to not lose balance. You've managed to figure out how to fly using your quirk, but ice skating is what's hard. Ray observed with a sweet laugh, Angie shooting her a small, equally amused smile. Believe it or not, figuring out how to be aerodynamic was easier than this. That just made his wife laugh even more, this time in disbelief. Ask Angie to become a human rocket, he'll find a method in a heartbeat. Ask Angie to do a fun activity, it's like you've asked him to pluck a star from the sky. Angie Dodoroki, you are a strange specimen, Ray said tenderly, skating a little further ahead of him, still holding his hand. Her eyes were half-flitted and had a loving funness in them, watching Angie's expression soothe under her caring gaze. His face was all sharp edges and strong features, but a sudden stoic harshness that was there before was nowhere to be seen. Not right now. Not when it was just him and her. Just as how Ray's eyes had gained a light since meeting Angie, his demeanour had softened, learning to enjoy life instead of working himself to the bone for the sake of some greater unreachable purpose. Having this mountain of a man melt at the moment she held his hand, it made her heart swell. Ray, surrounded by the twinkling lights of the ice rink as the sky darkened around them, with the ice sparkling beneath them, looked ethereal, like a beauty described only in fairy tales. And this unearthly being was holding Engie's hand, calling him husband and taught him how to try out new things, just because he could. Whatever worry he had of losing balance before was gone, only wanted to keep up with his wife and skate alongside her. Seeing this minor change, Ray smiled and wrapped both her arms around his, still leading him around the ice rink at a steady but confident pace. Heads turned as Endeavour was recognised, but as the night sky intensified, with tinsel-like lights set up around the ice rink, the others around the couple stopped existing, too lost in themselves and their fun. After a moment, Ray pulled away from Engie, and he watched her pick up a little speed, making small circles in the ice as she took full advantage of her new ice skates. Her arms were spread out as she enjoyed the frosty air, soothed by it. Engie watched her be in her environment, already planning a trip to the Hokkaido Mountains for her next birthday. Actually, Ray, for our honeymoon, what do you think about going to Niseko? He said, skating up to her side, a little wobbly still. Ray looked up at him, head tilted. That's up in Hokkaido, right? Her husband hummed in response. It'll still be cold and snowy in May. They have some popular outside onsen. I know heat isn't your thing, but it's an option, he offered. A little insecure as he didn't know if she'd want to head up north again so soon after moving to Musutafu. Having been married for, already, just under three months, Ray had made no effort to plan visits up to Iwate, nor to contact her parents beyond an exchange of Merry Christmas and receiving a Happy Birthday phone call from them. She had been polite about it, but not particularly infused. Ray sensed Engie's turning cogs in his mind, and reached up to cup his face in her right hand. I like the option, she said sweetly. As with everything, Ray didn't mind where they went, just wanted to spend time with her husband, escape from the world and responsibilities a little, but it meant a lot to her that he indulged her weather preferences. We could try skiing, or snowboarding. I think snowboarding would suit you. And the onsen sounds lovely, especially out in the cold snowy air. Ray, thinking through the possibilities out loud, relieved Engie, and as he watched her ramble on softly about what they could do during the honeymoon, he let his cheek rest in the palm of her hand. It was cold, icily cold, and soothed the burning fire that trembled under his skin. Engie liked heat, but it was too much sometimes. The cold was like a cold glass of water of being in the sun too long. And Ray was so much more than that, brought so much into his life in all the little ways she was. Pausing her thought process, she saw Engie leaning into her touch, eyes almost completely shut as he listened to her talking. When she stopped, his eyes fluttered open, vibrant turquoise eyes focusing on her with fondness and interest. A small exhale escaped Ray, breath visible in the cold winter air. Under all that intimidating stature, stern determination and strict harshness, was a man who had isolated himself from the world without even realising it. He put his head down and worked tirelessly, Endlessly, almost inhumanly, with his dedication to get things done right, along the way, had forgotten to indulge in his own humanity. Toshinori was in the same boat as him, and Hara could only do so much to get them both to live and not survive constantly. In those vibrant eyes she found so beautiful, Ray saw a man who feared his own weakness, who'd let himself spiral into insanity if it meant he could overcome them. But right now, all that was forgotten, 
The turbulence of unspoken emotions and thoughts swept away as all those eyes saw were Ray. And they looked at her with a fondness, so soft, but it was like a blanket was wrapped around her. Eyes started to form and crackle along Edgy's cheek, where Ray's palm was touching, and she flinched, about to pull back and apologise. But Edgy rested his larger, warm hand over hers, unbothered by the ice. Her ice. I love you were words too weak, too insignificant to fully entail just how strongly he felt towards Ray, how it engulfed him completely and utterly. Frost spread along his cheek and neck, started to cover his coat, and even reached his hair as Ray became lost in the intensity of his eyes, heart beating fast and strong in her chest. She might melt like the very ice she made. In the distance, an echoing bell announced midnight, fireworks setting off all around the town and lit up the sky in bright colours of gold, red and green. Cheering could be heard around them as a new year arrived. Happy New Year. NG exiled softly, voice uncharacteristically quiet. I hope you enjoyed your first birthday with me. Not caring for social etiquette, Ray brought his face down to hers and kissed his lips. Happy New Year, she murmured against them, feeling just how warm NG was compared to her. It was wonderful, thank you. Arms wrapped around each other, they leant against the edge of the ice rink, looking up at the colourful fireworks, whose beauty paled in comparison to Engie's eyes. Ray thought, at least. Chapter 14. Scintillation. Whatever shell Ray had been in before, she had completely ridden herself of it. She was bubbly, she laughed, she smiled, every room she entered brightened instantly, and even on days where emotions were low and it just wasn't her day, Ray managed to find something to be joyful about. NG2 changed in ways that weren't immediately noticeable. He was more patient, less prone to anger, and felt peace. Not obvious to the rest of the population, but glowing beacons of change to those who knew NG, namely Haro and Toshinori, who were collateral damage in the young couple's joy. In a good way. Toshinori felt a little lighter whenever he spent time with Rei and Enji. Being All Might was that little bit easier. Haro thrived in seeing his son open up at home. His attitude and pouts were still abundant, but now always accompanied by smiles and laughter from just being around Rei. And while the public didn't recognize this change, they still reaped the benefits of their top two heroes being in high spirits and productive. While Rei being Enji's wife wasn't plastered in the headlines or on the news, it had become an unspoken fact in Musutafu. Ray was seen leaving the Endeavour Agency with the man himself, and Engie walked around with Ray in civilian clothing was a semi-common sight in the local town. Nobody questioned seeing Endeavour and a white-haired woman enjoy Vera Smochi at a well-known cafe on Valentine's Day. Ray tried Engie's favourite food, Kuzumochi, and really enjoyed it. Engie tried ice cream mochi, liking the green tea one the most. Nobody questioned seeing Endeavour with a shorter man and the same white-haired woman at the popular ice cream parlour. It was Hara's 40th birthday and they enjoyed various icy treats. They took some home for Toshinori when he joined them for dinner later on. While the gossip magazines attempted to make a massive deal about Endeavour's outings, they were quickly criticised by the population. Specifically by Endeavour's growing fan base, especially the OGs, who had many things to say about gossip magazines who pried into their number two's life. Upon seeing an article about it, Hara had laughed with Toshinori. Ray and Enji were appreciative of Endeavour's fanbase fighting the good fight on their behalf, seeing how they weren't being destructive but merely protective of the red-headed hero. If anything, it brought more attention into the danger of snooping and exposing a hero's private life. Thankfully, villains knew better than to mess with said private life. Nobody was suicidal enough to attack Endeavour's assumed wife and father. May arrived but appointed honeymoon month where Ray and Enji would travel up to Niseko for a couple weeks. Ray had made a quick visit to the Endeavor agency to apologize to the psychics for stealing their boss away, but they all too excitedly told her to not even worry about it and have fun. Seeing their boss looking outwardly happier in the last few months had boosted morale, as if that was even possible. Up to Hokkaido the couple traveled, Ray delighted at seeing the snowy mountains. While the weather would soon warm up, May was the final month of snow, and they were going to take full advantage of it. The hotel they booked was right beside mountains, it had traditional Japanese decor and setup, and a private onsen for each room. Since the snow hadn't melted yet, the hot baths were beautifully adorned in icy white, except for the footpaths so that the guests wouldn't slip. As soon as they arrived, they put their things in order and went out for a walk, talking out their plans. Skiing was a must, something neither Enji nor Ray had done before, 
which is why they had booked an instructor for a few sessions. After some research, Angie decided to go snowboarding instead of just skiing. He expected many face plants, something Ray was a little too eager to witness. There was an art museum that was highly recommended, as well as various art shops that Ray wanted to go through to find some decorations for home, or to at least be inspired by. Angie wanted to try some of the local crab dishes, and Ray looked forward to the day trip at Lake Etoyako. The honeymoon would finish with another day trip at Otaru, where the couple would explore the historical buildings. Being married to the number two hero certainly paid for luxuries. Luxuries neither were used to, since they'd both been brought up with financial struggles. Dad's face when I got my first salary as a hero. I thought his eyes were going to pop out. Angie laughed softly as he finished unpacking his suitcase. I keep telling him to indulge in life's comforts more, but he doesn't know how to. I guess I don't either. Except when it comes to booking holidays, Ray said as she looked out of the back sliding door to the private onsen. This place is gorgeous, look at the view. She stepped outside, peering up at the snowy mountains. The cold felt amazing, and she took in a deep breath, knowing she wouldn't get this refreshing weather until September at the earliest. And she peeked outside and smiled at his wife. Why look at the view when he could look at her? The next few days were filled with activities. Much to Ray's appointment, Angie did not face plant into the snow. Like she had adapted to ice skating almost immediately, Angie caught on to snowboarding quickly. He still did land on his back in the snow the first couple tries, but once the instructor explained further how to balance, it was smooth sailing for the tall redhead. Smooth boarding? Angie thought that had been funny. Ray, not so much. Skiing for her was much the same, and by the third day in the snow, they'd gotten pretty decent at it. As Ray slid down to the end of the slope, she slightly lost her balance and fell backwards, landing in the snow with an oomph. Angie loomed over her as he skidded to a stop, lifting his goggles with a smile. All right down there? He said in a teasing tone. Ray rolled her eyes and slumped backwards, letting herself lie properly in this cold snow. This was nice. I certainly feel the exercise, Ray groaned as she struggled with her ski boots, feeling the tension in her muscles. Angie, having already packed away the rented material, got on his knee to help her. My whole body hurts. We could try the onsen. The heat will loosen the muscles, Angie said in all his hero professionalisms. Sounds like you've got experience, she commented, knowing that if it had anything to do with heroics, Angie would have something to say. Physiotherapy, he nodded, not looking at her as he undid her boots. Since I did intense training, I found ways to heal the muscles faster to avoid overworking while being able to get back to training faster. Something Harrow had more than once whacked him on the head for with the rolled up magazine. Not that it ever hurt. Hmm, it's done wonders for you. Ray's tone caught Angie's attention and he looked up, wide-eyed. If it had been just a throwaway comment, he wouldn't have questioned it. But Ray was looking at him with half flitted eyes and a smirk. He hurriedly went back to freeing her from her skis. The instructors tried to avoid staring, but seeing Endeavour flustered was simply a sight to behold. Ray and Angie got back to their room, the woman making a beeline for the onsen. I put the clothes away, Angie said to Ray when she took off her coat, knowing she'd be stiff and tired from skiing. Ray was grateful and quickly shed her clothing to only a towel, going to wash before entering the hot springs. Angie was busy with clearing up the room, but it didn't click right away what was about to happen. After 10 minutes, Ray called him from outside. Angie, you're right, the water helps. Angie smiled at her comment, glad his minimal physiotherapy knowledge was of use. Join me. His brain stopped. He had gone to Onsen before, several times with his class in UA after training camp. He was familiar with the etiquettes. But the boys and girls had been separated. Now Ray was asking him to join her. That made it all the more complicated. Angie inhaled deeply into her stomach and exhaled. No, Ray was his wife. If she wanted him to join her, then he would. That was fine. He should get used to it. He should get used to being vulnerable with her. That's what couples did. Maybe. He wasn't sure. Angie? Coming, he said finally, getting changed into a towel. This is fine, this is fine, this is fine, this is... He saw Ray in the water, only her shoulders, neck, and head visible. She had a relaxed expression on her face, eyes closed until she looked at him smiling. Fine. Ray watched her husband's face go several shades of red as he walked to the outside shower area to wash for the onsen and let out a quiet snort. 
Angie didn't seem like the type to be shy and get embarrassed easily, but completely was. From the last few months, Ray learned that whenever Angie got defensive or harshly dismissive, it's because he was feeling emotionally vulnerable. Haran Toshinori said that Angie only ever became flustered or blushing when it had to do with Ray, any other time he'd look angry. Basically, Angie was a masculine man and couldn't express his feelings without having to deny them first. But he had softened up around Ray considerably, able to be himself more freely without worrying about being seen as anything less than authoritative and intimidating. She didn't understand why that was even a concern of his, but Harrow had alluded to Engie having some insecurities he hadn't dealt with. Being respectful of his son, Harrow hadn't gone into details about. Ray agreed, she wanted Engie to be the one to bring it up when the time came. Filling the water ripple, Ray opened her eyes again, not realising she had shut them. Angie was in the water, face red and not looking at her, instead looking at the very interesting snow that decorated the pebbles around the grounds. The water barely reached his chest, and Ray couldn't help herself. She didn't have a type, per se, and muscles definitely weren't anywhere on the list. But it was different when it came to Angie, as so many things were. He'd worked his body to be in peak form, burning out every weakness it could have, and his muscular stature was proof of that. Another example of his hard-working nature. Unlike Ray, he was petite and soft, and in pain all over from skiing. Which admittedly annoyed her. She lifted her arm out of the water, stretching it out and flexing her hands a little. Does it still hurt? Angie asked. Looking at her husband, she saw he wasn't fully looking at her. It's sore, Ray replied, stretching out her other arm as well before dropping them both in the water. I'm not at all fit. There was a slight bitterness in her tone that Angie picked up on immediately. Does that bother you? He asked, still not looking in her direction, rather keeping his attention to the ripples in the water. Ray made an unsure humming sound. Mm, a little. Compared to you, I'm not much of anything. I've been training since I was a teenager. You shouldn't compare yourself to me. True. A moment of silence. We could train together, if you want. Angie offered, finally looking at his wife, who was on the opposite side of the hot spring. She returned his gaze, head tilted slightly. I can show you how to use the home gym. Dad and I still work out together. Training is a bonding activity for NG, Ray recalled Harrow telling her. Maybe she could try. Might make her feel more confident. Okay. You'll have to go easy on me, though. I've never trained before. Ray said with a, small sm Ray said with a smile that her husband returned. They stayed in silence together for a moment, enjoying the peace. Ray taking this time to stretch her aching muscles as they relaxed. Unlike Angie, she wasn't nearly as embarrassed as he was about being naked. It's a hot spring, that's what people did. It's normal. Though Ray guessed neither her nor Angie really had any normality. Her parents certainly didn't let her be a normal child, being homeschooled and isolated so she wasn't tainted by society. Thinking back, her mother was on the same level as her father when it came to strictness, but had mellowed out over the years. Not that she became any less of a stranger to Ray, and she had no intention of visiting them anytime soon. She had done her Himura duty, and as far as Ray was concerned, they didn't need her anymore. Angie, what do you think of my parents? Her question made him open his eyes and blinked a little. Hmm. Ray started laughing at the non-answer. I don't mind them. Your father clings onto the glories of the past, though. He said after Ray had calmed down. He does, she agreed sighing at the endless lectures she had received about the Himura and their past and blah, blah, blah. And my mother? Angie thought for a moment. She'd like to see you. That took Ray by surprise. At the meal, after the ceremony, she seemed down at the notion they wouldn't see you anymore. Not the answer Ray expected, and it left her conflicted. Would you want to see them again? Ray thought for a moment. Would she? She wasn't sure. They were strangers to her, and while they had provided all they could for her to grow up healthy and educated, emotionally they were distant. She might as well have been raised as a show dog with how they treated her. Actually, a show dog may have been treated better. Not currently, Ray admitted, but expression showed there was more left unsaid, probably because she didn't know how to. If your mother suddenly contacted you, would you want to see her? It was Angie's turn to be surprised, and he furrowed his brow in thought. I'd be indifferent. It would depend on how my father reacted, he said after a while. She's a stranger to me. I've only ever seen a couple photos. 
I feel the same way about my parents. Strangers. Just like when he was at the ceremony, the idea of considering the people who had been with you all your life as strangers made something in Angie's chest hurt. I hope our children will never consider us strangers, he said softly, sinking more into the water. Ray's parents were strangers. His mother was a stranger. Even Harrow before the accident had been a stranger to him with how much he worked. The worry-filled comment made Ray smile. We won't let that happen, she reassured. Ray refused to be like her parents. If anything, she wanted to be more like Harrow. Speaking of, when do we want them? The sudden switch in topic gave Engie whiplash and he all but spluttered. I, uh, I don't know. How many do you want? Engie replied, looking at anywhere but his wife. Ray pondered the question for a moment, her index finger on her chin. At least four. At least four, Angie asked incredulously. I said I wanted Delight to be home, no? Yes, but... He faltered. There was no reason they couldn't have four kids. The house was huge, his salary alone could easily support them, and Harry would be over the moon at having any number of grandkids. He'd made that very clear. Nothing. I just didn't expect four. Ray giggled at his reaction, a tender smile gracing her face. She swam across the hot spring and sat beside an all-too-aware Angie who still refused to look at her. Ray, being the cool cucumber she is, leaned her head on his upper arm and exhaled softly. Your father mentioned worrying we were rushing things. I said as long as we were on the same page, we weren't rushing. Do you feel rushed? She said softly, looking up at her tall husband whose cheeks were tinted a deep red. Not at all, he replied, glancing at her briefly before looking forward again. Those pebbles on the other side of the water show sure are interesting. It's just... anything that wasn't hero-related, I neglected for years. Except for my father. The tension in his shoulders smoothened a little, feeling Ray's naturally colder skin on his own overheating exterior. I didn't get a choice, Ray said softly. Angie made a hum to that, and finally looked down at her. Their lack of clothing didn't bother Ray nearly as much as Angie thought it might have. While for Angie, the simple things of life were daunting and made him feel vulnerable, it was all Ray craved for. Angie would rather turn heel and run away from having to be emotionally honest, while Ray desperately desired for the openness and vulnerability of being in a relationship, but didn't know how. Yet somehow, with Angie being the awkward, inexperienced guy he was, it made it easier for her to take lead in certain aspects. Ray knew what she wanted from their marriage, while Angie had no real idea, beside knowing he was head over heels for Ray but would provide whatever she needed. Like a farmer giving a chef all of the ingredients without a clue what to do with them, and letting the chef mold the ingredients into whatever they wanted. That's what had finalised her love for Engie so early on. He had wanted her to have the freedom to choose him, and the choice to mould their relationship into what she wanted by proxy. Engie was opening every door for her, it was just up to Ray to choose which door she led them through, knowing full well that Engie would follow her happily, hand in hand. Cheeks still leaning against his arm, she looked up at him and smiled, eyes half-lidded and completely relaxed. Her peaceful demeanour made Engie's bubbling mind simmer down almost instantly. Something only Ray was able to do. Whenever, he said. Hmm? Kids. Whenever you want them. It was a reply to Ray's previous question. Raising her arms, Ray wrapped them around Engie's shoulders best she could and pulled herself up to give him a peck on the lips. Ray was still sleeping by late morning. Silently, Angie had gotten washed and dressed, before throwing their towels into the laundry basket left for the guests. Fixing the futon blanket so Ray was properly covered as she slept deeply, Angie left their hotel room. Feeling on top of the world, Angie stretched his arms as he walked down the hallway to the on-site restaurant. He guessed Ray would be awake and hungry by the time he finished his own breakfast, so asked the restaurant server for a portion of fruit salad and avocado toast to take back to the room, knowing Ray liked those two food items from the previous day she had ordered them. As he had thought, Ray was awake, taking up the entire futon as she groaned at the sunlight painting her face. Morning, and she said softly as to not surprise her. He got a very not Ray grunt back. Hungry? Peeking through her bed hair, his wife made a grabby motion with her hand before flopping it back on the bed and rolling onto her front, face in the pillows. Angie snorted at the sight and sat down on the futon, only to be ambushed by two pearl arms that were wrapped around his waist, Ray's face now against his hip. She yawned deeply. I'm going to need another hot bath.
Ray said sleepily, but blinking the sleep away from her eyes as they narrowed down on the fruit salad that consisted of apple, watermelon, banana, and strawberries. Why is that? Angie asked, setting up the food on the low table they had while trying not to move so Ray could still grip onto his middle. Muscles are sore. Ray slurred, rubbing her cheek against his side as she stretched the entire length of her body, the cover slipping down her naked back. Which is your fault? For a moment, Ray thought she'd get to see Angie blushing like a fire, but instead she got a smug side eye from above. I didn't hear you complaining. Angie got a gentle slap on the thigh for his audacity. The rest of the honeymoon was as planned, and more, returning home in high spirits and in love all over again. They were much more comfortable with each other, especially behind closed doors, where hugs and kisses were often exchanged shyly, but much more casually. A man weaker than Toshinori might have felt a little jealous. He felt the opposite. Seeing Enji grow into an affectionate husband, still easily embarrassed and pouty, made Toshinori feel nothing but joy. His friend's happiness was his happiness, and Hara was happy as could be, obviously. While Enji's circle of friends was small, it was there and it was strong, and Rei was growing more confident and radiant every passing day. Rei had free reign of the house, the garden was blooming with a cascade of colourful flowers. Decorations adorned every wall and corner that gave the house that homey touch she had so desired, and she experimented in the kitchen. Experimentation had always been frowned upon by her parents. She had to fit into the strict mould of the Japanese housewife that was expected of her, but now she could try and do as she pleased. Avoiding things like fish for Haruro, Ray tried any cuisine that took her interest. Most of the time it turned out amazing. Sometimes it took a couple bites for the flavours to click, and sometimes the dish wasn't to anyone's liking. Angie and Hara never complained though, and often cooked with her. They still ate whatever Ray made, because whether the dish ended up being to the freeze taste or not, it was objectively well made and made with love. Toshinori certainly felt very loved when the Todoroki celebrated his birthday with a homemade American-style dinner. DIY burgers, hot dogs, deviled eggs, mac and cheese, barbecue, chicken wings, and cheesecake as a birthday cake. Enji tried to deny having done his over-the-top research to aid Ray in the preparations for it. Hara knew there wasn't any physical gift they could give their blonde friend that would do him justice. Spending time with him and letting him have a break was the least they could do. They all knew how much Toshinori did for the country. A couple of months since the honeymoon passed by, and Endeavour was reading through his psychic's performances for review when he heard fast approaching footsteps at his office. He looked up in surprise as he saw Ray bursting through the door, holding a bag he didn't recognise. Before you could ask what was wrong, Ray was shaking her new bag in his face. Leaning back at the sudden attack, he blinked rapidly as he held the object, narrowing his eyes down on it. There was a small badge hanging from the bag. It was a round white one with a pink heart where a doodle of a mother and baby resided. A pregnancy badge. He looked into the bag where several items resided, including a mother and child health handbook, pregnancy checkup coupons, and various booklets for both fathers and mothers. Angie snapped his look back to Ray, who was slightly hopping up and down on the spot, an ecstatic grin on her face as she shook her hands excitedly. You're pregnant, he blurted out, eyes wide. I'm pregnant, Ray squealed. Angie walked around his desk, and as soon as there wasn't the piece of furniture in his way, Ray was in his arms. If she had been any stronger, she would have squeezed the living daylights out of him from how tightly she was hugging him. The news hit home, and Angie lifted Ray into his arms bridal style and kissed her cheek, grinning now as well as small flames danced along his shoulders happily. Hara was in tears at the news, openly sobbing of happiness as Toshinu gave loud All Might level congratulations on loudspeaker. As Hara fussed over Ray and plans for the future, Angie took his phone to the other room so he and Toshinori could speak. You two certainly got busy quick, Toshinori teased, getting an embarrassed watch it from Enji. It wasn't as threatening as it might have been a year ago. But seriously, congratulations, Enji. The blonde's voice became more tender. He was in a completely different era of Japan and was sitting on a high building overlooking the city he was currently in. I have a request, Enji said carefully, tone serious. What is it? Enji took a deep breath. He was better at being honest and vulnerable these days, but it still wasn't easy. Would you be an uncle to my children? Toshinori almost fell off the building he was on. Are, are you sure? You know I'm... He stuttered. I know there's something more going on that you won't tell us. Enji interrupted, wanting to get through his request without backing away at the last second. And you know you're considered... family. 
and you grumbled down like it hurt to say. Toshinro had to hold back from cackling despite the nervousness in his gut. It's only natural. If it's only natural, then obviously, Toshinori said, using his All Might voice at the end, gaining him a regret-filled groan from Enji. Once the call was ended, Toshinori sighed and looked down on the city. Was this okay for him to do? For Enji to trust him to this extent, to call him family, could he put that burden on them all? What if Awful One got wind of this? What if he already knew? Worry littered his mind, an uncomfortable feeling settled like a rock in his stomach. He slapped his hand on the platform firmly, enough to indent but not destroy. No. No, he wasn't going to ruin a good thing because of his own worries as a pro hero. Endeavor was his number two just as much as All Might was his number one, and with that must come trust and a strong bond, which had quickly formed in the last year. It'd be a year in autumn. Ray's pregnancy was surprisingly smooth. Hara had prepared for the worst of the worst, seeing how his wife's pregnancy had been... rough to say the least, and now he felt clueless when it came to Rei. Maybe she was just lucky, maybe it was because she was peak of health, or maybe because she was simply that happy at the notion of having a child that not even hormones could phase her. Whatever the reason, Rei was bright and peppy. The only thing she complained about was cravings and having to buy new clothes. The former because they were random and she couldn't control them, and the latter because it was tiresome. It ended up with Kuramada and Haro doing the maternity wear shopping in her stead because her feet hurt. Neither complained. Kuramada's incredibly loyal, but not very talkative, is he? Ray asked to Enji one day. He's talkative when he has a strong opinion about something. Enji replied with a chuckle, remembering the few times Kuramada had angrily commented on the state of things in his car, be it Endeavor looking banged up and bruised, or Haro with too many grocery bags. While strictly an employee of Enji's, Kuramada had shown himself to be a fierce and loyal chauffeur, going above and beyond his duties. Hara believed it's because Kuramada is only a year older than Enji and respects the latter's hard work and dedication. Early autumn meant the Hero Billboard chart Japan, Enji's second time going on stage. Just like the year before, he wasn't looking forward to it at all. Endeavor was miles ahead of those rankings below him, and a strong contender to All Might's number one spot. Maybe in another life, Endeavor would have been seething at any gap in power between him and the blonde. But these days, Enji didn't care nearly as much. This wasn't the point of being a pro hero, and as number two, he had a duty to support and aid the symbol of peace in any way he could. Sometimes a trickle of his insecurities pestered him at his inability to catch up to All Might in the way he wanted. Endeavor dominated the number of cases solved, and their overall contribution to society and approval ratings were neck to neck, but the gap in strength level was suffocating. It would have infuriated Enji if Toshinori wasn't such a close friend now. But I didn't mean he had to stop training and aiming to be as strong as he could get, but Enji was slowly starting to accept that, unlike All Might, he had physical limitations. Even if he became the peak of human strength, there was only so much heat his body could tolerate before he burnt up. His biggest strength was also his biggest enemy. His own flames. Support items could only go so far, couldn't completely eradicate that weakness of his. But again, that wasn't the point of being a pro hero. Enji had to remind himself of that as he and Rei travelled to Tokyo where the event was being held this year. Haro decided to stay home. But Rei wanted to tag along and see more of the hero world her husband had dedicated his entire life to. It's not going to be very interesting, he'd argued. Rei waved him away. It doesn't matter, I want to go, she said stubbornly, hand on her bump. Five months pregnant, Ray's pregnancy was starting to show more prominently. She wore comfortable sweatshirts, which hid it a little, but she wasn't trying to do that anyway. It was just more comfortable than being restricted to tight clothing. Arriving at their designated hotel room, Ray flopped, sighing. The train trip had been easy, but her lower back still hurt anyway. I'm going to head out and meet All Might, Angie said, starting to strip from his civilian clothing, revealing his Endeavour suit underneath. PR suggested we're seen together beforehand, as they're sure this year's billboard is going to be a lot about us seeming up. He sighed deeply. Probably a bunch of interviews. He grumbled. How come you hate interviews so much? Ray asked as she watched her husband in Endeavor's suit undo their suitcase and put the clothes away so she won't have to. I don't hate interviews themselves. Answering questions is fine. It's just the fan service side of it I don't care for. And she replied, sliding the suitcases under the bed and sitting beside his wife. Stuff like favorite motivational quote or favorite team up, favorite fight. I don't have time for that. I could be working. Fans want to know about their heroes, I guess. Ray shrugged, understanding Enji's viewpoint. 
He was goal-orientated and a workaholic. Spending time on the seedy fluff was nonsensical to him, even if it might be a necessary flavouring to fans. But from what I've seen and heard, that's what your fans like about you. Your no-nonsense, hard-to-get attitude. Angie snorted at the comment and gave his own shrug. He didn't really get it. There were no pro heroes he looked up per se, many he respected and had taken advice from based on what they said in interviews when he searched in between the fan service. Crimson Riot had been one that piqued his interest. Maybe not agreed with on everything, but certainly worth listening to. But no hero had been his idol. Maybe his father. I'll be back, he said, kissing Ray's cheek. It went about as expected. Lots of eager fans surrounded the interviewing space that had been set up for All Might and Endeavour in front of All Might's agency. It was noisy, fan servicey, and Renji wanted to go back to Ray. Things would have ended fine if not for the sudden outburst from the crowd as a group of two excited girls started squealing. What's going on? Endeavour asked quietly to All Might, confused. All Might gave him a smile that told him he had no idea either. Endeavour rolled his eyes at his friend's uselessness. Endeavour! Endeavour! finally became clear among the squealing, which only further confused the flame hero. At hearing his name being shouted for, he perked his head up, stern expression glaring at some high school aged girls in the crowd. Who did you marry? Is it that white haired woman? Is it All Might? were one of the many intrusive questions that were yelled at him in a flurry, some much, much worse than others. And now he was extremely uncomfortable. Not confused, not embarrassed, not even annoyed. Just pure discomfort. Back in Masutafu, Ray was often seen in the area, and because of Endeavour's fans fighting tooth and nail for the gossip magazines to leave him alone, basically nothing had been published through the mainstream press. The people in Masutafu were respectful of their local hero in his own privacy. Online fan forums were a different kind of worms, and these girls had clearly indulged in some odd fantasies and theories to the fullest degree. While Endeavour looked unfazed, annoyed at worse, Toshinori could tell that Enji wanted to be anywhere else but here right now. If they didn't, he might say or do something he'd regret. Hey, that is not okay to ask! A woman's voice was heard from the crowd, scorning the demanding fans, which caught everybody's attention. At the distraction, All Might placed a hand on Endeavour's back, silently encouraging him to walk into his agency. Endeavour did so wordlessly. As soon as they were out of the public's eyes, Enji exhaled heavily and rubbed a hand up and down his face through his flames, then back up again through his hair, fire never extinguishing. I did not like whatever that was, he grunted bitterly. Overexcited young fans, it happens, All Might reassured him as softly as he could in his powered up form. They get a sense of entitlement sometimes. Endeavour had dealt with the intrusive press before, but having fans yell at him like that, he didn't like it. He would have preferred a bottle being thrown at his face. Why do they care so much about who I'm married to? And why do they want it to be you so badly? Angie asked, now sounding irritated as he fussed with his heatproof wedding ring, shooting a glare to his apologetic friend. He knew it wasn't his fault, but he was bordering on angry, and somebody had to bear the brunt of it. Some fans care about our personal lives, it makes us more relatable to them, and they connect better. Or might explain, but clearly, that left Endeavour dissatisfied, as his flames burned bright in indignation. That's celebrity nonsense. We're not celebrities, he snarled. You don't go about sharing your personal life. Why should I? You don't, All Might said, raising his hands defensively. Engie, you don't. I'm just saying that's how these types of fans view it. And when they don't get answers, they get pushy and can become disrespectful. And that seemed to ease up the tension for now, Endeavour taking a deep breath and exhaling steam through his nose like an angry bull. This is stupid, he growled crossing his arms, now in a bad mood at having been made uncomfortable. That wouldn't be good for tomorrow if Endeavour was feeling grumpy. All Might wasn't going to let one bad fan experience taint Endeavour's approval ratings that he had earned. Ray received a worried text from Haro and Toshinori before Enji returned to the hotel room. He was still in a bad mood, but not as much as he had been earlier with All Might. I saw the interview on the news. The goal of those girls, I swear. She scorned. Ray had heard the intrusive and indecent questions that had been yelled out, and while not obvious to anyone that didn't know Enji personally, his wife could see he had become wildly uncomfortable. Are you alright? Enji grunted but didn't say anything. Ray scowled and stood from her spot on the bed. Enji, she said with a soft sternness. It made her husband look at her, an annoying glint in his eyes, not directed at her. Are you alright? Silence. No, he admitted as he looked away again and shrugged off the top half of his suit. That fan interaction had really bothered him. 
Whoever that woman in the crowd was that told off those girls, he was grateful to her. Ray gently pulled on his wrist once his costume was off, and the material settling on his hips, and she guided him to sit on the bed. Like this, she was a little taller than him. Cupping his face, she ran her thumbs over his cheeks. The soothing motion made Engie's eyes flutter shut and he sighed, leaning forward slightly. His wife followed the motion and brought him against her chest, wrapping an arm around his head and the other over his naked shoulders. Engie wrapped her arms around her middle, feeling her pregnant belly against his chest. It's okay to admit that, she said softly, running her hands through his hair. That would have made anyone uncomfortable. Engie hummed in response, listening to Ray's voice with one ear and her heartbeat with the other. It caught me by surprise, he said softly, feeling the tension leave his body as he felt Ray's low body heat seeping into his. They stayed in silence for a while, until Ray was completely sure Engie wasn't in that filthy mood anymore. Or not as much, at least. I have an idea. Well, Toshinori had an idea, Ray said, tilted at Engie's head to look at her, his eyes confused but curious. The next day was a billboard event. It went as expected. Fanfare, speeches, lots of flashing cameras, and so on and so forth. The same as last year, except Endeavour and All Might were friends now. You two seem to have gotten close over the last year, the lady in charge of the mic said excitedly once it was time for the top 10 heroes' of speeches. You truly meant it when you said you'd support our symbol of peace. I said what I meant, Endeavour replied gruffly, not wanting to dilly-dally on this anymore. While less affected by the previous day's event, it still left a bad taste in his mouth. I intend on continuing to do so. And that was that from Endeavour. All Might went on about something or the other about the importance of teamwork and having each other's backs, but Endeavour's mind drifted elsewhere. In the crowd, he could see where Ray was sitting, with a special VIP pass, which meant she was almost directly in front of the stage. Making eye contact, she waved at him a little, which made a ghost of a smile appear on Endeavour's otherwise stern face. Thankfully, everybody was too busy paying attention to All Might to notice. The event was called to a close, and the top 10 heroes went off stage. While this is the part where Endeavour could have originally left and gone home, this is where Toshinori and Ray's plans came into play. Instead of leaving, Endeavour lingered around for the after-show socialization, his wife by his side. Ray, dressed in a smart, dark blue dress, adorned with an equally blue shawl with red details, stood beautiful and radiant beside her husband, flames still up but less intense so Ray wouldn't be affected. There, in the safety of being among heroes and licensed, authorised and professional reporters, Engie could officially introduce Ray Himura as his wife to everyone. Congratulations to the young couple, Yoroi Musha, the current number seven pro hero said with a slight bow to the both of them. You youngsters truly go into things quick these days, he said in the typical old man lament. Ray giggled slightly at the comment. He wasn't wrong. You're not so old yourself, Yoroi Musha. She waved with his laments away. He was in his 40s currently and chuckled at her words, although it wasn't seeable through his armour. If I may ask, when are you due? A heroine that Engie recognised as being of the Ida family asked her politely. I have a young son of my own. His name is Tensei, she added with a smile, clearly excited on behalf of the younger woman. Delighted to encounter a mother, Ray smiled brightly. February, we're expecting a boy. Ray replied cheerfully, happy to spread her joy of becoming a mother. That's exciting, the heroine cooed, pushing up her glasses as her husband, also adorned with glasses and wearing protective armour, came to stand beside her, smiling at the younger couple. If you ever need any help, us Ida would be delighted to be of support, the man nodded, motioning to endeavour with his hands in a chopping motion. Balancing parenthood and being a high-ranking hero will definitely be a challenge. Endeavour grunted in agreement to the dark-haired man. He knew these pro heroes to be dedicated and hard-working and trusted the Ida to have solid advice. I am here, speaking about your child. All Might slid into the conversation as if he was always here. Endeavour let out an exasperated sigh, looking as if All Might wasn't his best and only friend, but rather an annoying rash that never seemed to go away. A boy, eh? Have you decided on a name? Ray made a little humming noise and peered up to Engie. He looked down at her. She wanted him to say it. He looked at the small group of heroes surrounding them. Toya, he said firmly, almost proudly. Arrow of Light, what a great name, All Might said twice as proudly, as if that was his own son they were speaking about. Little did everybody else know, this would be his first nephew. Right? Ray said, matching All Might's energy before looking up at Engie once again. You want to say why? Engie gave his wife an exasperated smile. My father's quirk is named Candlelight. Other than the obvious, the kanji for to can also be used for lantern or lamp, where candles were used. He said simply, 
getting an R from the few heroes around them, which did embarrass him, but he tried to convince himself they meant it genuinely and not to mock him. Hera had started crying again when they told him the name they had settled on. There were several reasons for choosing the name Toya, but that was the first and primary reason. Ray clung onto Endeavor's arm and smiled brightly at him, looking proud of her husband, not just for his achievements as a pro hero, but also for doing so well in socialising. Honestly, she was having more fun than she expected. Originally, she would have just stayed for the main event and then the two would have immediately gone home, but after yesterday's debacle, making a small show of them as a couple in a safe environment seemed like the best thing to do. Otherwise, Endeavor might get harassed again and who knew what that would lead to. By the time they were home, the reputable and respected magazines published the headlines Endeavor Married and Father To Be were in big bold letters, with a photo of the number two hero and Ray in her lovely dress both standing proudly beside each other was on the front page. While initially a little frantic, the PR team agreed this was for the best, and scouring the fan forums, it seemed that the overall agreement was that people should mind their own business and happy wishes to the couple as well as congratulations for the baby. There were a couple comments about Ray being a Himura. While the family had fallen into obscurity, their methods of gaining money were by no means a secret. But the PR team didn't mention this. It was only one or two people. Having the number two hero seemingly happily married, with a beautiful and proud wife and a child on the way, the country was in high spirits, excited for the two of them. Everything was good. Hara was proud, Toshino was happy, and Ray was radiant. And Enji was at peace. Until Endeavor wasn't. Chapter 15. Flash. He couldn't breathe. It was so hard to breathe. His vision was blurring, and his heart felt like it was imploding and bursting out of his chest at the same time. The smell of dust, burning, and smoke was overpowering. His ears buzzed from where the building had collapsed around, emerging and mashing with the screams of civilians. In front of him, a big blue, red, and white mass was moving forward, was moving rapidly towards him, adorned by familiar yellow hair. Ever, endeavor! The yell pierced his confusion and suddenly Endeavor was brought back to reality, his breathing heavy on the verge of hyperventilating, eyes wide and wild as he looked up to All Might, who, despite the smile, had a worried glint in his eyes for his number two. Take these civilians, bring them to safety, he said in his bombastic, confident tone. What? Why? Where was he? What was happening? No. 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 Focus. What's the situation? All Might is holding out a terrified woman, cradling her small, crying child to him. Bring them to safety. Where is safety? Behind him, where the medical care is. Right. Endeavour choked out, taking the mother and child in his arms. He had a task. Focus on the task. Don't worry about anything. Think about it later. Think about how you froze later. Standing in the hospital room, Endeavour stared at himself in the window. Beyond himself, the sky was grey dark, thick smoke coming from the collapsed building he and All Might had been saving civilians from. Except he didn't save anyone. He froze. Just like he did almost ten years ago. He watched that mother and child almost be crushed by a building, and he did nothing. If it wasn't for All Might, they would have died. Why didn't he do anything? Why was he still weak? After all this time... His own reflection was staring wide-eyed at him, furious and accusatory. Why are you weak? He couldn't bear looking at himself anymore, and he shut his eyes, turning to face the wall and leant on it with his forehead. Deep inhale, exhale, deep inhale, exhale. It wasn't working. He could feel his fire bubbling under his skin, veins threatening to burst open with rage at any second, fury shaking his system as he was once again flooded with sensations of weakness. Weak, weak, weak. NG? N- ah, NG! The last person he wanted to see right now called out to him. There you are. Are you all right? It sounded condescending to Endeavor's ears. Stop checking up on him. Stop looking down on him. Stop treating him like he's weak. But he is weak. If he wasn't, he would have saved that mother and child. NG? A worried voice and kind hand reached out to him. The second he felt the air shift close to his body, Endeavor whipped his fist around, smacking All Might's hand away. The latter took a step back, eyes widening in shock at the man before him. Endeavor's face was twisted in a furious snarl, hair messy from the mission, 
eyes venomous and hateful, all targeted at the symbol of peace. This man was in his way. This man was a proof to his weakness, his inability to be better, be the best. He had to prove he was the best. NG! All Might exclaimed, hand raised offensively as his supposed friend glared nothing but hatred in his direction. What? Shut up! He hollered, making the blonde flinch, mouth slightly agape. He'd never seen him like this before. Pure rage rolled off of Endeavour and engulfed the room, his flames growing and growing until they almost covered his back and face fully, looking more like a demon than human. Don't condescend me! Condescend? I'm not! NG, I'm worried! Wrong thing to say. Endeavour threw a fury and flame power punch at All Might, the latter catching it in his larger palm. Despite the blonde's terrifying strength, the intensity and violence behind the attack made him skid on the tiles a little, and he winced at the flames burning his suit. The heat was intense. Calm down! The number one tried to ease the fire user, but there was no one to reach out to other than pure fury. Hatred. Hatred for All Might. NG please! Toshinori begged, now eye level with the fiery man. Now that he wasn't powered up, the flames were licking dangerously at his skin, the man in front of him a real danger to his life if he wanted to be. The flames were snuffed out instantly, leaving a wide-eyed, horrified and panting Enji in their wake. He was sweating, his arms and shoulders were trembling, and he wasn't able to catch his breath. A panic attack. Enji, Enji, eyes on me! Toshinori tried to get his attention, a slight shake in his voice. Enji's unfocused eyes locked onto Toshinari's equally bright blues, as if only now recognising him. Match my breathing. Breathe in. Breathe out. Given a task, Enji followed it obediently. Breathe in. Breathe out. Good job. Again. Breathe in. Breathe out. Where are you? Toshinari asked gently, still holding Enji's fist. Hospital. Enji breathed out continuing to concentrate on his breathing. What's the date? November 17th. NG excelled, shutting his eyes as if in pain. It's Tuesday. They stayed in silence. Toshinori had his free hand on NG's shoulder, previously to hold him back, but now to hold him up. NG's head dropped forward, still breathing shallowly, but as seconds ticked by, his breathing returned to normal. Are you okay? Toshinori asked carefully. NG shook his head. No, he admitted with a tight voice, remembering what Ray had said through the fog in his brain. No, I'm not. Tuesday, November 17th. The drills incident. A female villain with long twisting curls used a quirk-enhancing drug and went out of control. Destroyed several buildings in a school area. She wanted to punish her old schools for making fun of her hair. All Might and Endeavour were at the scene. All Might was fighting the villain while Endeavour directed civilians and children away from the carnage keeping the attacks and falling rubble away from them. Things were fine. Everything was going as it always was, until... until he saw a school building collapsing on a mother and her toddler child. Endeavour was too far away, in the middle of several actions at once and his body not in the right momentum to blast towards them, unable to reach them in time. And suddenly he was thirteen again, powerlessly watching his father be buried in rubble. Endeavour had frozen. And if it wasn't for All Might noticing and momentarily abandoning the villain to save them, that mother and child would have been crushed to death. Because Endeavour was too weak. I couldn't save anyone. Enji lamented tensely, voice tight with emotion. Couldn't save anyone. Enji, you saved everyone. There were no casualties. Toshinori said softly, trying to understand his friend's current mental state. Enji shook his head, head still down. That mother and child... If you hadn't stepped in, they would have died. Enji's voice came out shaky and weak, his body sagging. Toshinori was watching his tall and proud friend shrink in front of him under the weight of his own assumed failures. I froze. Toshinori didn't know what to say. So he didn't say anything at all. He stepped into Enji's personal space and brought his friend's face into his shoulder, letting go of his fist to bring his hand to the back of Enji's hair. Against him, Enji breathed shakily. He wasn't holding pro-hero Endeavour. This was 13-year-old NG who had seen his father almost die. A post-traumatic stress reaction. Toshinori had seen it many times, but not an NG. Not proud, powerful, confident Endeavour who demanded respect. The emotions, left unspoken and untouched, stewed below the surface until they became an uncomfortable weight on his shoulders that would never leave, 
a familiar discomfort that he had lived with for years. Left alone, who knows what that could turn into. I'm sorry. The weak voice snapped Toshino out of his thoughts, not recognising it as Engie's. It's okay, he said softly. I can take it. Not from me. You're my number two, right? Toshinori asked softly, creating a little distance between them. Angie's eyes were watery of unshed tears, regret and sorrow deep in his features. The blonde's hand was still cradling his head and nape, his other hand steady on his shoulder. A small nod. And I'm your symbol of peace. Our symbol of peace. Angie echoed hollowly, repeating his own words he had said over a year ago. No, Angie, listen, Toshinori said, tightening his hold gently on Angie's nape and shoulder making his friend look at him again. Your symbol of peace. Singularly, you. Angie swallowed a little, blinking rapidly. Yeah, he said weakly. We have each other's back. My number two, who supports and helps me in no ways anybody else can. Your symbol of peace, who is your friend and the future uncle of your kids. The hand on the nape moved to Angie's shoulder, holding him steady. You told me you don't have to struggle alone. Same goes for you. Letting out another shaky, long exhale, Engie nodded, and held Toshinori's wrists as if they were his life support. Do you want to talk about it? Engie shook his head at Toshinori's question. You should talk about it. It'll get worse if you don't. I know, I... Engie swallowed, then moved his neck in an odd way as if trying to relieve tension. I know. I can't. Not right now. Toshinori sighed, nodding. Don't push it. It'll only make it worse. I'll text Hara and Ray. You're going home. Angie looked defeated and exhausted. He didn't greet Hara nor Ray when he arrived home, dropping his things at the entrance before doing a direct beeline to his home gym, where he spent the last five hours in. It was now one in the morning, and Hara had tried three times to bring Angie out. Angie, come have dinner. Not hungry. Angie, come drink some water. Not thirsty. Angie, go to bed. Not tired. Hara couldn't do anything. Angie had shut himself off, and Hara knew this wasn't a case of Angie overworking himself to get stronger. He was punishing himself. Hara didn't know what to do. Hara, what happened? Ray asked, confused and concerned. They'd never spoken, not really, about what happened when Angie was 13. It was painful, and Hara still had nightmares. Not that he'd let anyone else know. And that was the problem. He'd been scared of dealing with his own trauma of the event. He'd indirectly stunted Engie as well. When Engie was 13, there was a villain attack at my school. Harrow started softly, feeling his body ache in phantom pains as he recalled the memory. I was in the gymnasium teaching a class. We tried escaping, but this one girl wasn't running fast enough. I tried to help her, but in the time it took to get out, the building would collapse on us. Engie saw it all. He took in a deep breath, eyes shutting at the sensation of rubble on his back and neck. The smell of dust and blood filled his nose. Somehow, by some miracle, I lived. I got a second chance at life. Before that, I was absent. I was busy with work, and I left Engie alone. I don't want to think what would have happened to Engie if I left him alone in that state. His voice trailed off, and he paused. Ray looking at him gently. We never talked about it. I knew Angie was struggling with insecurities about being weak, but I never pried. I hoped he'd tell me one day. Or maybe not. Maybe I didn't want to talk about it either. He stopped, guilt grasping at his throat. Ray, after a moment, stood up and left Tara in the living room. Reaching the home gym, she heard the sound of fire punching and something cracking, then Engie said hissing softly, mumbling something under his breath he, she couldn't hear. Opening the sliding door carefully, she saw Engie on the other side of the room, holding his bleeding fist. There was a large crack in the wall, blood smeared on the centre of it. Engie was breathing heavily, his body steaming, what sweat formed immediately sizzling and evaporating. The room was thick with hot, humid air, suffocating Ray. Engie... Her voice cut through the air like a blade, making her husband jump. It's late. Come to bed. Angie looked at her feverishly, body shaking slightly. I can't, he replied in a shaky whisper. You must. 
Ray insisted, tapping into Batodoroki's stubbornness. You've had a long day. Come rest. I can't, Enji hissed, shoulders shaking. I can't. I need to train. Otherwise, otherwise, train tomorrow. His wife stepped into the room, carefully watching him, not knowing how he'd react. He didn't move. Enji, you're overusing your quirk. You're hurting yourself. Stop. His eyes fluttered shut, looking in pain, as if only now realising his body was screaming at him to take a break. Legs shaking, they gave out underneath him, making him fall to his knees, the tatami floors only barely cushioning the impact. Ray was quickly in front of him, frost collecting on her hands before reaching out to her husband. She winced at his burning skin as he flinched at her, at her biting cold, exhaling shakily at the temperature contrast. As Ray cooled him down, Enji wrapped his arms around her waist, eyes shut tight as he rested his head against her pregnant belly. Almost immediately, he felt something press back against his cheek. Six months along, unborn Toya was already making his presence known. If All Might hadn't been there, a mother and child would have died, he said shakily as his body slowly returned to a normal temperature. Ray said nothing, bringing a hand to his head to ruffle his hair soothingly. I thought I was stronger now. You are, Ray reassured. Even without your quirk, you're strong. No man can do everything alone. Just like what Toshinari had said, Enji knew they were right, but he had tried so hard to convince himself he was better. What if I'm not strong enough to protect you? He asked, flattening his hands against the middle and smaller Ray's back. And Toya? Enji, his wife said softly, feeling his skin cool down under her touch as she brought it to his cheek, making him look up at her. We're a team. We'll figure it out together, like we always do. Her voice was soft, caring and soothing. Burning yourself isn't going to make it better. What else can I do? He murmured, sounding desperate for an answer. Any answer. Right now, and Ray moved to both her hands to his forehead, brushing his humid hair away from his face, the motion making his eyes flutter. You can be nicer to yourself. Take a shower. Come to bed. Talk about it in the morning. Enji let out a wet, shaking exhale and leaned his head into her icy hands. Okay. Hara and Enji did talk first thing in the morning. To get it over with, it was awkward. I still get nightmares. Tight spaces freak me out, and some sounds make me panic. Hara hurriedly admitted after all these years, uncomfortable as he rubbed the back of his neck. I, I knew you were feeling weak, especially in your first year of UA, but I didn't know what to say to help you. There wasn't much you could have said. What you did at the time was exactly what I needed. And you replied, eyes foggy of exhaustion. Emotions are hard. I'm not strong like I want to be. He breathed out after a moment, ashamed. Not enough. Never enough. When will it ever be enough? You were just a kid, Enji. Hara reminded him. There's nothing you could have done. Enji sighed heavily, nodding. Hara was right. So were Toshinori and Rei. From what little Enji revealed to them, they had managed to pick at him and bring him into the light, exposing every vulnerability and insecurity, while at the same time soothing and supporting him. It was confusing. It made Edgy feel nauseous while cared for at the same time. He shouldn't need this validation. He was a grown man. Edgy started to recoil, physically pulling himself from the situation. Hara laid his hand on top of his son's larger one. Don't run away, he said gently but firmly. I won't let you. Let's find a solution. Edgy hesitated for a moment, then nodded. By the time Edgy had to leave for work, they figured out one solid solution. Communication. When something triggered a negative response, pull away, figure out why that reaction happened, and discuss it. Haro and Enji are emotionally private men, even with how things were these days. The idea of opening up about their incident to anyone but each other, Rei and Toshinori, genuinely distressed them, even if they couldn't pinpoint why. That would be part of the process. The next time Enji saw Toshinori, it was a week later, after Ray's routine pregnancy checkup. All was well of Toya. Enji had jolted to a halt when he saw his blonde friend and looked to Ray for support, but he was quickly ambushed into a bear hug from Toshinori. Now annoyed at the lack of personal space, he grumbled and tapped Toshinori's arm to release him. How are you feeling? Toshinori asked, a jovial smile on his face. 
Angie squinted at his expression but saw no hint of worry or concern, just a genuine question. Better. Dad and I are working through it, with Ray's help, he replied after a moment, squeezing Ray's shoulders from where his arm was wrapped around her. She smiled at the two taller men. About before, I should have controlled myself. Toshino patted him on the shoulder. Seriously, don't stress about it, he reassured, a soft smile on his face. Anything for a friend. The corner of Engie's lips twitched upwards into a smile. Speaking of friend, we're organising a family trip halfway through December to Hokkaido before Christmas. Would you like to come along? Ray offered. Because Toshinori is family, Sapporo in Hokkaido has the most snow in all of Japan, which of course delighted Ray. Now heavily pregnant, there wasn't much she could do without feeling exhausted quickly, but that didn't stop her from taking walks in the snow accompanied by Haro, Toshinori and Enji. She was in good hands. Toshinori, being All Might, couldn't stay the whole holiday, but did block out a day where he could spend it with the Todoroki family. As Haro said, all punishment and no reward is bad for the soul, so this was Toshinori's reward to himself. It was snowing heavily, thick snowflakes covered their eyelashes and hair like a white blanket. Being later in the afternoon, it was already a little dark out, but the group of four were walking in the outside area of the hotel they were lodging at. They all had hot drinks in their hands, even Ray as she had somebody else to worry about beside herself. "'What's the snow like in the USA?' Ray asked Toshinori. "'When it snows, it really snows. The weather tends to be intense in general over there,' the latter replied after downing the rest of his hot chocolate, grinning at the memories in the United States of his friends and colleagues. He got an idea. Toshinori crouched down. "'Hey, Angie. "'Hm?' his unassuming friend grunted out, looking out into the fogginess of the snowy city. "'Think fast!' Engie narrowly dodged the snowball that was aimed for his head, side-eyeing the number one hero as if he was a wine stain on the carpet. Childish, he grunted, downing the rest of his own drink. Thinking he had made Engie be mad at him, Toshinori chuckled nervously, rubbing the back of his head. Suddenly, powdery cold smacked him square in the face. Don't announce your attacks. Endeavor stood before him, another snowball in his hand that he was bouncing up into the air. Toshinori spluttered through the snow in his face, blinking in surprise before grinning mischievously. Oh, you're on. Ray and Haro watched as Toshinori pelted Enju of snowballs, the latter returning the attack of gusto. At one point, he caught one of the assaulting snowballs, only to ricochet it back to his attacker, hard enough to make the tall blonde stumble. Those are our top two heroes, Haro said flatly, watching his boys wrestle each other into the snow. Ray laughed, happy to see some of the guilty weight that had lingered around Engie the last couple weeks be lifted as he held Toshinori in a headlock before he was thrown into the thick snow. Toyo won't be bored with us four to look after him. Quite, Ray giggled, laying a hand on her heavy stomach. He's in good hands. Ah, Engie, not the hair! Toshinori complained in the snow as Engie pulled on his ridiculous hair tufts. All spare in love and war! Angie replied back with a tinge of mischievous delight, letting himself be a kid for once. He found himself with a face full of snow when Toshino grabbed a handful and threw it at him to free himself. He's in fairly good hands. Ray corrected herself jokingly, getting a snicker from Haro. I'm really happy. I hope you are too. He said softly, looking fondly at his daughter-in-law. I am. She replied, eyes softening as she returned his gaze. After a moment, a slight seriousness settled in her face. I don't know if I want my parents involved in Toya and any of my future children's lives. I'm worried they'll negatively affect them with old stories of the past. You don't have to give details if you don't want to. Just small updates to keep them happy if you want. But I think they should be the ones making the effort to contact you if they want a relationship. They owe you that much, Haro said softly, finishing his own drink. I'm just glad Toya will have both parents and an uncle present. Unlike Enji, went unsaid. Haro slowly learning to not beat himself over his wife running away like she did. There were so many understandable reasons as to why she would have been overwhelmed and left, but as Enji kept knocking into his father's brain, she had abandoned them both, especially Haro, making him a single father at 18 in a society that wasn't easy on single parents. But it was so easy for Haro to see his own fault and where he had fallen short. Something he had regrettably given to Enji too, it seems. Speaking of... Enji and Toshinori returned, soaking wet and freezing. Well, Toshinori was freezing. Enji was looking all too smug as he used his quirk to heat himself up and dry his clothes. The rest of the holiday passed by peacefully. Then Christmas, Ray's birthday and New Year. And suddenly, it was January. They were preparing for the newborn baby already, 
the due date being early mid-February. That was the plan. That's how things should have played out. Angie jotted awake from his sleep as he was frantically shaken awake. Blinking the sleep away, he saw Roy with wide, frightened eyes, kneeling over him as if she was in pain. In a hushed, whispery voice, tense with emotion, she said, Something's wrong. Chapter 16 Light Toya was tiny, and far too quiet. Normal among premature babies, apparently, but not what Engie had prepared himself for. This was a shock to everyone, especially Ray. The suddenness of going into labour put a painful amount of stress on her body, which had forced the nurses to keep her in intense recovery while Toya was taken to the neonatal care unit without even a second for either Harrow or Angie to process what was happening. Initially, Angie had been torn between staying with his wife and leaving to keep an eye on their newborn, but Ray had none too gently made the choice for him when she ordered her husband to not let their son be alone. Harrow promised to stay as close to Ray as the hospital would allow, waiting outside her room in the hallway. So here Angie was, sitting stiffly by the NICU incubator his small son was sleeping in. It had only been a couple hours, but the lack of updates on Ray made them feel like years. His only comfort was knowing his small son was currently in stable condition. As the morning light started peeking through the window and snapping Angie out of his semi-shocked state by blinding him, the redhead sighed and leant forward in his chair, properly looking at little Toya for the first time. He needed to find a way to settle his nerves, so he ran through the facts in his mind as he stared down at the new little human that was his son. Toya was born four weeks prematurely, in the early hours of the 18th January. With red hair, tiny little lashes, and small hands wound tightly into fists, Toya was the most gorgeous sight Engie had ever saw. That was his son, his firstborn, his little light. A warm feeling bloomed in his chest as he watched over Toya through the material of the incubator, the newborn making a small shift in his position. He had a tube in his tiny nose, which pained Engie to witness, but he understood it was necessary. Even so, he didn't like it at all. He became blind and deaf to the world as he watched his undersized son rest in what he hoped was a peaceful sleep, not noticing someone approach. Angie's whole body jolted as a hand laid on his shoulder, and when he looked up, saw the tired but warm expression of his father. Hey, Tara said softly. You okay? How's Ray? Angie asked hurriedly, a slight panic in his tone. Recovering. Physically, she's fine, but she's going to need to rest. She told... Mm, ordered me to come check up on you and Toya, his father replied with a small amused smile. Ray thinking about others before herself, even when she was the one needing the most care, sounded very much like her. Angie let out a breath he didn't realise he was holding, and his shoulders drooped. He swallowed. Can I go see her? He asked almost timidly, as if seeing his wife was a privilege that could easily be taken away. Soon. I only got to see her for a moment before she sent me away. Harrow nodded, taking a seat beside his son as he looked into the incubator, seeing his newborn grandson. Hello, Toya. His voice softened, smiling softly at the little sleeping baby. Angie watched his father. Seeing him calm soothed what remaining nerves were jittering in his brain, and he returned to looking at his son. You are a behemoth of a baby, you know that? Angie snorted. I'm unsurprised, he replied without taking his eyes off his son. Angie had always been big for his age, to the point people mistook him for an adult by the time he joined UA. A stressful worry Hara had lived with the entire three years of the hero course. Do you think Toy will always be small? I don't know, Hara admitted. I'm sure the nurses will inform us. They stayed in a moment of silence together, just watching Toya as the sky outside turned from an inky black to a light blue. Then Toya made a twitchy movement. Angie thought his nerves were going to strangle him. Harrow stifled a laugh. First time father nerves, the older Todoroki said as he patted his son on the shoulder. It doesn't get better. Angie dragged a hand down his face, exhaling through his nose heavily. A nurse entered the unit and started checking on the various wires and lights of the incubator before she addressed the new father and grandfather. Your wife is resting. You can visit her once she's woken up, she said with a reassuring smile. Having the Goliath that was Endeavour look at her with worried puppy eyes while sitting beside his tiny son wasn't something she had been prepared for so early this morning, but it wasn't a sight she complained about, especially when everything was settling down now. And your son is stable too. 
other than being small, there aren't any obvious signs of illness. Typically with premature births, we want them to stay at the hospital until they reach the pregnancy due date, but if Toya st continues to stay stable, you might be able to take him home early. Angie and Harry listen attentively to the nurse, both the type to take a professional's knowledge extremely seriously. Would you like to hold him? Is that alright? Angie asks cautiously, not wanting to cause his son unnecessary stress when he was already so fragile, and also because he was suddenly extremely nervous. Absolutely. Skin-on-skin -skin contact is actually preferred. Usually with the mother, but with the father is important too. The nurse nodded as she opened the incubator and motioned Angie to come closer. He did as he was instructed, hands getting a little warm as a new wave of nerves started rattling. Angie watched the nurse like a hawk as she lifted his small, wire-connected son and carefully offered the snoozing baby to him. Here. On autopilot, Angie took his carefully bundled son, the nurse having covered his small hands with the soft fabric that he was wrapped in, so he didn't get cold. He was tiny, fitting snugly in Angie's much larger hands. His heart was beating fast, and he swallowed, unable to look away from the small red-haired baby. Toya shifted, adjusting the change in environment before pressing his small cheek against his father's warm fingers. A small, yawn-like noise escaped him as he opened his mouth, and little blue eyes flitted open and Angie wasn't nervous anymore. As little Toya fell back to a comfortable sleep, Angie smiled. He was perfect. Ray didn't wake up until midday. The first thing she saw when she opened her eyes was Angie by her bed, eyes closed with his arms cradling something she couldn't see. Angie, she said softly, cut off by a yawn. Her husband's eyes opened immediately, showing he hadn't been asleep, only resting. Ray, he said a little hurriedly, but very, very carefully moved to face her fully, leaning over to her. How are you feeling? Okay, I guess. Ray was still waking up, but not as tired as she had felt before. Numb at worse. Then she frowned. Why aren't you with Toya? She asked with worry, suddenly anxious. Angie shifted to reveal a small lump under the fabric of his clothing, red hair peeking from his half undone shirt. He's here. Angie said as he carefully manoeuvred to show her their newborn son. Now that she was more awake, Ray could see a couple wires connected to Toya that led to a machine standing beside her hospital bed. The nurse has said he was stable enough to not be in the incubator anymore. They still want to keep an eye on his heartbeat though, Angie explained gently, not wanting Ray to stress about the wires. He could tell she didn't like looking at them. Ray reached out to her baby, and Angie scooched closer so she could touch Toya. With gentle fingers, she brushed her baby's red hair, Toya making a little noise, but not waking up from where he was snuggled against his father's chest. He's so small, Ray said lovingly, eyes soft and watery as if she was about to cry. Angie silently offered Toya to his wife, who eagerly accepted him into her gentle hands, bringing her tiny son to lay on her chest. Even on Ray, who was much smaller than Angie, Toya looked undersized. Now laying down against his mother, Toya's little arms stretched out experimentally with a yawn before relaxing on Ray fully, falling back to a deep sleep with no care in the world. Ray laid her hands gently around him to protect her son from said world, and what tears she had dripped down her cheeks, relief at him being warm and alive against her. Angie leaned down to give her a kiss on the head, leaning his cheek against her slightly messy white hair. I was so scared, Ray admitted through a quiet sob. Angie gave a gentle hum in return. You did amazing, he murmured, laying a hand on her arm. Ray leaned into her husband, turning her head so her face was in his shirt. Bringing up his other hand to her face, he cradled her cheek so she could silently cry tears of relief against him, nuzzling her hair. Nurses came and went as the days passed by, but Harry gave his son and daughter-in-law the alone time he believed they needed with their baby. Compared to when his wife had given birth to Angie, this was peaceful. Angie hadn't been a noisy or fussy newborn, just a big one, and that had put a toll on his mother's body and already spiralling mental state. She had refused to hold or feed him, leaving Harrow to be the one to cradle their newborn son tight against his chest while the nurses tried to encourage the new mother to look after her son. Despite the unexpected stress, Ray and Angie had fallen in love with Toya long before he was even born, and while having him connected to wires was less than appreciated, Hara knew they loved him even more now that they could hold their baby. Hara was at the nurse's every beck and call, 
wanting to disturb the new parents as little as possible. But nurses gave Harrow a list of things he needed to go out and get for both the parents and baby for their stay at the hospital before they could be discharged. Mostly baby things from home for Toya to already get used to, but also comforts for Ray, such as her favourite clothing and blankets that smelled like home, to make the mental recovery easier for her. They needed both the baby and mother to feel peaceful and comfortable. On the evening of Toya's birth, Harrow was called into Ray's hospital room by her son. Ray looked a little more rested, not having let go of Toya, who was still blotted against her chest, soundly asleep after a half-successful attempt at feeding. Despite the stress of the morning, things had somewhat settled now, and while they'd need to stay at the hospital for at least a couple weeks, Toya had already seemed on the path of recuperating just fine. Thank you for getting the blanket, Ray said with a smile, referring to the baby blanket Hara had brought from home that Toya was now snoozing under. It's the least I could do, Hara waved off, not wanting to be thanked for the bare minimum. He sat beside Ray's bed, Angie standing on the other side. He's beautiful, Hara said fondly as he looked at his little grandson, now looking a lot more comfortable than when he was in the incubator. Do you want to hold him? Ray asked, gaining an eager look from her father-in-law. Only if you want me to, Hara replied. Ray very much wanted him to, and motioned him to come scoop her baby son off her chest, lifting said baby a little. Hara very carefully picked up Toya, who made a quiet sound of absolute disdain at being disturbed from his cosy spot. Cradling Toya the same way he had cradled Engie when he was born, Hara could have burst into tears if he let himself. He's so cute. He all but squeaked out, completely melting at the sight of his grandson, who looked like a mini version of his son. Ray and Angie smiled at each other in amusement and fondness, already knowing that Harry would be the best grandfather, only affirmed by how emotional he was right now. The two weeks at the hospital went smoothly, if only extremely dull. Ray was just about done being told what to do by the doctor and nurses, only wanting to go home and figure out her, her routine with her beloved baby boy. Said child had become more and more active day by day, despite sleeping most of the time. When he was awake, though, he made sure to let everybody know, making up for his first day of silence with loud exclamations of being alive. Toy was a centre of attention and he clearly reveled in it. Between his mother, father and grandfather, Toy was well-loved and was king in their hearts. While still small for a baby, it wasn't so much that they had to worry about it. According to the nurses, he'd always be on the small side, but that was no bother to any of the Todoroki family. Toya was here, and he was alive, and that's all they wanted. While he's overall stable and in good shape, keep a close eye on his behaviour and development, the doctor had said, going through pages on a clipboard. While not the case for every preterm baby, there's a chance a number of things could happen, from learning difficulties to behavioural issues. Just keep that in mind. They definitely would. But for now, the new parents just indulged in their baby boy. Since Toy was born earlier than expected, Endeavour had to reorganise his parental leave. He was his own boss, but he had to change the schedule to not burden his psychics with his unexpected absence. With already two weeks of his paternity leave had done at the hospital, he had another two weeks before he was due to return to work. His psychics had sent him many wishes and congratulations, as well as requests to take it easy and not worry about heroics, but they could manage it. Endeavour knew they could, but he still had a duty as number two to fulfil. For Ida's comment nagged him. Balancing hero work and parental duties would be a challenge. It was a challenge he was willing to take on, but he wanted to do it right. When Ray called the Ida to let them know of Toy's birth, Mrs Ida and Ray had become good acquaintances, and the more experienced parents congratulated her, Angie dared to ask for advice. Block out consecutive days to spend time with the family, the fellow father hero said to Angie, the latter hearing the swishing of a chopping motion through the air. Make plans as a family and spend as much time doing things with your son when you're at home, especially in their developmental years. That made sense. Engie thanked the engine hero. They lived in a different city and their son Tensei was a good few years older than Toya, so while they didn't have a reason to meet, they could still help each other as parents. Ray suddenly seemed to like talking with the fellow mother. Tashinira had also been kept up to date by Haruo, but he was in a completely different part of Japan and couldn't be with them right now. Not to mention, Ray had decided on no visitors until Engie's parental leave was up, wanting them to just have some time together. One thing became clear very quickly. Toya adored Engie. If Ray wasn't feeding him, Toya wanted to be held by Engie and would make unhappy noises if he wasn't. It made Ray feel a little down at the notion that Toya didn't want to be held by her as much, but Engie made sure she never felt left out. 
Whenever he was holding Toya, Ray was blotted against him as well, the two parents watching their baby lovingly as he slept, and every time he yawned or blinked, their hearts melted. Harrow took charge of looking after things around the house, much to the new parents' complaints. He did all the chores that needed to be done when he wasn't at work, cooked breakfast and dinner, did the shopping, and even took part in caring for Toya. I may be a grandfather now, but I'm not senile, Harrow huffed when Ray and Ng worried he was doing too much. I've only just entered my 40s. He made his point loud and clear in the Todoroki fashion. Ray and Ng stopped worrying. The day before he was meant to return to work, Ng invited Toshinori over for dinner to meet Toya. He's tiny, Toshinori loudly whispered as he looked at Toya snuggled against Ray's chest. This was one of the few moments Toya desired to be held by Ray. When that did happen, his mother refused to unclasp him from her arms. He'll probably stay relatively small for the rest of his life, but we don't mind, as long as he lives and is happy, Ray said with a smile, giving her little baby a smooch on the head. Toshinori smiled as he made a happy humming noise in response. Do you know when his quirk will show? He asked. He couldn't help himself but be curious. While his friends didn't know this, Toshinori was originally quirkless, and he had never experienced nor saw how quirks manifested. It was something he'd always wondered about. Not yet, though we're guessing it's probably fire-based, because of the hair, Harrow said, motioning to Engie's and his own. Ray had come up with the theory that Harrow's hair was burgundy because his fire quirk was weaker, while Engie's was a bright red because he was more powerful. So in theory, if Harrow's quirk was stronger, his hair would be redder. Ray had even suggested that they'd know if their kids had inherited her quirk if they had white hair. It makes sense, right? Ray said after her explanation, sounding a little proud as if she had cracked some code. That actually does, yeah, Toshinori said thoughtfully with an amused smile. What would you think of that, Toya? Wanna have a fire quirk like your dad? He said directly to Toya, who cracked an eye open and stared straight at him in the way only babies knew how to. His parents and grandfather laughed at the new family member's reaction. You're the first person other than us and the nurses to meet him. He'll be side-eyeing you for a while, Haro explained with a chuckle. Oh, have your parents not met him yet? Toshinori asked Ray, who bit the inside of a cheek in thought. I haven't invited them. I'm not sure if I want them to meet him. Not yet, she admitted, nuzzling her son's hair a little as he sniffed curiously against her collarbone. Maybe when he's a little older. I want them to be stronger before we take him anywhere outside of Masutafu. As she said this, Toy began whimpering, curling his tiny hands into little fists and pushing with what baby strength he had. Getting the hint, Ray looked over to Enji, who stopped half-bite to watch Toya the second he made a sound. Enji quickly put his chopsticks down to take Toya into his arms, his baby son becoming peaceful once again when he felt his father's unique warmth and quickly snoozed off. Ray took this time to start eating her own dinner, Toshinori grinning at Enji as he saw the man melt at the sight of Toya's completely past that expression. If Enji had become a father around the time he'd become number two, before he met Ray, Toshinori doesn't think he would have been nearly as openly fatherly and loving as he now was. It was endearing. The transition between Enji being at home all the time and having to return to work was a rough one for Toya. Despite only being almost five weeks old, the lack of his father was very much noticed and left him fussy. It made being a new mother a bit of a struggle for Rei, knowing she couldn't mimic Enji's warmth to ease her son. She had managed to make a temporary comfort using a hot water bottle and a blanket, but that only worked for so long before Toya started fussing again. It was a relief whenever Enji came home and she could take a break. Thankfully, it got a little easier as the weeks went by and Toya got used to the new rhythm. Outside of this, he ate well, grew as he should, and did the baby things every baby does. The day he first smiled, it was to Ray when he woke up in the morning and she had almost started crying. Many photos were sent to both Enji and Harrow that day, the two men more than eager to return home to their now smiley Toya. Whenever he smiled, Enji was happy to see how much he looked like Ray. Toya also really liked to grab. He'd grab Ray's hair more if it was longer, and Toshinori's hair tufts were his number one target whenever his uncle came to visit. And when he had them, he did not let go. Oftentimes, Toshinori was left sitting on the couch as Toya had held him hostage by his hair. Another thing he adored was his father and grandfather's fire quirks. If he was ever fussy or upset when Haru and Enji was home, all they had to do was summon a small flame, and Toya was entranced. Sometimes he tried to reach out to the flame, but they always kept him out of harm's way. Haru liked to play a peekaboo game using his flames. He'd summon his weak candle-sized flame in the palm of his hand, then close his fist, 
only to summon the flame back on his index finger, returning it to the fist and then using another finger to summon the fire on. Toya always enjoyed it, and it's what made him laugh for the first time when he was three months old. Hara had almost set the carpet on fire when Toya let out his first delighted giggle, quickly calling the mother and father in to show them their son's brand new skill of laughter. And at five months old, his quirk manifested. Angie was entertaining him with his own hell flame, making the fire dance a little in between his fingers as Ray prepared dinner. Toy was giggling and smiling as he was cradled on his father's free arm, staring up and reaching at the flame-covered hand that was glowing warmly above him like a hanging toy. After one particularly loud and happy laugh, Toya's small right hand was engulfed in his own glowing fire, mimicking his father's hand movements. Engie froze and stared wide-eyed at his baby boy, the latter also staring but at his own newly fire-engulfed hand before breaking out into a fit of delighted gurgles, starting to wave it around. Engie quickly snuffed out his flames to take a gentle hold of Toya's fire-covered fist, grateful they had decided to dress him in a t-shirt today. Ray! Engie exclaimed in belly-content excitement. Ray, look! He showed off their son's small, fiery fist as his wife turned away from the cooking she was doing. A surprised smile appeared on her face, and she quickly wiped her hands on her apron, rushing towards her son and husband. Guess your hair theory was right, Engie said with a warm smile, Toya looking between his parents' happy expressions without a clue of why, but mirroring their smiles. If anything, he was clearly excited about his own new trick. Look at you, a little firecracker! Ray giggled at her son's excited expression, still trying to wave his flaming fist around despite it being in Engie's hold. Avoiding being set on fire by her son, she gave him a quick peck on the cheek, gaining a happy gurgle from him. As he did that, his little fire went out, as if distracted by his mother's love, and he reached for her. Delighted in being wanted by her son and taking him in her arms, Toya snuggled and gets her naturally cooler body temperature. Chapter 17 Luster February, a month after Toya's birth. I want another baby. Angie stared at Ray. Can I take my shoes off first? He had just gotten home from an intense work day at the agency, and Ray's out of the blue demand had caught him off guard. Any reason you're bringing this up today? I was thinking, Ray started, giving Toya to his father as he started fussing, reaching out to Angie with little noises of complaint. If we have siblings close in age, they could encourage each other. Engie blinked, not really getting it. He took Toy in his arms, who busied himself squishing his face into his warmth. An unconvinced expression was on Engie's face. Are you sure? So soon after Toya? He asked hesitantly. Something shifted in Ray's expression. What's the other reason? Ray looked away before sighing. I called my mother, she admitted, fiddling with the sleeves of her shirt. And she asked for us to visit soon with Toya. It reminded me of how lonely home was, since I was homeschooled and had no friends. I want Toya to at least have someone close in age to him at home. A fond smile appeared on her face as Toya gurgled happily in Engie's arms. Engie could understand that. He didn't have any siblings or friends growing up either, and while he'd never admit it, he felt he had been denied some normalcy of childhood. He was happy with just Toya for now, but Ray's want for him to have company his age struck an old, forgotten chord with him. If that's what you want, all right, Angie said, gaining a grin from his wife. If Ray wanted another baby, then he'd be happy with that too. He brought Toya up to his face to address him properly. How do you feel about being a big brother, Candlelight? He got a bap on the nose from his newborn son. Current day, six months later. If Toya had been an unplanned but very much wanted pregnancy, Ray's second pregnancy was extremely planned. Maybe overplanned. Engie soon learned of the term baby fever. By August of the same year, Ray was already six months pregnant. Thankfully, this time round, she didn't have to do all the shopping that she did when pregnant with Toya, and she spent her time at home with Toya. Being pregnant with an infant was its own set of unexpected challenges, but Ray took them in stride. Not to mention, she had Harrow, who was all too happy at the notion of more grandchildren, and Angie to support her at every turn. Angie was especially supportive and present when Rhea made the daunting decision to finally visit her parents, the first time she'd be seeing them since the wedding. No matter if she wanted to see them or not, they were still Toya's grandparents, and she felt she owed Toya a relationship with them. Harrow tried to reassure her that she owed nobody such a thing, but Ray still wanted to make one single effort. To minimise the potential stress, they wouldn't be staying at her parents' house, Angie booking a hotel instead, 
and if she ever had enough, they could use Toya and her pregnancy to leave. Suffice to say, Ray did not have fun. She wanted to leave the second she stepped foot in her childhood home. Now that she was out of her family's customs and had spread her wings in the Todoroki household, it became all the clearer how stifling her upbringing had been. While she felt no ill will against her parents, it was awkward. She realised she had come to visit them out of familial obligation, not because she genuinely wanted to see them. Seven-month-old Toya seemed to be as equally unimpressed, and Enji was counting the seconds before they could leave politely. Ray's father was talking their ears off about something or the other, and the only person who seemed to be generally having a good time was Ray's mother, who was busy fussing over her grandson. It seems he inherited your quirk, Todoroki, she said with a small smile as Toya became mesmerised by his own small flames he kept summoning and snuffing out accidentally. Have you had any trouble with it? We keep a close eye on him, Enji replied. We're happy to be talking about his son rather than what his father-in-law was wanted to discuss. Thankfully, nothing has been set on fire yet. Though, with Ray's ice quirk and my heat resistance, we'll be able to deal with it quickly if it did. He glanced at Ray, who was completely dissociating, staring blankly in her son's general direction. He could easily become a pro hero like you, Endeavor, Ray's father brought up, and suddenly Ray bristled. Angie blinked. He hadn't thought about that at all, but the Himura man was right. Toy's quirk was already further along than Angie's was when he was a baby, according to Haro. If you wanted to, there's no reason Toya couldn't become a pro hero, Enji said politely. But only if he wants to. Being a pro hero is a big commitment, and I'd want it to be for the right reasons, not just for the sake of it. With all the time he'd spent with All Might, he had come to understand how narrow-minded he had been with his pursuit of power and results, having forgotten the reason he chose his career path in the first place due to his growing obsession and insecurities. But with Haro, Ray, and Toshino in his life, and now Toya, they had brought him back to his roots and screwed his head on right. Ray's father didn't see it that way. Surely you'll want somebody to inherit your agency. Something as successful as that shouldn't go to waste. Ray stood up abruptly, cutting off her father before he could say anything else. Toya is tired. We're leaving, she said sharply, reaching out for her son in her mother's arms. The older woman said nothing, just looked a little sad as she gave her grandson back to her daughter. Ray said nothing more as she left. Her mother gave her husband a frustrated look. You don't know when to stop, do you? In turn, she stood up as well and went after Ray. Enji, having no desire to be left alone with his father-in-law, and much preferring to comfort his wife, stood, gave a small polite bow, and hurried away. Ray's father, left behind, sat in confusion, not realising what he had done. Ray, I'm sorry, I asked him to dial it back, Ray's mother said meekly, looking upset as Ray juggled between putting her shoes on and holding Toya, the latter completely unaware of the situation happening as he smiled at his father arriving. It's fine, I know what he's like. Ray said dismissively as she put on her second shoe and picked up her bag. You were like that too when I was younger. Have a good evening. She left. Ray's mother looked like she could cry. Enji didn't know what to do. He went to put on his own shoes to follow Ray. We're going to the flower park tomorrow morning, he said quietly before looking at his mother-in-law, who had a confused, teary expression. It was good to see you again. He in turn left, finding Ray waiting for him outside of a childhood home's compound. Ray? Can we go to our hotel? She said without looking at him, hugging Toya tightly as if he was her only comfort in the world. Please? Of course. The rest of the evening was tense, Ray refusing to look or speak to him. And she knew she wasn't mad at him, he hadn't done anything wrong, but he was confused and upset because he didn't know what to do to comfort her. He took charge of looking after Toya for that evening, letting Ray settle into the hotel room. Once Toya was sleeping in his travel cot, Ray finally broke the silence. I thought I could handle it better. Just smile through it, the pregnant woman admitted, voice thick with emotion. Angie sat down beside her on the bed and she leaned against him. But he stresses me out. I think Dad would agree with you on that. Hara had been less than pleased when Ray had brought up her plans to visit her parents especially since he couldn't come with them to Iwata since he had teacher duties to attend to. You tried. It didn't work out. We don't have to do this again. Ray sighed. The worst part is he doesn't even realise how he's affecting others. I generally don't believe he's malicious, just... I don't know. Dense. She lamented softly, pressing her cheek against her husband's shoulder. It'd be easier if he was a straight-up jerk, like the villains you fight. 
Even then, there's nuance. Engie sighed in turn, remembering the many times the villain turned out to have a tragic past of some sort. Not that it justified anything, they were still villains. Ray sighed again. Let's sleep. We'll get up and have breakfast at the park. Does that sound good? Ray pouted and looked up at Engie. It does. Breakfast at the flower park was great. Toy was slowly learning to eat solid foods and had very much enjoyed his banana puree. At least a third of it had been eaten. He then had the best time ever being held in his father's arms as the latter crouched in front of various flower beds and as his mother told him all about them. Ray was unable to crouch comfortably due to her pregnant belly. While Toy couldn't understand, he liked listening to his mother's voice, and whenever she was done explaining a flower, he seemed delighted and motioned to another flower bed, and the process would repeat. Seeing her little red-headed son giggle and laugh soothed what unhappy feeling Ray still had lingering from the day before, and she littered his little round faces in kisses, which only made him burst into more fits of giggles. Angie was content being witness to all of this, and being Toy's favourite sitting spot. Toy had been asking for Ray to hold him a lot more as he grew up, but Engie was still his favourite person to be held by. It made Ray still feel a little down sometimes, but Engie reassured her it's only because Toy liked being perched up high and seeing everything. Being over six foot tall had its advantages. Ray. A soft, shy voice greeted meekly, which made Ray stiffen. Looking at the source, she saw her mother. Todoroki. Mrs. Himura. Enji replied, standing from his crouching position with Toyasin in his arms. The latter looked most displeased at being separated from the flowers, and made that fact known as he whined. Mother, what are you doing here? Ray was confused. Her mother never came to the flower park. Then it clicked, and she looked accusingly at Enji. I said we were coming here today, that's all. Her husband replied matter-of-factly, crouching back down due to Toya starting to fuss. The baby immediately stopped when he was face to face with the flowers again. Ray, can we talk? Please. Then I'll be on my way. Ray's mother asked, which gained her a suspicious look from her daughter. Ray relented, and she went to sit on a bench a little way off from Toya and Engie. I'm sorry about yesterday. I told your father what he did wrong, but he doesn't understand. Her mother admitted as she sat beside her. I know you don't want to visit us. I did my duty that you and father expected of me. Why would you want me to visit? Ray asked, not sounding bitter, but her voice was very quiet, as if almost embarrassed to express what she really thought about her situation. It's not like she ever got a say when she was a child. Angie was her first independent choice. Her mother said nothing. I know why it happened. I understand my circumstance was similar to yours and father's. I get why things were the way they were. But what with the Himura pass and all? But I'm out of that. Why would I want to return? The older woman looked at Enji. He was talking to Toya and motioning to the flowers, the small boy looking enthralled at whatever was going on. I guess you wouldn't, she admitted sadly. After a moment, she took in a deep breath and fully looked at her daughter. You're right. You shouldn't. It won't bring you anything to come back. You don't owe us anything, and with the way your father is, maybe it's best. Ray finally returned to her mother's look, surprised at her words. I did a lot of thinking since you got married, and I'm sorry. Your father and I were so set in our ways and customs, we forgot to do what was right for you. If Angie hadn't come along to marry Ray, and if nobody else had filled in the arranged marriage proposal, Ray would have been sent to a distant relative to get married. As was the Himura way. After having met Taro and seeing what type of father he was, and now that she saw how happy her daughter was of Enji and their baby, with another along the way, Ray's mother realised just how unfair her and her husband had been to Ray. Her husband would never see it that way. He was too old and stubborn. But if maybe she could admit they did wrong, then maybe Ray wouldn't feel like she had to fulfil some family obligations and could live her life completely freely. Like she said, she had already done her Himura duty. Ray said nothing to her mother's apology, just stared in surprise, and then smiled. Thank you, she said softly, watching her mother's older face soften as well. There was no bitterness in her daughter's expression. The two women looked so much alike. I could call more, give updates, send photos. I'd like that. Ray left Iwate with a huge weight lifted off of her shoulders. While she'd never have the parent-daughter relationship every child wishes for, she could at least be on good terms with her mother as a fellow adult. 
As Ray's due date approached, Toya sensed that the change was happening in the home, especially with his mother. And while before he'd been clingy to Engie, now he clung onto Ray continuously. Despite it making doing things around the house more difficult, especially at nearly eight months pregnant, Ray wasn't complaining about Toya wanting to spend more time with her. Are you hoping for a girl this time? Mrs. Eda asked on the phone. Ray was sitting on her living room couch with Toya plastered against her stomach. Her pregnancy was obvious now and it confused Toya greatly. She ran caressing fingers through his thick red hair. I am hoping for a less stressful birth, Ray said with a small laugh, looking down at Toya. He had no idea the scare he gave his parents when he decided to be born at his own schedule. I am happy with either a girl or another boy. Speaking of, how is your tensei? Oh, he's doing great, the fellow mom said cheerfully. He's entering his third year of elementary school and he's already thinking of becoming a pro hero. He's been asking us to get a start on training, but we think it's best to wait until he becomes a teenager. Huh, really? Ray said thoughtfully, not taking her eyes off of Toya. Seeing how Toya loves his father, I don't doubt he'll be asking the same eventually. The pro hero on the other end giggled. That's for sure. When did Todoroki start training? When he was 13, with his father. My father-in-law and Enji want to teach Toya to control his flames as early as possible, what with him having a fire quirk, but I wouldn't say that counts as training. More taking a precaution. Enji says Toya's quirk is stronger than when he was a child. Hearing that gives some credibility to the quirk singularity theory, doesn't it? The hero inside. Ray blinked. The what theory? Haven't you heard about it? It's the theory that every generation, quirks blend and evolve, becoming stronger and more complex, and thus difficult to control. I think it's right to teach your son early on how to control his quirk and not overuse it. Ray had never heard of that theory before. She asked Enji later on that night about it. It's an old thesis from over 70 years ago, her husband replied as he rubbed a towel over his hair. He had just gotten out of the shower. It was discarded at the time, but it started to gain some notoriety recently. Are you worried about it? Not really, I was just curious. Ray replied from where she was dressing Toya into his nightclothes, the baby already halfway to sleep. I guess... maybe a little? What of our quirk combinations? Angie blinked. What do you mean? If one of our child gets both an ice and fire quirk, wouldn't that make them insanely powerful? Ray brought up. Now that you mention it, having both an ice and fire quirk would balance out any frostbite or overheating issues. Angie sounded almost shocked. He never thought about that. Something with that sort of natural power would completely overtake him with the correct discipline and training. Could probably even overtake All Might. Something in his gut twisted and Angie let out a sharp exhale, closing his eyes. None of that. All Might is Toshinori and Toshinori is his friend. Being a pro hero isn't a competition. Even if the hero commission seemed to want to make it that way. Angie? Ray's voice cut through his thoughts. Hmm? Angie blinked, looking at her. She had a concerned look on her face. Oh, I... you're right. An ice and fire quirk would be insanely powerful. But we don't have a child like that at the moment. Let's not worry about the what-ifs. Ray's concerned expression smoothened, and she looked at her sleepy infant son. I'll put him to bed, Angie said, leaning down to pick up his red-headed boy. As he set Toya down in his own bed in the room next to theirs, Angie brushed his hand gently over his son's face and through his hair watching his little one's peaceful sleeping expression. He felt such genuine pride for his son that he'd never find the words to express it. He leaned down and gave Toya the most careful kiss on the forehead. See you in the morning, Candlelight. Chapter 18. Sheen. Fuyumi Todoroki was born on the 6th of December, with white, red-flecked hair and healthy round cheeks. Her quirk manifested on the same day she was born, when she created a thin layer of ice on her mother's collarbone as she was held against her chest. Ray was delighted at having a daughter of an ice quirk. Unlike with Toya, they were able to bring her home the same evening Fuyumi was born. After her first pregnancy, Ray had no desire to linger in a hospital bed any longer than she had to. Hara had spent the day with Toya, waiting for them at home. Toya wasn't as clingy of Haru as he was to Enji, but it was clear he loved being with him, especially when Haru entertained him with his candlelight quirk. Those flames completely caught his attention. He'd stare at them with wide-eyed wonder. Much like how he was staring at his newborn sister, 
Fuyumi slept soundly in a futon as Enji watched over her, Rei taking a much needed rest while Haro prepared some food. Toya, on his hands and knees, stared at the small human before he started crawling and reaching towards her. While he trusted his son to not hurt his new baby girl, Enji still blocked his child's path with his much larger hand. She's sleeping, he said without looking at his eldest, as if that would mean anything to Toya. Pushing himself off of the floor onto his two unsteady feet, Toya took a couple of steps towards his father and grabbed onto his arm as he stumbled a little, hugging it tight. This made Enji look down at him and smile. You're growing up too fast. Soon you'll be walking all on your own. His infant grinned back at him. Enji lifted his arm up slightly, which made Toya dangle off of the ground by just an inch. He giggled as he was placed on his father's thigh, snuggling up to the large man as he tried to reach up to his stubble chin. A soft knock on the doorframe was heard, and Toshinori's head peered around the corner. Hello, he greeted with a wave, before shushing when Enji placed a finger against his own lips. His baby was sleeping, and she had made a little squeak at being disturbed. Sorry, sorry. Ray texted me to come visit. I hope that's okay. At Enji's silent nod, Toshinori entered the room and looked down at Fuyumi. She's adorable, he said in hushed excitement, grinning. Enji smiled in agreement. His daughter is adorable. Suddenly, Toya wasn't a small baby anymore, and they were celebrating his first birthday, a month after Fuyumi's birth, at the Endeavor Agency. Because Endeavor's sidekicks had begged to finally meet their boss's babies, Rei and Haro liked the idea. Enji, not so much. But being the only one who had concerns, he relented. Thus, here he was, in civilian clothing, watching his one-year-old son be spoiled and fawned over by his staff as he cradled his sleeping baby girl. Toya loved every second of it. And you were so worried, Ray giggled, gaining a huff from her tall husband. I'm not worried because of the heroes. I'm worried about Toya and Fuyumi being in the public eye, Enji admitted lowly, not wanting to sour the atmosphere as Toya showed off his small baby flames to the sidekicks. You're their father. That's going to happen whether we like it or not, Ray reminded him, feeling like they'd done this before when they first started dating. Plus, the people in Musuta are respectful. You haven't had any bad fan interactions since those schoolgirls. Enji grunted at that. True. He also hadn't been making much effort to have fan interactions. If All Might wasn't there, he didn't have much desire to have meet and greets. He was hard to get, that was his brand, and what his core fan base liked, apparently. That was just fan by him. That evening, Toshinori stopped by with a gift for Toya just before the red-headed boy was off to bed. An Endeavor plush toy. Really? Enji asked, aggravated. Toya likes it. Toshinori snickered as Toya immediately latched onto the toy that was almost half his size, squeezing it tightly with a wide grin. All might raise an eyebrow at Endeavor. His appearance was noticeably different due to the addition of flames around his shoulders and jaw, the latter making it look like he had a moustache and beard made out of fire. Are you trying out a new look? All Might asked, his long hair tuft swipping in the wind. The two men were standing on the roof of the Endeavour Agency, awaiting an update from the police about some mission. Mm. PR suggested trying something different, Endeavour shrugged a little. They're designing a new suit as well, but that's not going to be for some time. At All Might's continued stare, Endeavour exhaled heavily. And I want to be more intimidating. Make sure villains don't get any funny ideas about messing with my family. All Might grinned wider and slapped Endeavor on the back. Despite it being weak, the number one's friendly gesture made the redhead splutter and stumble forward a little. That's adorable! The blonde laughed loudly. Don't you dare tell anyone, Endeavor glowed for his full face of flames. If All Might wasn't friends with him, he'd definitely be intimidated and maybe even a little scared. The flames really added to his already domineering stature. Of course not, All Might smiled reassuringly. But really, the protective dad act is cute on you. Don't say gross things, Endeavor rolled his eyes. I mean it! That makes it worse. Fuyumi is very different to Toya. While the eldest son laughed, giggled, and expressed his feelings very loudly, Fuyumi was quiet and observant, only making a noise if she was hungry. While Toya was ready to fight the day and threw toys across the living room with gusto, Fuyumi preferred smoothing out her dolls' clothes and running her fingers through her mother's hair. This made Rei decide to let her hair grow out longer, so Fuyumi had more to fiddle with. Toya hated taking baths and would splash water everywhere. 
Fuyumi loved being pampered and playing with the bubbles. Fuyumi also met her milestones earlier than Toya, seeing her first words and taking her first steps a couple months before her older brother had. While Toya often spoke in nonsense sentences and rambled on for hours, Fuyumi said little but what she said was easily understandable. While Toya hated fish, much of the praises from Haro, Fuyumi loved her mother's homemade fish cakes. They were very different. Hot and cold. Their little firecracker and ice cube. Two things, however, they had in common. They loved being in the garden with their mother and helping with the flowers, playing in the dirt, and they loved their father. Fuyumi was a daddy's girl through and through, and Enji completely indulged her. She quickly learned that her daddy woke up earlier than everybody else, so as soon as she was able to crawl, she would wake up at the sound of Enji moving around the house and call out to him, Papa, Papa, relentlessly until he gave her a morning hug. It became his new morning routine to have breakfast with Fuyumi in his arms. Enji didn't mind at all. Every family member had a specific thing only they were allowed to do for Fuyumi, as if she was trying to include all of her loved ones in her daily routine as to make them feel important. Only Enji was allowed to hug her in the morning, only Ray was allowed to make her an afternoon snack, only Haro was allowed to brush her hair, and only Toya was allowed to play with her and her dolls. When Uncle Toshinori visited, his unique duty was letting Fuyumi braid his hair tufts, something he did not mind at all after a month of Toya pulling on them as if his life depended on it. Toya, while he played nice with Fuyumi and often hugged her as she became an infant, had bouts of jealousy in the first few months. He didn't understand why his family, who had given him their full and uninterrupted attention his entire life thus far, suddenly had to stop playing with him because his sister needed to be changed or fed. He especially didn't like it when he had to share his father, Fumi in one arm and Toya in the other. But as the weeks went by, Toya adapted to the new rhythm, especially since Enji always included him whenever he started pouting in displeasure. Toya, do you want to sit on my shoulders while I cook? Fuyumi is with mum. Do you want to play outside with me and grandpa? Let Fuyumi have a turn with dad. Why don't you go show mum your drawing? Ray watched in amusement as Enji had very serious negotiations with his toddler son about his share of his father's attention. Fuyumi seemed perfectly happy with sharing her father with her brother, often reaching out to hug the fiery redhead when he made a fuss about something and smiling when he complained that Fuyumi wanted to hold his hand. He never made the effort to pull away from his sister's kindness, though. Enji continued to make the active effort of having the weekends off to spend time with his family, as per the Ida's advice. They often went into town together or to the park, sometimes even Sakoto Peak when the sky was clear. They'd hike up, have a picnic and enjoy the view. Not on rainy days though, as the mountainside could get slippery. On such a day as this, the family of five were on a walk at the park. Despite the rain, they were all having a fun time, dressed in waterproof jackets and boots. With Fuyumi starting to waddle more confidently, she made the attempt to keep up with her galloping brother as he dashed around his family, giggling madly at being in the rain. A particularly large puddle was up ahead, and Toya made the amazing decision to jump into it, the water reaching his ankles and splashing up to the hem of his coat. Letting out a high-pitched laugh, he jumped again, making more of a mess. His parents and grandfather didn't care. They'd just deal with the fight to bathe him later on. Fuyumi, however, looked distressed, not quite understanding what her brother was doing, and how. You want to jump in the puddle too, Fuyumi? Hara asked with a soft smile, leaning over his little granddaughter. She looked up at him with big, clueless eyes and nodded. Clearly, she wasn't sure what she was agreeing to, but seeing Toya have fun made her want to try too. All right, take my hands. Holding both of Fuyumi's hands in his own, Hara lifted her slightly and placed her in the puddle. Being smaller than her big brother, the water reached halfway up her boots and for a moment, she looked a little panic at the notion of getting wet. But looking up at her smiling parents and in the safety of her grandfather's hold, she gained the confidence to make an experimental splash of her right foot. The ripple effect of the water alongside the drip drops of rain made for an exciting new view, and the girl tried again, and again, until she was splashing with both feet happily, still held up by her grandfather. At seeing his sister join in the fun, Toya laughed and continued splashing. Kuramada had a lot to say on the drive back, what with them all being wet and the children's boots being thick with mud and making a mess of the back seats, but nothing malicious. Ray and Hara had to hold in their laughter at the chauffeur's mannerisms, and Fumi just smiled at the moustached man. 
Things were fun and peaceful. Ray and Angie enjoyed every day of living with their kids. Angie found being Endeavour much easier with the knowledge he had his family to look forward to every evening. Despite this, and loving his grandchildren, Harrow couldn't help but worry. As Toya grew, his fire became more powerful, burning bright and mighty every time he accidentally, or purposely, manifested it. While nothing had caught on fire yet, Harrow couldn't help but feel anxious that something, or somebody, would get burned soon. Most of all, he worried about Toya accidentally injuring himself while in his fiery excitement that he is prone to. A lovely quality, but not a good match of hot flames. He's too young to understand what he's doing, Hara sighed as he cradled the sleeping Fuyumi against his shoulder. She was taking a nap. But I worry if we don't start teaching him soon that something bad will happen. Ray listened to her father-in-law as she took a sip of her tea, eyeing her eldest as he drew ferociously on paper with a red crayon his Endeavour plush sitting up beside him. She didn't want to repeat up his bedroom wall. There are still remnants of light blue crayon that refuse to come out no matter how much she scrubbed. Was Angie like that when he was a toddler? Ray asked, never taking her eyes off Toya. He was a lot more like Fuyumi, actually. Quiet and observant, Harry replied, before laughing. Stubborn like a mule, though. You wouldn't believe a toddler could hold such strong opinions on grapes. But boy, Angie made sure I knew he wasn't impressed with me offering him grapes. He'd been pelted quite a few times in the face with them before he gave up. Angie ate his grapes these days. For Yumi's character, but with Toya's stubbornness. What a deadly combination. Ray laughed lightly. According to her mother, Ray was a meek and shy baby, unless if it came to making a mess. Little baby Ray loved playing in the garden and getting covered in mud. Angie and I have talked about it, but we think it's still too early to teach Toya. Though, with how much he loves Angie and his Endeavour toy, I'm sure he'll be wanting to learn how to use his fire soon. Ray was completely correct. A couple of months before Toya's third birthday, Toya and his sister were watching the television with their grandfather, who was grading his students' performances in their sports class. The news was playing on the screen, and where the live footage of Endeavour dealing with the villain in the main street was happening. Daddy! Toya called out loudly, pointing at the screen excitedly, squeezing his Endeavour plush that was seated between his legs. Fuyumi had a small frown, not recognising her father due to his hero get-up and flames around his jaw. A close-up of Endeavour's fiery, scowling face appeared, and her eyes widened in recognition. Toya was bouncing up and down in his seated position on the floor, leaning forward as he watched, fascinated. As the villain attacked their father, Fuyumi let out a squeak of panic before bright red and orange flames flashed across the shot, making the villain drop to the floor like a singed rock. Toya giggled in delight at his father's fire, a small flickering flame momentarily dancing across his cheek before disappearing. Haro noticed this and scowled, worry fluttering in his gut at Toya not even noticing he had done that. Looking back at the screen, Endeavour had the villain in cuffs and was giving him over to the police. The news reporter repraising the number two hero for his quick response to the villain causing chaos with no collateral damage or injured civilians. The older Taroki sighed deeply. It didn't matter how impressive Endeavour was. That was still his baby boy, and he couldn't help but worry every time he saw him in a fight. Is Papa okay? Fumi asked as she nudged her grandfather's elbow, looking deeply worried as she watched the television screen. Harris smiled at his granddaughter and placed a hand on her head. Your daddy is fine, see? He said, pointing to the screen where Endeavour stood tall and proud with his arms across his chest. Fuyumi's worried scowl didn't go away. Why angry? She pushed, not liking the unfamiliar expression on her father's face. Angie's face was much softer around his kids, if a little serious. His small smiles were common and his deep scowls rare, not to mention he never wore his flames around his face and shoulders when at home. This was the first time Fumi saw her father like this. He's not angry, don't worry. He's just doing his job. Harrow reassured the little girl. She made a nod at that, but the frown didn't go away. Ray entered the room at this point. Mama, daddy fought a bad guy! Toy expressed loudly as he pushed himself into a standing position which sent his Endeavour toy flying in his rapid movement and ran to his mother, hugging her leg as she rested her hand in his hair. He used his fire! Did he? Ray said in pretend surprise, entertaining her son's clear excitement at seeing his hero father on screen. Was it cool to watch? Super cool! Toya grinned up at her, his happiness making Ray laugh. You can tell dad how cool he is when he comes home. 
Okay. Ray sat down at the table across Harrow, Toya settling back in his original spot as he'd continued to watch the television after collecting his toy that had flown across the room, the news report continued to talk about Endeavour and his ratings. Toya understood none of it, but his excitement showed every time his father appeared on screen, squishing his toy. Ray turned to look at Fuyumi with a smile, but it dropped when she saw her almost two-year-old daughter scowling a thoughtful expression. Ice Cube, what's wrong? The mother asked softly. Fiumi looked at her with big round eyes. Despite the scowl, she looked adorable. Daddy looks scary, she admitted silently after a moment, crossing her arms on the table and hiding her face in them. Fiumi didn't like it. Oh. Ray's voice drifted off, not knowing how to react. That's okay, Fiumi. You can tell him that too. Fiumi peeked up at her mother from behind her arms. Dad doesn't want to scare you, so if he did, you can tell him. With her mother's reassurance that her father wasn't purposely trying to scare Fuyumi, the little girl smiled and nodded, returning to the drawing she had been doing before. Ray smiled and looked at Haro, before that smile dropped too. And what's wrong with you? Hmm? Oh, I saw a flame on Toya's cheek when Enji was fighting the villain. He didn't even notice, Haro said, running a hand through his hair. I really think you and Enji should consider teaching him to control his quirk. I'm getting worried. Ray sighed and nodded. Unfortunately, she believed Tara might be right. When Enji came home that evening, it was with fanfares from Toya, who rambled on about how cool he looked on the TV, Enji listening with grunts and smiles as he untied his shoes. Being nearly three years old, Toya was speaking in fuller sentences and was more coherent, but it still took some deciphering to understand what he was saying. I have fire, can I do that? Toya asked suddenly among his rambles. Do what? Enji asked as he shrugged off his coat. Shoot fire, like you! His red-headed son exclaimed, manifesting a large flame that engulfed his left hand. Can I be strong like you? The sound of a fire roaring to life had gotten Haro's attention, and he stepped out of the hallway with Fuyumi in his arms. The little girl looked distressed at the large flames. Enji's eyes had widened and his mouth fell open when he saw the powerful flame his two-year-old son had summoned, but upon his seeing his daughter's unhappy expression, he reached to hold the flaming hand. At his father's touch, Toya snuffed them out, but he bounced in excitement. Easily. Your fire is stronger than mine when I was your age. Enji replied with a smile, gaining bright, sparkly eyes from his son. But that means you shouldn't play with it. Your grandfather and I know how to control our quirks, but you don't yet. Enji remembered what his father had told him when they first started training. One small flame can cause a house fire. Toya stopped bouncing and his expression fell for a moment, before his energy returned twice as strong. Grandpa's a teacher! He can teach me! Toya argued, looking to his grandfather who had the same concerned expression as Fuyumi. Enji looked at his father, and the two Todoroki men made eye contact. It seemed Toya had made the decision for them. I can teach you, Enji said, letting go of his son's hand. This made Toya whip around to grin his father brightly, his foot tapping the ground in unbridled energy. The idea of his father teaching him how to use his quirk excited him beyond belief. Behind him, Fuyumi motioned to be put on the ground by Haro, who did as he was silently asked. Shyly, and fiddling with her dress sleeves, she walked up to her father. Papa, she said quietly, avoiding looking at him, embarrassed. What is it, Ice Cube? Enji asked his daughter softly, getting a pout from Toya at them not speaking further about his training. Fuyumi was also pouting, but it was in shyness. Papa's scary, she admitted, like it was a great shame. Toya shot her a confused frown, as if she was talking nonsense. Enji's eyebrows knit together in a slightly pained look. He knew his face was harsh when he concentrated on his hero work. It was both intentional and not, but he used it to intimidate the villains. Scaring kids, his kids, was not the point. I'm sorry, Fuyumi, Enji said after a moment, reaching out to his daughter. At her father's open arms, Fuyumi wasted no time in rushing in for a hug, blotting herself against his white chest she found so comforting. I didn't mean to scare you, only the villains. But you weren't scary, Toya exclaimed in disagreement. Fuyumi's being silly. Toya, if Fuyumi got scared, that's okay. Enji smiled to his son, ruffling his hair as he picked Fuyumi up in a one-arm hug. Toya's pout dissipated as his hair became a mess, giggling. Are you hungry? Should we go check our mum? He addressed his young daughter, who smiled sweetly and nodded, feeling better now that she knew her daddy wasn't scary at home. Haro felt himself smile too. Fiumi and he were on the same wavelengths for most things. After entering the kitchen and giving his wife a kiss on the cheek, getting one on the jaw in return, 
Enji returned his attention to Fuyumi. What did you find scary? He asked his little daughter. At the kitchen table, Harris settled with a bunch of papers for school he had to go through. Fire. Here. Fuyumi attempted to express, patting the air of his jaw her mother had just kissed. The flaming beard was what had scared her. It hid away too much of her father's face that she loved. Meanwhile, Toy had propped himself up on one of the kitchen chairs beside Haro and plopped his Endeavor toy on the table. This toy was a model from before the flame beard and only had fabric flames stitched around the eyes. You don't like the fire beard? Enji asked further as he carefully distanced Fumi from his face, summoning a smaller version of his current Endeavor get-up. At the sight of this, Fumi's shoulders hunched and she nodded, her big blue eyes widening in slight fear. But it's cool! Toya lamented from his spot beside his grandfather. Hara and Ray looked at each other. They thought the fire beard was unnecessary. But Yumi's a scaredy cat! Candlelight, Enji said reproachfully, not wanting his son to insult his sister. That made Toya pout, crossing his arms on the table around his toy. Is this better? He asked Fuyumi as he took away the flames around his jaw, leaving only the ones around his eyes. His original look. His daughter's unsure expression disappeared and she smiled, tilting her head curiously. These flames made it look like he was wearing a masquerade mask, still mysterious in a way, but not nearly as intimidating. She looked at her brother's Endeavor plush, and its flames matched her father's. Yes, she replied confidently, as if making a grand decision. Angie nodded solemnly, matching the seriousness in his daughter's voice. He'd have to tell PR about reverting to just fire around his eyes. And changing costume will have to do. At this exchange, Toya rolled his eyes and looked at his grandfather's work. What's that? he questioned. Schoolwork. I'm making notes for my next class, Hara explained, showing his grandson what he was writing. Boring. Toya stuck his tongue out, finding no enjoyment in that. Hara looked back at Ray with a smile when he heard a stifled giggle. The woman trying to hold in her amusement as she worked on pouring the miso soup into separate bowls. Chapter 19. Flame. Toya looked forward to every evening when his father came home. Not only because he loved Enji being home, but also because it meant he got to train with him. Toya called it training, but it was just Enji teaching Toya how to manifest and snuff out flames with little to no physical effort, usually sitting. Just like how Harrow had when he was 13, now he taught his overexcited toddler son to control his much more powerful flames. Initially, Ray and Harrow were concerned even though they knew this was necessary, but Toya didn't give them time to worry. He enjoyed every second of it, loving to have something that was for him and his father alone to do, with some input from Harrow. These short training sessions were when he got his father's undivided attention and he thrived off of it, which only encouraged him to succeed every time his father gave him an instruction. Enji was having fun too. Toya was a fast learner, and the more competent he became with his quirk, the more controlled and precise the flames were. It made him proud reminding him of how his relationship with his own father strengthened through training. Exercise was a bonding activity for him, and it was becoming one for Toya too. They started off small, with Enji getting Toya to summon the weakest flame he could, then summoning one smaller than that, then smaller and smaller, until Toya could easily summon nothing but a small candle-sized flame in the palm of his hand, like Harrow's. He'd been very excited to show it off to his grandfather, the latter praising him with bright smiles and kind eyes. Then they did the opposite. Enji instructed Toya to manifest the fire he found easiest to create. The fire engulfed the entirety of the red-headed boy's fist. Then Enji gave him five seconds to completely put it out. That's where Toya struggled, and what they spent the longest time practicing on. Due to how powerful Toya's flames were for his age, he found it difficult to make them disappear immediately. After a couple weeks, he managed to get rid of his default fire by five seconds. A month later, it only took him a couple seconds. And by the middle of summer, he could snuff out his flame almost instantly. On that day, Toy was praised for his achievement and was treated to an outing at the mochi store with his family. Toy got to try a variety of mochi for the first time. He liked the red bean flavor the most. Fuyumi stocked to ice cream. Ray often watched her boys' training sessions, both to make sure they weren't doing too much and also because she enjoyed seeing her husband and eldest happy. From her time dating Enji, she understood how much training meant to him, and she saw that same enjoyment in Toya. One day she was doing just that, 
dressed in a long shirt, as she watched Enji in his black tank top and slacks, timing Toya to snuff out a larger flame than usual. Her attention was caught by her little Fuyumi as she appeared in her peripheral vision, and looking down at her daughter, the three-year-old offered her a dandelion from the garden with a cute smile. Ray smiled back and leaned down to pick her up, cradling the two little hands that carefully held the yellow flower. How pretty, thank you Fuyumi, she said, giving her daughter a kiss on the cheek which made her giggle. Haro appeared around the corner, having been the one looking after his granddaughter as she played outside. It was early evening, and almost a toddler's bedtime. I did it! Toya exclaimed loudly, raising his hands in victory at having succeeded in his task. Did you see? I saw, Enji reassured, crouching in front of him and ruffling his thick red hair. Good job, Candlelight. The praise made Toya's grin widen even more, if that was possible, before he realised his mother, sister, and grandfather were watching too. Look, look, look! He ran up to them, using his quirk to summon the strongest flame he currently could, which that in itself was impressive for a four-year-old, and almost instantly making it disappear. I'm better! Hey, look at you go, Firecracker! Haro grinned, giving a small clap for his grandson's achievements. Well done, sweetie. Ray followed up, her son bouncing up and down at the comments. Fuyumi gave a small pout and leaned against her mother's chest, still holding onto the flower. It's okay, Ice Cube. Daddy's helping Toya with controlling his fire. It's a good thing. Fuyumi still wasn't fond of Enji and Toya's flames. She was little and preferred the cold. The family was sure she'd get used to it once she was older. Can we do more? Toya spun round to talk to his father. Not tonight. You need to go to bed and I have work in the morning. Enji shook his head, knowing that would be the start of many arguments until Toya went to sleep. The eldest knew what he wanted, when he wanted, and he didn't stop until he was completely burnt out. Even Toshinori was weak in comparison to Toya's energy. Oh, what? The toddler lamented, a scowl and pout settling in. I don't wanna! I'm not tired! You will be in the morning, and then you won't have any energy to train tomorrow. Enji argued as he picked up his firecracker child. That was untrue. Toya would have energy no matter how many hours he didn't sleep. The child pouted, puffing his cheeks in disagreement. Hara had to stifle a laugh. He recognised that pout all too well. Will you teach me your ultimate move if I go to bed? Toya tried negotiating, gaining a raised eyebrow from his father. Only if you want to burn the house down, he said with a slight chuckle and a head shake. We'd have to go to Sakota Peak for that, and you're too young. Then I won't go to bed! His parents and grandfather couldn't help but laugh at the eldest argument, Fuyumi looking up at her mother's smiling face happily. Rei and Haro were out shopping together, Toya tagging along as well at the temptation of getting a sweet snack. They left Enji and Fuyumi alone in the house. Enji was busying himself with the dishes in the kitchen, under the impression that Fuyumi was doing some colouring on the table behind him, until he realised just how quiet it was. The sound of crayons scratching against paper having gone silent for a while now. Turning around he, as he dried his hands on the kitchen towel, he saw the abandoned drawing and crayons, with a distinct lack of Fuyumi. Fuyumi? He called out, peering his head out into the corridor. Ice Cube? He tried instead, hoping the nickname would bring his daughter out. Instead, he heard a high-pitched giggle in the distance. That couldn't be good. Fuyumi, he drawled out, trying to echolocate his way to his daughter. A small smile graced his lips, knowing that whatever Fuyumi was up to wouldn't be reckless. She was careful like that, but messy at worst. He arrived at his and Ray's bedroom, where the door was slightly ajar. There you are, he sighed out, relieved to see Fuyumi just digging around in her mother's things. The little girl gave him a big grin as he crouched down beside her. There was a twinkle in her eyes that told Enji she had something mischievous planned. What are you looking for? Papa, play makeup! The now three-year-old girl said, her hands clasped around Ray's makeup bag. Enji blinked, not understanding what she wanted. You want to wear mum's makeup? That's not a good idea. It could hurt your skin, he said, already adding face paint and a makeup playset to his mental list of things to buy for Fuyumi. The little girl shook her head before pointing at her father. You! She grinned. Enji pointed to himself, more confused. Fuyumi wants to make Papa pretty! Uh-oh. I don't know, Enji said hesitantly, and Fuyumi's expression fell at his uncertain tone. She was a little sad at her dad not wanting to play with her, but she wouldn't insist if he really didn't want to. Toya and Enji had a lot of time together now that they had started training his quirk, which meant Fuyumi didn't spend as much time with her dad as she did before. She wasn't lonely, she had her mum and grandfather, and she never complained about sharing her dad with her older brother, but she still missed having alone time with her dad. But she's three years old, and expressing those complex feelings is difficult. Thankfully, her sudden expression was enough to pierce Enji's heart, and he quickly picked her up, cradling her in his muscular arms. 
Let's play makeup, he said, a little awkwardly, but it made Fumi grin brightly. The scene Hara, Rei, and Toya, holding onto his Endeavor plush, returned to was of Fumi sitting on the kitchen table, facing Enji, who was slouching to Fumi's eye level. His face was smudged with makeup whether his toddler daughter had experimented with mascara, eyeshadow, and lipstick. As careful and delicate as Fumi had been, she had accidentally smudged parts of her handiwork. Hara and Rei started shaking as it contained their laughter. Toya looked thoroughly confused as to what was going on. Mama, Fuyumi made daddy pretty, the three-year-old girl said excitedly, turning to face her mother. I can see that. Great job, Ice Cube, Ray said through stifled laughter, tears pricking out her eyes as she saw Enji's face red in embarrassment, a small flame flickering his cheekbones. Haven't seen those in a while, Ray teased, leaning down to kiss her husband's cheek, cupping his chin. Looking lovely. I don't know if purple is your colour, though, Enji grumbled, avoiding his wife and father's amused expressions. Enji is a manly man, the image of stoic masculinity, yet he was willing to throw all of that out of the window for Fuyumi's enjoyment. If she wanted him to be her canvas for experimenting with makeup, then that's what he'd be. What did you do to dad? Toya asked Fuyumi accusingly, getting a pat from his sister. He looks messy. Does not, Fuyumi argued in her sweet voice. Does too, her brother pushed again. The snap of a photo being taken interrupted the toddler's imminent argument, Enji looking up with wide, horrified eyes at his father. Delete that, he demanded, a little frantically. Absolutely not, Hara cackled, sending the photo instantly to Toshinori. Amazing work, Fuyumi. Daddy looks fabulous. Fumi grinned widely, bouncing on a spot atop the kitchen table, very proud of herself. All Might had nearly missed his landing on top of a building when he saw the photo Hara sent him, laughing hysterically. Enji yawned as he stretched, making his way to the kitchen. It was Saturday morning, and the morning light at the ends of summer leaked into the corridors. Since it was the weekend, Enji wouldn't be going into work, but he still woke up at the crack of dawn. As per every morning, Fuyumi heard him and called out of bed, her messy hair appearing before the rest of her as she slid open her bedroom door. Good morning, Papa, she yawned, stretching her little body upwards as she made grabby hands at her father. Morning, Ice Cube, her father replied, picking her up and kissing her cheek. She snuggled against her shoulder, the warm skin that wasn't covered by his tank top lulling her back to sleep. You can stay in bed if you want. It's early. Nuh-uh. Fuyumi shook her head, her hands gripping onto his top. Want hugs. And breakfast. I can give you both. Enji breathed out a laugh, carrying his half-asleep daughter into the kitchen, letting her slowly wake up as he got breakfast ready with one hand. Fuyumi and Ray liked fruit for breakfast, while Haro, Enji, and Toya preferred rice porridge. Enji made himself coffee, knowing the smell of it would beckon his father to join them in the kitchen. At the sound of the door sliding open, Enji turned to greet the newcomer, which was four-year-old Toya. Unlike his sleepy sister, Toya was vibrating of energy, hair equally as messy and a giant grin on his face. Hi! he exclaimed loudly, jumping into the kitchen and landing with a wide stance, fist punching the air. Are we training? Let's try a good morning first, Candlelight. Enji exhaled out a laugh as he smiled to his small son, before his eyes landed on an abnormality. Toya, what's with your hair? Huh? It's turned white. You're kidding. I'm getting old. Did you dye it? No way I'd do that. Enji crouched down in front of his son, inspecting the hair change. He hadn't noticed it the evening before, only now. Fumi eyed the white hair as well, curious about the change but too sleepy to give it her full attention. Enji searched through his hair, running his free hand through Toya's messy mop of crimson strands, beside that one lock of white hair. No other part except for that one spot was turning white. He knew it was normal for some people's hair to change colour as time passed, like brunette babies turning blonde as they became toddlers, so this didn't worry him too much. The white patch was the same colour as Ray's hair, which Enji had no issues with. Fumi had white hair with patches of red, maybe Toya would match her speckled chicken look with the opposite colours. Except for the lingering hair theory Ray had. If she was right and red hair meant fire quirk while white hair meant an ice quirk, could this mean that Toya had inherited something of Ray's quirk? I want apple juice, Toya demanded, grabbing his father's wrist of two hands that was foraging for his locks. His hunger was more pressing than whatever his father was thinking about, and he would be satiated unless the world wished to feel his toddler-sized wrath. Hara and Ray also took interest in Toya's changing hair once they were awake, but Toya soon became impatient with everybody touching and looking for his hair, demanding loudly that he and Enji start training already. I know how to control my fire. Teach me to shoot it already, 
Toya demanded as he jumped up and down excitedly, bounding into the training room. Angie snickered at his son's infectious excitement. I want to do that thing, that thing that goes whoosh, like on TV. He was trying to describe Endeavor's signature move, flash fire first. We'd have to go on Sekoto Peak for that, Angie replied to his son's rambles, stretching his muscles a little as he got ready to train with Toya. And you need to train more than just controlling your quirk to do that move. Toya patted at that, disagreeing that he wasn't already on his pro hero father's level. Let's start with warm-ups for now. Angie smiled in amusement as he summoned his hell flame, the intensity of its heat blowing Toya's hair out of his face momentarily. Excitedly, with a huge grin, the four-year-old did the same, summoning his own fire with his left hand. It hurt. Badly. Ouch! Toya exclaimed in shock. Ouch. His fire extinguished immediately. Toya looked at his arm that was still raised in confusion. Angie was immediately on his knees and expecting Toya's hand and wrist. Burn marks. What? The flame Toya had summoned was just his default one. It didn't make sense for him to get burn marks when he had them before. It didn't make sense for a fire quirk user to get burn marks at all unless they were overusing it. Something cold settled in Angie's gut as a deep scowl appeared on his face. Dad? Toya asked with big confused eyes. Angie picked him up suddenly, loosely holding his wounded forearm in his much larger hand. Dad? Ray! Angie called out in an end of a like voice, which shook the walls of his home. Ray was in the hallway in a second, eyes wide and confused. She'd been folding the laundry. Toya's burnt. The words rung in the woman's skull like a death bell. What? Her voice was just as confused as the expression was, and her eyes settled on her eldest arm. Her heart sunk to her stomach. Oh, oh no, Toya, does it hurt? She asked a little hurriedly, concern settling in as she summoned frost on her fingertips to cool down his wound. Toya flinched at the cold. Yeah, he said meekly, confused and a little scared at his parents' reaction. Did he do something wrong? We have to take him to a doctor. Angie said seriously, his deep, thoughtful scowl not leaving his face as he held onto his son while his wife cooled down the burn. Ray bit the inside of her cheek and nodded. Harrow made an appointment with a paediatrician for later that day. Until they got the results back from the hospital, Angie had put a sudden stop on all of Toya's training, and try as they might, Toya refused to listen and understand why. Even with his wrist bandage and a gauze over his cheek, it didn't click with a small boy the damage that was happening to him. I've been waiting for ages for us to train together. It had been two days. Why are you suddenly saying we can't do it? He exclaimed angrily, a very Angie-like scowl on his face as he stamped the floorboards repeatedly. Angie sighed as he shrugged his coat on, Ray waiting for them both outside. I've told you several times already, I'm doing this for your own good. Angie mirrored his son's lower lip pout, the two staring at each other for a long moment. More white locks had appeared in his son's red hair in the last couple days. Angie exhaled softly through his nose as he crouched in front of his son. Even your weakest flame is hurting you, Candlelight. It's not a good idea to use your quirk. But! No buts, Toya, Angie said sharply, matching his son's scowl. That made Toya pout, upset. You saw how worried your mother and Fuyumi were when Grandpa bandaged your wrist. Toya, despite upset at his father for telling him no, nodded. He had seen his little sister looking at him with a pained expression that mirrored his own as Harrow took care of him. Frustrated anger bubbled in his chest. Firecracker, put your shoes on, we'll be late, Ray said sweetly from the doorway. They had an appointment at the hospital, deciding to take Toya with them while Fuyumi stayed with Harrow for the day. Quite the peculiar case. In regard to his quirk, Toya has inherited your fire, the paediatrician said as he looked through the results of the test that had been done when Toya first got burnt. However, his body appears to have taken after his mother's side more. To be precise, he's developed a body that tolerates ice and the cold better than flames. Toya blinked, not understanding a word of what was being said. He looked up to his father, whose lap he was sitting on. His mother was sitting beside them and had a hand resting on Engie's fist, which was shaking a little on his thigh. Which means? Ray asked softly, knowing Engie's head was spiralling her thoughts currently. Your son's body can't handle fire. Of any kind. In the worst case scenario, using his own quirk will burn his body from the inside out. You need to keep Toya from using his quirk as much as possible. Preferably not at all, the doctor said carefully, but not mincing his words. There was no point sugarcoating it. The room was silent. Toya frowned, still not getting the gravity of his situation, but knowing he didn't like it. Can I still train? He asked. He'd been told he could be stronger than his dad. And he liked using his quirk. Training was fun. 
It's something he had in common with his dad, with Endeavor, his favorite hero. No, Andrew replied tensely. No, it'll just hurt you more. Toya looked up at him, turning a little on his lap. But, but if you don't train me, that means I can't be a hero like you. Angie's chest twisted, and if he wasn't the brick wall he was, he would have started crying. Toya's big, large eyes were sparkling with confused, unshed tears, a furious scowl to accompany it. Angie couldn't say anything to that. Ray felt her eyes sting, and she lowered her head. Toya was inconsolable. The drive home of Kuramada had been completely silent, but the second they arrived home, Toya burst into a fit of rage. What does a doctor know? I know my quirk best! You said I could be stronger than you! Hara had held Fuyumi close as he took her outside, Ray and Enji desperately trying to explain to their son why he couldn't use his quirk anymore. The next day at work, Endeavor made a direct beeline to his engineers. Endeavor, if we could make a support item that could cool down someone with a weakness to fire stronger than yours, we would have already made it for you, his top engineer said meekly, seeing the desperation in his boss's eyes. If your son's body burns instantly at even the smallest flame, there's no support item that can help that. That sort of advanced, intricate tech simply isn't possible or available with the current technology, All Might sighed on his end of the phone. Are you sure? Endeavor asked angrily, the audio of his voice crackling through the receiver. NG, I contacted everybody I know. Even David Shield. All Might could hear the hiss of steam coming off of Endeavor's suit. Enji was furious. Not at him, he knew that, but at the situation. I'm so sorry. You know if I could do something to fix this, I would. Enji knew. But he felt helpless. What good was it to be among the top heroes of Japan if he couldn't find a single support item to fulfill his son's dreams? But despite his stubbornness to find a solution, he kept getting told the same thing. Toy's flames come from within his body. A body too small for his age, with no fire resistance at all. It was like trying to keep an explosion within a thin glass bottle. One crack and the whole thing would erupt. There was nothing that he could do for Toya, other than encourage him to stop and find a different path to walk. Today he saved as many as 62 towns. With all might on our side, we shall never submit to evil. The reporter's voice resounded from the TV at the Todoroki household, a few days after the hospital visit. For you, me, don't you think it's unfair I can't train anymore? Toya exclaimed as he and his sister sat on the couch, watching the news. All Might was on the TV, but Toya had hoped he'd see Endeavor. Fuyumi looked at him with big, confused eyes, not understanding what he's talking about. Already, the left side of his hair was completely white, slowly overtaking the red. I'm just a bit burnt. I can handle it. I'm the one who understands my body best. But Fuyumi doesn't like seeing Toya covered in owies his little sister said with a deeply concerned expression, taking another crunchy snack. She eyed the bandaged burns on her brother. Anger bubbled in Toya's throat. But Yumi doesn't get it, he yelled, jumping off the couch as he stomped out of the room, back hunched and arms swinging. Girls just don't understand. But I'm worried, Fuyumi exclaimed after him as Hara entered the living room, having brought them more snacks. I've already decided I want to beat him, Toya yelled with no context and throat tight with emotion, pushing past his grandfather angrily. Toya? He called after the now red and white-haired child, confused. Dad's the one who lit that fire in me! Toya's tear-filled eyes glared up at the man who looked so much like his father, running down the hall before Hara could stop him. The latter heard a small sniffle and looked at Fuyumi, who was staring into her bag of snacks with tears in her eyes. How had things gotten so heartbreaking so fast? What's wrong, Ice Cube? He knew what was wrong, but he needed to hear how Fuyumi felt. When he sat beside her, the little girl dropped her bag, the remaining round snacks rolling around the floor, and she climbed onto her grandfather's lap, her sniffling louder, but tears not shedding. Toya yelled at me, she said sadly, not used to her brother being angry like that. It scared her, reminded her of the endeavour she saw on the television all those months ago. Hara didn't know what to say, so said nothing wrapping his arms around his granddaughter and giving her a kiss on the head. I don't want him sad. It's not your fault, Ice Cube, he mumbled against her head, her little hands gripping onto his jacket tightly as she hugged him back. They were sticky with the flavoured dusting off the snacks. It only got worse as more and more white creeped into his red hair, Toya waking up every day in tears as he recognised himself less and less in the mirror, crying to his grandfather. 
Angie started leaving early in the mornings, so much so that not even Fuyumi got to say good morning to him. The guilt of seeing his son in tears was weighing too much on Enji, preferring to drown himself in work and maybe, desperately, finding some sort of solution. To no avail. Wanting to mute out the uncomfortable feelings, Endeavor started at working overtime, not going home until it was late in the evening. Hara felt sick at how much this reminded him of Enji's first year at UA, but he couldn't get through to his adult son. Every day, Ray could be heard telling Toa to stop, calm down, firecracker, sweetie, please stop, and her quirk's coldness was seeping through the hole as she tried to cool down her infuriated toddler. Haro tried to help in whatever way he could, but other than also tell Toya to stop and calm down, there was nothing he could do. Haro is still a meek man, despite everything. All Might could see the tension in his fiery friend's shoulders as they worked together. He knew things were tense at home, he had tried to give Endeavor words of support, but whenever he said anything, all he saw was fury and impatience in the number two's turquoise eyes. Not as much as the time Enji had a panic attack, but enough to tell All Might his attempts were unwanted and unappreciated. He tried helping as Toshinori, just a friend, but even then, Enji was unavailable. He could see the younger hero was driving himself insane by powering through more work than a single person should take on. But behind the thick mask of flames he wore, nobody, not even his sidekicks, could see the strain in Endeavor's eyes. He's going to collapse if he keeps this up, Toshinori said to Haro in mid-September, Weeks after Toya's initial burn. Haro sighed, exhausted. I know. We all might. He ran a hand through his burgundy hair, blinking up at his son's friend. A weak, tired laugh escaped him. <laughs> all might. Haro, Toshinori insisted, looking worried. He had found time to meet up with Haro at a cafe close to Haro's school during his lunch break. No, no, I know. Trust me, I know. But I'm not getting through to him. A pained expression settled on the older man's face. Enji had gotten so much better at communication in the last few years, but this whole situation had made him shut in on himself again, in a way Haro couldn't pry him out of. Just like how Rei couldn't pry Toya out of his mindset. I'm trying to be there for Rei and Toya, but they need Enji. I'm just the grandfather. Sadness was clear in Toshinori's eyes, and he wished he could figure out how to help. He wished he wasn't so busy of All Might himself to be more supportive and present for his friends. You'd benefit from sidekicks. It would lessen your workload. Enji had nagged him about this back when they first became friends. Toshinori had considered it lately. And there was a very possible candidate. October arrived, and after several weeks of trying to find a solution for Toya's quirk handicap, Enji had nothing to show for it. Only bitterness, and hours of overworking. It showed on his face, something Ray had never seen before. It scared her. She had confided in both her mother and the Ida family about the situation, and even the latter had tried to help due to the nature of their own quirks, but they also called back with nothing but disappointment. It broke Ray's heart to see Toya's now everyday angry face. He'd started pulling at the white parts of his hair, as if trying to rip them out. They had all told him to stop, but as with everything, Toya refused. He had started begging Haro to train him like he had Enji, since the latter wasn't around anymore, but his father also refused. The wounds of disappointment were still fresh, so his family hoped that giving him time would help him settle, and then they could talk properly, try to make their four-year-old understand the situation. How do you even talk to a passionate, stubborn toddler about why he can't do the thing he loves anymore? No matter how much I tell him, he shows up with new buns every day. Enji said with his hand on his face, as he punched the floor in restrained frustration, momentarily lighting up the room in the glow of his flames as Ray brought tea to their bedroom. Enji had been trying to vent out his angry emotions outside of his home before he returned every night, but they were eating him from the inside out. Seeing Toya constantly covered in new bandages, anger in his blue eyes that reflected his father's, as if Enji was looking into the incarnation of his feeling of weakness, accusing him directly. Enji wanted to run from his own toddler son couldn't cope with the turmoil child. He's inherited my foolishness as well. Under all the anger, there was exhaustion and sadness. Nothing Toshinori could say helped either. It only frustrated him more. How could someone of a power like his ever understand the struggles of those with quirks like Enji and Toya? But Enji knew he couldn't be mad at his friend. If Endeavor's entire agency couldn't help, nobody could. And the helplessness was killing him. I shouldn't have told him he could be stronger than me, 
He felt that Toya was right to accuse him. He felt the guilt ripping him apart every day. It showed. Ray couldn't take it anymore. You couldn't have known, she said in a loud whisper, putting the tea on their low bedside table and kneeling by her husband. Angie, look at me. She brought her hand to his face, her husband lowering his own as he let her touch him. The first act of tenderness between the couple in weeks. His expression was hard and sharp, as if he was perpetually gritting his teeth. You couldn't have known. I still shouldn't have. It's my fault. Angie laid his hand on his wife's, which was cupping his cheek. Moving his hand, he pressed his lips against her palm and kissing it softly. I was excited to train him. He murmured with a tremor in his voice against her skin. I know, Ray softly replied. But wallowing in your bitterness isn't going to help Toya. He yelled at Harrow during dinner and almost set the table on fire. Seeing you be angry is making him worse. Not to mention, you're not home as much. Angie lowered his eyes, knowing she was right. He's so much like you, Angie. Toya needs you around. Even if Toya demanded his father's attention, when he got it, it wasn't in the way he wanted. His father wouldn't train him, and that's the approval he wanted. The one thing Angie couldn't give him unless he hurt himself. It was a lose-lose situation. Either way, Toya was hurting. I don't know what to do. Angie murmured, lowering his head. Ray understood. She didn't know what to do either. But she knew one thing. I'd like you to be home more, she admitted quietly and shyly, cheeks turning a soft pink. Angie's eyes fluttered back up to hers, seeing a sad expression on her face despite the blush. I miss you. Ray was so strong in Angie's eyes, like the eyes she manifested. Strong, but seeming like she'd melt and vanish at a single touch. Just like Angie, there was a fragility in Ray that Toya's anger was slowly chipping at. Blue eyes widened in realization. Right. He was angry and upset, and Toya was the main one suffering, but this was affecting Ray just as much. And Fuyumi, and his father, even Toshinori. He sighed shakily, steam escaping his mouth as he forced his body to relax. I'll, I'll take tomorrow and the weekend off, he promised, leaning forward to press their foreheads together. I, we, we'll figure it out, as a team. Those words Ray had spoken years ago had comforted him. He hoped they would do the same for Ray. Seeing her smile through the sadness, he knew it had, even if only a little. As a team, she repeated softly. Tilting her head gently, she leaned forward on her knees a little, and she kissed him on the lips, her other arm finding itself around his shoulders. Angie's palm rested on her lower back as he let her find comfort in him. The tea remained forgotten. Chapter 20. Blaze. As he promised, Angie took the next day and weekend off. Toya thought this was a sign that Angie was going to train him again, but was furiously disappointed when Angie denied his demand. The boy stomped off into his room, slamming the sliding door shut hard enough it rattled. Angie sighed, rubbing his temples. Toya refused to speak to anybody for the rest of the day, his family leaving food for him outside of his room. Saturday was much the same, Ray and Angie making failed attempts to coax their son out of his room to spend some time with them. But if it wasn't about Angie training him, he didn't care. For Yumi, while upset that her brother was unhappy, rejoiced at having her dad back for the weekend. Taking a page out of the Ida's book, Angie planned an outing with just Fuyumi for the afternoon. If Toya was going to sulk and refuse to listen, then he could at least spend time with his daughter. A daddy-daughter date. Despite it being October, Angie took Fuyumi to get some ice cream. It's not like that bothered the little ice quirk user. Sitting opposite her dad in the store, Fuyumi swung her feet as she ate her vanilla ice cream, unable to reach the floor. Angie stuck over coffee, not in the mood for sweet things. Is it good? He asked the little girl, who grinned at him in a very Ray-like fashion and hummed with a nod. Good, he smiled before taking a sip of his coffee. I'm sorry I haven't been home a lot. The admission that being home with an angry, heartbroken Toya was too hard and stayed unspoken. Angie hated seeing his son upset like this, especially when he knew it was his own fault for getting his hopes up like he had. Fumi lowered her eyes, looking at her ice cream. It's okay. Toy being sad makes Fumi sad too. 
Engie was floored. Two, she said. Did that mean she could tell how they all felt? If so, she really was being affected by this as much as her parents. Engie rubbed the hand over his face and sighed. Damn it. He should have realised sooner how perceptive Fuyumi was. But something bothered him. If it makes you sad, why didn't you tell us? Angie asked, hoping his toddler daughter would know how to express herself. Fuyumi told Grandpa, the little girl said with a bright smile. Mama and Papa are busy. She didn't want to be more of a burden to her parents. Angie wanted to punch himself. No toddler should think themselves a potential burden. Angie got up from his seat and onto one knee besides Fuyumi to be as eye level as he could with her. The girl looked at him, confused, and turned to face him, sitting on her two big chair sideways. Mum and I will never be too busy to listen to you, her father said firmly, but as soft as he could make his voice. I'll be around more, like before. Fuyumi's eyes lit up at the promise. Promise? Promise. Fumi threw herself at her dad, wrapping her arms around his neck best she could. Toya heard his mother through his bedroom door. Toya, are you hungry? I made you an omelette, she said sweetly, but sighed under her breath when she got no response. I'll leave it outside your door. After picking the empty plate she had left him for lunch and putting it down the fresh meal, Ray left, sad. As he listened to her leave, Toya could only feel angry at her. She had done no effort to convince his dad to train him, and she never listened to him when he tried to explain that he could take the burns. It was her fault, anyway. That was a conclusion he had come to, months after the doctor visit. He looked into his arms, where his beloved Endeavor plush was held tightly to his chest. Holding it in his hands, and bringing the toy to eye level, he looked into its unseeing fabric. Toya scowled. I know I can be stronger than you. You said so. I'll show them. He grumbled to himself, his stubborn fury tickling at the back of his throat due to the injustice of his situation. Moonlight gleamed into the room, catching the boy's attention. He saw the trees on the mountainside. Sakoto Peak, Dad's training grounds, where he could practice using his full fire without worry. Toya's blue eyes, identical to his father's, glimmered in determination. The next few months were still tough. While Toya didn't stay cooped up in his room anymore, he moped around the home grumpily, always in a bitter mood, disappearing and reappearing without explanation, which made his adult family search for him repeatedly. Whenever he was found, he had fresh burns that needed patching up. He reacted strongly and aggressively to everyone and everything, especially Enji. Yet Enji was the one person he desperately wanted to spend all of his time with. His emotions were conflicted. He loved his dad more than his little body could take, but he was just so upset and angry. It was more than his young mind could handle and made him burst into fits of frustration to the point it was concerning. Angie and Ray had attempted to take Toya to the doctor again, but their son straight up refused to go back to any hospital. According to him, the doctors were all stupid and his parents were stupid for listening to them. The Todoroki parents had to make do of just explaining their son's behaviour to the doctor. Without being able to look at your son myself, it seems like emotional difficulties. He's only a toddler, big emotions for a small body and all, but it sounds like he's developed emotions too strong for his age, much like his quirk. His body hasn't developed at the same speed, and he's only a toddler. What little reason he has for his age is completely overwhelmed. Potentially, this could be related to him being born prematurely, the doctor paused, seeing a solemn expression on the mother's face. Those words weighed heavy on Ray's heart. Unfortunately, without Toya willingly coming in to be looked at, all I can say is to continue to be there for him, let him know he's cared and loved for. And they tried. Ray, Enji, Harrow, even Fuyumi, desperately tried to reassure Toya that he was loved, noticed, and listened to. But it was hard when every morning Toya woke up to less and less red hair, the white overtaking the feature that made him look like his father. In turn, it made him furious at his mother, as if she had any control over his appearance changing the way it did. He didn't understand what was happening, and his adult family didn't know how to help him understand. They could only repeat in different ways the same thing. His body isn't built to tolerate fire, only ice. He'll hurt himself horribly if he uses his quirk. Toya refused to listen. All he understood was that the adults weren't going to help him with his goal, 
So he stopped bringing his quirk training up. For now. Once he had trained on his own to a certain level, his father would have to approve of his abilities. On Toya's fifth birthday, Enji asked him what he wanted to do. He hoped it wasn't training. And to his surprise, it wasn't. I want to go to the Endeavour Agency, Toya demanded through puffed out cheeks and an angry pout. Looking at the floor, he had Endeavour's plush in his arms. Enji let out an internal exhale of relief. We can do that. The psychics will be happy to see you again. And they were. They all knew of Toya's situation, what with Endeavour barking orders left and right to find a situation to his handicap, to no avail. Therefore, the topic of quirks and his future desires were completely avoided. Instead, those who already knew him commented on how much he'd grown, asking him about his grandfather, what his favourite cartoon was, if he had a favourite hero. Endeavour. Toya replied bashfully at the last question, hands behind his back as a slight blush appeared on his face, looking at anywhere else but the pro heroes. The flaming psychics all grinned and looked at their boss, who was in his brand new Endeavour suit. It must be nice to know you're your son's favourite hero. It was. Despite everything, it eases Enji's heart to know that Toya still liked Endeavour. Do you want me to show you around the agency before we go on patrol? The flame hero asked. Things have been quiet lately, everybody too worn out from Christmas and New Year seasons to bother committing crimes. And also because Endeavour had been terrifying as of late with his filthy moods, and the villains would rather not eat via a straw. Yes, Toy muttered, reaching up for his father. Endeavour bent down and picked his son up, placing him on his shoulders before he left the lobby, giving his psychics a bunch of orders. Why aren't you using your flames? Toy asked as Endeavour walked down the hall towards his engineer's workshop. That would be their first stop. I don't want to set the fire alarms off, Endeavour said flatly, but heard Toya snort out an unintentional laugh. A half-truth. He also didn't want to burn Toya. I'll have him around my eyes when we go out. Okay. How many villains do you punch? Toya asked, a hint of excitement in his voice. Angie hadn't heard that tone in months, and something caught in his throat. A lot. But not every day. Some days are calmer than others. Endeavour replies, honestly, getting a thoughtful hum from his son. I want to see you fight, he murmured into his father's hair, leaning against it. They arrived at the workshop, where the engineers were busy at work with various tech for the psychics. Bits of metal bolts and paints littered the floors and walls, finished and unfinished products alike scattered on the tabletops, and people running around to get the materials they needed. Since I have a lot of psychics, it's good to have technicians in the building. We also have doctors on site but are specialised in burns and similar injuries, Endeavour explained, feeling comfortable to talk about the hero world. It's the one thing he could show and share with ease, having dedicated more than ten years to it. Toya looked around in awe, not having been here before. Endeavour! Is this your son? One of the engineers approached, smiling up at the child. The latter peered down, curious. Endeavour grunted. Nice to meet you, Toya. Hi, Toya waved, a little shy of the unknown person. What's that? He pointed the object that the latter was holding. Oh, that? They're braces for your father. They were styled in a cage-like pattern and white, with an extra piece to protect the back of Endeavour's hands. Could you try them on, Endeavour, to see if they fit? At the request, Endeavour took the objects and slipped them on, flexing his hand. It was snug against his suit, but not constricted to his muscles, having range of movement. To try it out further, he summoned some flames, testing the durability. Toya watched every movement like a hawk. They're solid, Endeavour grunted in approval, the engineer grinning at the compliment. I just need to put on some finishing touches and they'll be ready for use to use full time. The braces were returned to their creator, who happily went off to finish them for the number two hero. What do you need them for? Toya asked, not understanding the purpose. Braces are arm guards. I can use them to block enemy attacks. Plus they have a cooling system that aids in more intense fights. Not enough to nullify him overheating from his quirk, but enough to slow down the process even if just a little. Angie turned his head a little to look up at his son, lifting his arms as if to shield his eyes. I don't currently have any armour or support items, and with how much work needs to be done, I think it'd be good to have some extra help. He gained a confused look from his boy. I thought you were invincible, Toyon admitted, sounding mightily confused at the revelation that his father could find use in armour. Endeavour raised an eyebrow at the comment. Not at all. I get hurt by bullets and weapons just like anybody else. Well, except All Might. 
A soft smile appeared on his face at the mention of his friend. I just know how to use my health flame to minimalize the damage, and my extensive training. But that can only do so much. I have limits. Something he was much more willing to admit these days, without feeling humiliated. Toya blinked and looked away thoughtfully, as if perturbed by the information. The notion that Endeavour, his father, wasn't the unstoppable force he was, gave him a new perspective on the challenges of being a pro hero. He looked around the room again. Toya wondered how Endeavour could have limits if he had all this tech available at any time. If maybe there are some physical limitations that are simply impossible to overcome, even for someone like Endeavour. What do you want to see next? His father's voice caught his attention. Toya hummed. You said they had doctors? Can we go there? Toya was a little too curious at the idea of seeing one of Endeavour's doctors patching up an injury. Now that he was aware of the risks that his father faced, he was curious as to what extent heroes could really get hurt. Do you have many? Quite a few, Endeavour grunted, starting to walk in the new direction. Doctors and nurses specialise in quirks, and the sorts of wounds heroes can get are the backbone of hero society. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do half the things we can. The same goes for the engineers and technicians. His son fell silent, and it was loud. More to being a hero than you thought? Toya hummed. I thought you did everything alone. No man can do everything alone. Not even his number one. Much to Toya's lament, there were no patients with life-threatening wounds for him to witness, but he did get a nice chat with some of the doctors. Namely, he asked about the worst wounds his father had ever gotten, something that was a little disturbing in Enji's eyes. Honestly, Endeavour is pretty careful, one of the nurses smiled. Minor burns, sometimes some cuts and scratches, but your father isn't known for being reckless. He keeps all damage to a minimum, be it collateral or to himself. Nothing he can't walk off. Upon hearing that, Toya had pulled down on his hoodie subconsciously. Thankfully, this went unnoticed by the adults. Toya didn't need them investigating the burns along his stomach. Endeavour was cautious about showing Toya the training room, but his son insisted. Much to his father's relief, he seemed more interested in the machinery and how the non-flame users were training the individual quirks. Endeavour explained the process they went through to find the perfect regime for each person. As promised, Endeavour took Toya out on patrol after he had lunch. He ignited the flame mask around his eyes, but not the ones on his suit, since Toya was still atop his shoulders. Being this high up made Toya giddy, enjoying seeing the world from his father's perspective, where everyone looked small. Patrolling the city, as Toya found out quickly, was dreadfully boring, but it was made up with the fact that he got to see Endeavour interact with the other patrolling heroes he checked up on, as well as some police officers. Most greeted the little boy with surprised curiosity, but didn't ask further as to why he was with Endeavour. Toya noticed people taking photos from afar, but never approaching his hero father, which left him a little confused. He was an Endeavour fan. He'd be asking for photos left and right if he didn't have him on demand back at home. Why are they taking photos from so far? Toy asked his father, leaning his chin on the top of the red hair. I'm not the type to do fan service. I don't get approached much if I'm not with All Might, Endeavor replied. He didn't mind that. Preferred it. It meant he could concentrate on his duty without being interrupted. Despite it being years now, that uncomfortable experience with the schoolgirls still left him wary of dealing with fans out in the open. And also because you're with me. It's not usual for heroes to openly bring their kids to work. Oh, Toya murmured thoughtfully. That made him the exception. Something about that made him feel a little smug, showing that his dad would go against the norm to please him. Except with quirk training, an angry thought bubbled, which soured Toya's expression momentarily. This was interrupted by a cry coming from a corner shop a couple feet from them, Endeavour rushing to the scene before the woman's voice disappeared. The whiplash of the sudden movement made Toya cling onto his father, hair swept out of his face and blue eyes wide until they came to a sudden stop at the entrance of the shop, towering above a thieving villain that had bitten off more than he could chew. The man's quirk was stone-like spikes on his knuckles, which he had threatened the shop owner with by destroying her counter. E Endeavor! Is that a kid? The man's interrupted fear turned to disbelieving confusion upon seeing the small white and red-haired child sitting atop the number two shoulders. Hi, my dad's gonna beat you up. The little boy said very matter-of-fact. Endeavour grunted at his child's words, exhaling heavily through his nose like an angry bull and emitting steam, his arms crossed. The villain dropped his stolen goods and gave in instantly. Police arrived shortly after and he was handed over to them, the shop owner saying many thanks to Endeavour for turning up like he did. 
She gifted him a packet of sweets for Toya, the latter eagerly accepting them and munching his reward as he overlooked the scene upon his father's shoulder. He felt like a king. Villains are really scared of you, huh? He said through a mouthful of candy, Endeavor grunting in agreement. Some are, some not. Those ones are reckless and arrogant, which makes them dangerous, he said as they walked away from the scene, a couple of psychics having turned up to deal with the reports of the situation. It's why I have to always be vigilant of what's happening in the city. Vigilant? Toy repeated slowly, not knowing the word. Keep watch, look out for any danger, Endeavor explained as he turned to look to his son with a smile, his son grinning at him with a mouthful of sugar. The rest of the day was uneventful, Enji returning Toya home in the early afternoon, where a small birthday party was awaiting him, including Toshinori, Uncle Toshi, as Toya and Fuyumi called him. How was your day with Endeavor? the blonde asked with a grin. He didn't fight any villains, Toya said with a pout, face covered in chocolate cake, which made Toshinori laugh. Your dad makes any villain want to give up immediately, that's for sure. Fuyumi and Toya had no idea that Toshinori was All Might. They had never met the latter, only ever seen Toshinori in his power down form, something their parents and him had decided was best. Keep the hero world and home life as separate as possible. Except for on days like this, where Enji just wanted to make Toya happy after the stressful months they all had had. Toshinori hadn't been able to visit much during that time because of heroisms, but that was going to change from now on. You got a psychic? Enji asked with lifted eyebrows, genuinely surprised at the news. Toy and Fumi had gone to bed, so now him and his friends were sitting on the outside patio, tea between them. Toshinori grinned, knowing it was the last thing that his red-headed friend expected from him. Sir Night Eye, he's a huge All Might fan, and, uh, well, I couldn't say no. He's very insistent. The blonde laughed a little at his push over nature when it came to fans. I was thinking of looking for a psychic anyway. I guess the universe just decided to throw me a bone for once and delivered him to my doorstep. He's 18, fresh out of hero school. And his first stop was your agency. That's definitely an All Might fan if I ever heard of one. And she said with a slight chuckle. I'm glad you finally took one on. That would cut All Might's work down by half, since he wouldn't have to do reports anymore. Me too. Toshinori's smile softened. I probably wouldn't have accepted so easily if you and Hara didn't nag me about it. This gained him an eye roll from Enji as he took a sip of his tea. Later that night, Rei was on her phone, already comfortably settled under the covers to sleep as she waited for Enji to be done in the shower. While she mainly used her phone to call her mother or the Ida family, or take photos of her children, tonight she was feeling curious and looking on social media. Toya had told her about people taking photos of him from afar, and his mother wondered if anybody had posted them online and had said something about it. Which they absolutely had. Endeavor's son was currently trending, and the official Endeavor agency account was getting bombarded with questions about the small child that had been with Endeavor today. Most were just curious, commenting on how cute of a little boy was, Ray agreed, but a handful of people shared their worries about the number two hero bringing his son to work. Reckless, they called it. And something that her NG simply wasn't. The door to their connected bathroom opened, and NG walked out wearing only his pyjama shorts, still wiping the wetness away from his hair. Ray looked at the bare skin of his torso. No scar could be seen, not even small ones or burn marks, truly because Endeavor was careful. In all of his strength and power, he always kept the damage to an absolute minimum. While he showed no mercy to the villains, the safety of civilians and surrounding areas were always his priority. Despite his harsh expression and no-nonsense attitude, Endeavor does his job, and he does it right. What? NG caught Ray staring, his arms halfway into a t-shirt. I can't appreciate my husband? Ray teased with a joke pout, puffing her cheeks slightly. A tinge of a blush appeared on the redhead's cheekbones, and he busied himself with putting on his t-shirt. It was endearing how bashful Enji still got when receiving a compliment from Ray. People are reacting to you and Toya online. Mm-hmm. They're taking photos, Enji confirmed, throwing his used towel into the laundry basket before settling onto the futon besides Ray. Are you worried? Ray put her phone down on silent and turned onto her side to look at Enji better. No, people can say what they want. I know Toya is safe with you. She smiled, gaining a soft one from her hero husband back. A lingering sense of fear that he wasn't enough to keep Toya or his family safe forever haunted the man, but he refused to live in its shadow. Plus, Toya had fun. I don't think I've seen him so happy in months. The way he talked about that villain you apprehended, you'd think he had seen heaven. The parents laughed at the memory of their little eldest rambling on about it. 
The hero world is all I know. It's all I can show him. Angie said as he lay a hand on his wife's hip affectionately. If maybe I can show him there's more to it all than just the pro hero side of things, but there's different ways to be a hero, maybe it'll inspire him to do something different. More than all that, you're spending time with him. And that's the most important thing. That's all he wants, Ray softly murmured. Toya wanted his father's approval. That was obvious to everyone. But none of them could approve Toya hurting himself for the sake of becoming a pro hero like his father. In everything else, they could. Just not that. Which is what frustrated Toya. They knew that. Angie grunted quietly at her words, dropping his hand from her hip to her belly. It was becoming more prominent now. When do you want to tell them? He asked. Fuyumi is going to be a big sister? The now four-year-old girl exclaimed excitedly, pulling at her mother's skirt as she jumped up and down. You are, Ray smiled. She was four months pregnant, and the baby was expected for July. Already, her belly bump was much larger than it had been with Toya and Fuyumi, which was what had made the expecting parents decide it was time to tell their two children before they noticed themselves that a change was going to happen again. Harris smiled at Fuyumi's clear giddiness at being a big sister, but he noticed a dark look that settled on Toya's face. That worried him, and when the five-year-old left the room without saying anything, Haro followed him, letting Fuyumi and Ray have a happy moment together. Firecracker, what's wrong? He asked, catching up with a surprisingly fast grandson, who didn't look at him. At the lack of an answer, Haro just had a bad enough, and he took hold of Toya's elbow lightly, just to stop him. Toya, speak to me. What's wrong? The angry scowl on Toya's face deepened at his grandfather's insistence, a sight that Haro was all too familiar with. It reminded him of the time he had stopped Enji from training. I don't want another brother or sister, Toya snapped, blue eyes blazing in unbridled bitterness. Hara could see the jealousy that fueled his anger beneath the surface, but said nothing of it. Why not? he asked instead. The question stumped Toya, whose mouth remained open but no words left him, unsure of how to express his turbulent thoughts and emotions. Such a Todoroki. Are you worried? Hara encouraged gently, crouching down in front of his grandson to be eye-level with him. Toya stared straight at the man, glaring but with uncertainness now in his face. A small nod. What are you worried about? After a long stretch of silence, Toya lowered his eyes. Am I not enough? Hara's blood ran cold. Not enough. Why was that phrase being spoken again? And by his five-year-old grandson, no less. Of course you are! Hara replied hurriedly, trying to squash his growing panic. This was instantly noticed by Toya, whose bitterness returned twicefold. Then why? he yelled, frustrated, forcing his grandfather's hands off of him, small flames licking his hair and cheeks. Hara tried to reach out to snuff them out before they burned Toya, but his hands were slapped away before he could, the boy letting out a frustrated cry as he did, turning heel and running off. Hara stayed in the hallway, stumped and frozen. Try as they might, they couldn't find Toya anywhere for the rest of the day. Eventually, they found him in the corner of the garden, covered in dirt with red eyes as if he had been crying. Angie and Ray tried to get him to talk once his father had returned home, but he refused, pushing them both away as he shut the bathroom door to shower. He was covered in burns from training on Sokoto Peak and had done his best to cover them up with the dirt of the garden. Compared to the two previous pregnancies, this one was not nearly as easygoing. Ray felt nauseous all the time, and as the baby grew, she became easily exhausted, which made leaving the house nigh impossible. Despite feeling sick, Ray tried her best to stay healthy for the baby's sake, but if that wasn't enough, Toya's angry sulking added to the stress. His parents desperately tried to talk to him about his fight with Harrow many times, but Toya would always refuse. He had stopped asking Angie to train him since before his birthday, but that gave them no sense of relief, feeling like something was still very much wrong. Fumi tried to keep up the mood, being the smiley, bright-eyed little girl she was, but even Toya's bitterness got to her, making her feel down and upset. Haro tried to support his family best he could, but felt as if he had made the situation worse after his attempt at talking to Toya. He couldn't help but feel like he was a curse to his family, but he said nothing of it. Enji, in an attempt to try something, anything, made a promise to both Toya and Fuyumi. Once a month, he'd book out an entire day for just them, individually, where they could choose what they do. Fumi had loved her daddy-daughter ice cream date and was very happy at this idea. 
Toya felt like this was a weak attempt at compensating for his parents trying to replace him, but didn't voice this. Fuyumi liked going out to eat with her dad, and they worked on a list of places they could go. The only place Toya wanted to go with his father was the Endeavor Agency. Toya became a very familiar face among the psychics, who adored him to bits. Number two hero Endeavor has arrested the murderer Takami today, after arriving Kyushu, Fukuoka, this morning. The villain was trying to steal a car when he was apprehended. No matter where he goes, he doesn't waste time. Toshinori laughed as he and Hara watched the news in the Todoroki living room. Endeavor had been called to Fukuoka for some business trip and had made quick work of adding to his tally of resolved cases. Hara laughed a little at his friend's comment, exasperated his son's workaholic nature he'd inherited from him. Thanks to Sir Naitai's dedication to his psychic duties, Toshinori had been able to visit. The blonde was glad to see that his older friend was less exhausted than before, as well as congratulated Ray on her third baby. But it hurt the honorary uncle that Toya was in such a bitter state. Toya thinks they're trying to replace him? Toshino asked in shock once Hara had finished explaining the argument he'd had with his grandchild. Ray was currently taking a nap in her bedroom, Fuyumi cuddling up beside her. Toya had locked himself in his room. Unbeknownst to the adults, the bedroom was empty. I think... I'm not sure. He wasn't clear. Hara said with a sad tone, fiddling with the, some paperwork for school he was filing. I just panicked. I didn't know what else to say. Once again, he wasn't able to be supportive to a loved one. The grief of his shortcoming showed on the man's face. That's not your fault. The situation is unique and a first. Toshini tried to encourage, but Hara's side told him that wasn't working. The men stayed in silence for a while, not sure what to say now. How school? The blonde asked the older man meekly, trying to make conversation. Something in Hara's face relaxed. Schoolwork he could talk about with ease. Good. I haven't gone by Mr. Todoroki in some time now. Rather, I'm addressed as Endeavor's dad. Hara said with a chuckle. Toshino joining in. I don't mind. It's funny. Plus, my students seem to enjoy lessons with me. Some of the kids don't like sports, which is fair enough. I do try to make it fun for everyone, though since participating and taking part in activities of others is how you create bonds and friendships. It's a lot easier for kids in elementary school to learn that, less so in older years, Hara explained. Probably why Enji hadn't been able to make friends, Hara hadn't been around a lot to raise him properly, and hadn't encouraged him enough to make any. For example, if we're playing a team sport, I encourage everyone to try a different position, even being referee. Seeing everybody find their favourite role is wonderful to me. Role? Toshinori asked, perking up at that word. Hara nodded. When you're a child, you have endless possibilities. Finding your strengths, what you like to do the most, what the best duty is for you. That's what I want to help my students with. If I can encourage them to do that with my classes and sports by trying out as many things as possible, then maybe it'll inspire them in other areas of their life to find their place. The teacher said sweetly, a fondness in his eyes as he spoke about his job. That's my role. Toshinori's eyebrows were raised as he listened to Haru speak of this. Being born quirkless, Toshinori felt like he had no role. Now he had one for all, he had his role as a symbol of peace. He was succeeding in what he wanted to do to bring light into a dark, fearful society that had formerly been overrun by villains and a high crime rate. Even though he felt like it was never enough, not with all for one still around. But Haru wasn't talking about a role that referred to quirks or being a hero. Just life. Normal life. Seeing the potential in everyone without limiting them to their quirks. Toshinori so wished he could share the reality of his life with his friends here. But he couldn't. He had told Sir Naitai because, being his psychic, he deserved to know. But the Todoroki family, he couldn't. I could have done with an Endeavour's dad to train me. Toshinori laughed weakly. Distant memories of Gran Torino's kicks still keeping up at night. He hadn't been in touch with him for some time now. He'd get along with Haruo. Toshinori saw a lot of Nana in Haruo, with how compassionate and nurturing he was. It's probably why he found so much comfort in the older man. Maybe Gran Torino would appreciate it too. Haruo watched the blonde, and wondered what it was that his overgrown friend was hiding from them. As spring turned to summer and the due date for their third child neared, Ray had to be admitted to the hospital early, much to her chagrin. 
She wasn't dreadfully ill, but the sheer weight of the baby was so intense she was nauseous nearly constantly, and Angie thought she'd benefit from having constant care rather than struggling at home. Even though she knew he was right, Ray had been most displeased at the idea. Angie had felt very not safe from the glare his wife had given him, in a humoristic way. While this was the best for Ray's health, it left Toy and Fuyumi alone at home with Haruo. It was almost the summer holidays, and Haro had been able to get off work early after he explained the home situation to the school. Nobody was going to say no to Endeavor's dad anyway. Toy was thoroughly annoyed by this, because it meant he couldn't sneak off the train at Sokoto Peak, having been taking advantage of his mother's inability to move fully to do so. But now, with a worried Haro keeping a very close watch of him all day, Toy had to stop unless he got into further trouble. So he moped, watching TV on the couch or slouching like a shrimp looking and feeling miserable with no outlet. Especially on the 1st of July, when Hara told Fuyumi and Toya their new baby brother would be coming home in a couple days. Enji had sent him a photo of the newborn, showing a behemoth of a white-haired baby boy with small red markings on the side. Fuyumi had cooed excitedly at the photo, with Hara mentioning that he looked exactly like Enji, only with white hair. Toya had refused to look at the photo, sounding bored and disinterested. This upset Hara deeply, as he swiped through photos and videos on his phone, an idea formed. Toya? He asked softly, peering into the living room where Toya was laying on the sofa, glaring at the TV where a cartoon was airing. Can I show you something? I don't care about the baby. It's not about your brother. Haro gained a side eye from Toya, who sighed dramatically as he sat up. His grandfather joined him on the couch and showed him his phone screen, where he played a video. It was of Toya, when he was barely learning how to stand, much smaller than he was now with a full head of thick red hair. Ray was filming, encouraging Toya as the then eight-month-old tried to pull himself up onto his feet by using his father's leg, pulling at his trousers. Angie could be heard encouraging him as well, both his parents breaking out into cheers when Toya succeeded in his venture, the infant making his knees bounce in mirrored excitement, letting out some gargled laughter. Angie's hand came into view and they picked Toya up, Ray following the movement with the phone to show Engie carrying and kissing their infant son on the cheek, the two redheads smiling. The video ended on that frame. Toy blinked, an emotion catching in his throat that he couldn't explain. They loved you from the instant they knew they were going to have you, Harris said softly. And they have been proud of your every move since you were born. Then why? Toy's voice trailed off, not knowing how to express his thoughts. He didn't understand why they would want more children if they loved him so much. Harrow, after the fight six months ago, had slowly come to understand what was troubling Toy with this particular situation. It was more than just fueled insecurity. Your mum and dad don't have any siblings, he explained, gaining his grandson attention. He looked up at him with big side blue eyes. And not many friends. They were pretty lonely. Even if your dad says he wasn't. He's stubborn like that. <laughs> like you. Hara pinched Toya's cheek lightly with a chuckle, gaining a familiar displeased pout, but Toya didn't pull away. Your mum always wanted a big family. They didn't decide to have more children because they don't think you're enough. Oh. Toya blinked and looked away. Despite his stubbornness, his five-year-old mind was slowly processing the information that maybe he had misunderstood his parents' intentions with having another baby. Do you like being with your sister? Hara asked. A memory of his mother blasting them with water from the hose as they played in the garden a couple summers ago popped into his mind, and the hint of a smile tugged at Toya's cheeks. I like playing in the garden with Fuyumi, he admitted through a pout, which made his grandfather smile. Your parents want to give you what they never had. A lively, happy family. Something Harrow had never had either. His only family was Enji since he was 18, and he had struggled. Ray and Enji wanted to give their children the opposite of that. Toya said nothing, but it seemed to get through to him, because he didn't look as miserable by the time his parents brought his baby brother home. Natsuro Todoroki was born at a hefty 4.5 kilograms, with a full head of hair that stuck in every direction. Enji was the one holding him when they got home, because Rei was exhausted. Enji recounted to Haro every curse and threat Rei had sent his way during labour. She almost froze my entire arm, the red-headed man said with a breathy laugh. Ray's face flushing up in embarrassment. She had been completely unaware of what she was saying at the time, 
too caught up in the pain of it all. But she saw the humour in it and was glad Angie didn't take it personally. As she sat on the couch of their home, Angie placed their large baby into her arms, for Yumi by her side in an instant, smiling with a happy blush at her new brother who slept peacefully, little hands wound up into fists as dressed in a stripy sleep suit. Angie had had to go out and buy new baby clothes with Kuramada's help, since Natsuo was twice the size for Yumi and, especially, Toya had been when they were born. Toya himself watched for Yumi fawning over their baby brother from a distance, looking at his mother's happy but tired expression, as well as his father's proud one, proud of his wife and proud of their new son. The man's turquoise eyes lifted to meet Toya's, who was staring. Angie made a come here emotion. Reluctantly, Toya did staring down at the sleeping Natsuo with a scowl. He's fat, is what he blurted out upon seeing him for the first time. Angie snorted out a laugh, his shoulders shaking, as his mother looked at him in disbelief. Natsuo was indeed a chunky, round baby boy and a noticeable weight in her arms. I think Natsuo made up for how small you and Fuyumi were when you were born, Angie commented with a laugh, Ray shooting him a disapproving look, but she couldn't hide the underlying amusement in her face. Was I smaller than Natsu? Fuyumi asked, struggling to get onto the couch. She found saying Natsu O tricky. Much smaller. You were 2.7 kilograms, Ray replied to her daughter, who snuggled up to her in order to see Natsu better. While Toya didn't ask, he did give a curious look to his mother. You were 1.6 kilograms since you were born early. I was tiny, Toya expressed in wide-eyed shock, looking down at his hands in disbelief. Neither him nor Fuyumi understood numbers or weight completely, but they knew one and two were much smaller than four. How did I grow? The utter confusion and drama of his tone made his parents and grandfather laugh. Seeing their amused expressions, Toro realised he hadn't seen them smile at him like that in a while. Not altogether, at least. He missed it. Looking back to his baby brother, Toya poked his chubby cheek gently, gaining a sigh from the sleeping child. Toya smiled. The first person Natsuo smiled to at the age of one month old was Toya. Toya was also the first person to make Natsuo laugh, as well as the first person he reached out to the most besides Foray. If Fuyumi and Toya had clung to their father like sloths, Natsuo was an utter mama's boy. He wanted to be held by her in every breathing moment, unable to fall or stay asleep if he wasn't held by her specifically. Which would have been fine if he didn't weigh the same as a bag of bricks. Unlike Enji, Toshinori and Haro, who were manly men with their muscles and workout routines, Haro less so than the two younger men because he's a teacher, not a pro hero, Rei was half their size, and Natsuo might as well have been nearly her body weight by the time he was four months old. Toya and Fuyumi found it hilarious to watch their mother struggle with their massive baby brother, but Rei, not so much. Especially not when her back was hurting the way it was. Unfortunately for her, she had been quite right at saying that having this quiet attitude of Fuyumi with Toya's stubbornness was a deadly duo, because Natsuo was identical to his father when he was a baby. He was silent, observant, and stubborn as all hell. Currently, he had a vendetta against bedtime because he refused to sleep, in general. He's taking sleepers for the week pretty seriously, Toshinori had joked, witnessing the four-month-old tackle his sister to the ground with his body weight when he leaned on her, trapping a flailing Fuyumi as he gurgled happily. Toyo smiled a lot more, finding Natsuo to be good company. Haro suggested it was because his brother reminded the eldest of their father, who was his favourite person. Rei agreed, simply relieved that Toyo was smiling again, even when it was him snickering at her because Natsuo was impossible to pick up. Enji, do you remember five years ago on our honeymoon when I said I'd be happy to train with you? Can we get a start on that? Rei asked breathlessly one day when Enji found her laying flat on the ground as Natsuo lay sleeping on her stomach. I can't pick him up. Enji had to stifle his laughter when he easily picked Natsuo off of her stomach, their young boy fussing at being separated from his mother instantly. As she had requested all those years ago, Enji started the training off slow. While he could easily pick up huge weights like they were nothing, Ray struggled with the smallest ones he had. She refused to let Enji buy her some even smaller ones though, not wanting to admit defeat to the 5 kilogram weights. Keep your back straight and raise your arm. Like that, you've got it. Enji demonstrated alongside her with his own much heavier kilograms. Ray wheezed after five reps of bicep curls, already feeling a strain, glaring at Enji's audacity for being stronger than her as he easily finished his own set. Completely unfair, she breathed out, crouching next to her weights she had put down. 
You've just started. I have over a decade of this. Angie laughed lightly as he placed his on the racks, stretching his arms slightly and rolling his shoulders back. It comes with time. Dad, Mum, what are you doing? Toy's voice was heard from the doorway, his mop of red and white hair peeking through the sliding door. He hadn't been in this room since Angie had stopped his fire quirk training. There was an underlying bitterness in his tone. I'm teaching your mother how to lift weights. Natsu is getting too heavy for her. Angie replied honestly after a moment of hesitance, Ray trying to finish her first set of bicep curls. The eldest son stepped into the room, watching his mother with an unimpressed look. You're not as good as dad, he said flatly, in the typical harshness only children can muster. I'm aware, Ray panted out as she finished her tenth rep, getting back into a crouching position as she put the dumbbells down. Your dad is a tryhard. She shot an amused smirk at her husband, the latter rolling his eyes, but he was smiling. Try picking one up, Toya. It's heavier than you think. Angie encouraged, getting a huff from her son. Despite the bravado of the five-year-old, the dumbbell didn't so much a shift as he pulled on it, no matter how hard he tried. He fell onto his butt after a third attempt, glaring at the metal object. See? Angie chuckled, crouching beside the eldest. Just to rub it in a bit, Angie easily lifted the equipment as if it were no more than a pebble, getting very displeased glares from both his wife and son. Unfair. Toya grumbled. I think so too, Ray agreed suddenly, nodding her head. Angie couldn't help himself but smile at their reactions, seeing so much of Ray in Toya's face. While he may have his stubbornness, everything else was Ray, in all of the best ways, Angie thought. It just upset him he couldn't make Toya see the good in his mum, who he had been bitter towards ever since his quirk started hurting him. An idea clicked. Ray, he motioned to his wife to follow him letting their son glare at the remaining second dumbbell on the floor, making another attempt to pick this one up, determined to prove he could. A short distance away, next to the treadmill, Angie shared his idea. What if we trained with Toya? Just regular training, not quirk-related. Nothing he can't handle, but... His voice drifted as he looked at his eldest, making grunting noises as the metal object refused to move. He sees training as a bonding activity. Ray finished his thought, her voice fond as she smiled sweetly. He's very much like you in that aspect. Angie's eyes fluttered a little as he looked down at her, a smile tugging at his cheek. I think it's a good idea, but let's keep it as a just-for-fun activity. Angie agreed. I did it! Toy exclaimed proudly, gaining his parents' attention. He pointed at a dumbbell, which had shifted maybe half an inch from its original spot. It moved! Harrow watched with Fuyumi and a fussing Natsu in his arms as Angie taught Ray and Toya how to do a push-up, a smile on his face. Natsu's fussy got intense enough that Harrow decided to put him on the floor, and like a bullet, the six-month-old crawled towards his mother, plopping himself on his stomach when he reached her. Hey there, Natsu, Ray wheezed, barely halfway down before her arms started shaking. Natsu watched her intensely and slapped his arms against the ground. Look at you, doing a push-up. Better than mummy, that's for sure, the woman said with a breathy laugh as she let herself drop to the floor, not having the strength to get back up to her original pose. Are you okay, mama? Fuyumi asked from where Harrow was carrying her. I'm okay, Ice Cube, Ray reassured her, face down on the floor with Natsu putting at her ponytail. Toya, on the other hand, had succeeded in his first push-up and was being very victorious about it, demanding a high five from his father, who of course returned it. The much smaller hand of his son slapped against his palm, the boy grinning proudly at the way he used to when they were first training his quirk together. It made Angie's heart warm happily that they could still have this. Maybe he would have been less happy if he knew the extent Toya had gone to train his quirk, what with the well-hidden burns all over her stomach and chest, both fresh and old. Harrow watched as Ray struggled to free her hand from Natsu's tight grip, before smothering his chubby face in kisses, making the large baby gurgle in laughter. He looked just like Engie when he was that age. The man's eyes started stinging and blurring a little, as a heavy weight dropped onto his heart, and he blinked rapidly, rubbing his eyes. Fumi sensed the change immediately and looked up at her grandfather with big, wide eyes full of compassion. Not that she understood what for or why. She leaned her head against his chest and she looked up to him, quietly asking him if he was alright. Hara exhaled softly through his nose and smiled at the little girl. Fumi smiled back. My father's warmth is currently ongoing. I will be posting audiobooks uh, every 10 chapters. And then when I am when I am done with recording 
all the chapters and the story is done, I will put it all together in a big compilation. Thank you everybody for watching and thank you to my channel members, especially in their development, especially in their development, de develop, develop, development. Developmental. De Developmental. Developmental. Developmental.